Tales from the Break Room is a podcast about scary work stories, and I want to hear yours. Send me your scariest work story at eeriecast.com slash submit. And if we feature it on the show, we'll pay you five cents per word, PayPal only. And if you can, leave Tales from the Break Room a rating and review on Spotify and Apple. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Something about the dark makes the crazy folk a little braver, and the things that go bump in the night a little bumpier. As the longtime manager of Dead and Roasted, I've worked plenty of late nights, and the worst I've seen so far was a possum giving birth inside a burlap sack of coffee beans in the back room. Don't worry, I shooed them away before we put that bag back to use. Speaking of creepy nighttime employment, I've got a compilation for you of a whole bean load of scary night shift stories that are sure to make you clock out until dawn. These are tales from the break room. The Chick-fil-A Flare from Anonymous. I should begin by saying this is a true story, and as of writing this, this happened six months ago in mid-November of 2017. I was working at Chick-fil-A in my hometown in New Mexico. It's only a small town, with 5,000 people at the most, but that's enough background. It all started when I was called in to cover the night shift for a new employee who had not shown up for work. This was the third shift in a row, and my manager called me. I didn't mind going in because money is money, and I knew the other fellow employees I'd been friends with for a while were working so I thought the time would go by pretty quick. Beyond them, there were three other staff members working as well, but I didn't know them very well. They'd only started in the last few months. I hadn't really worked up the courage to interact with them just yet. I'll assign them names for this story, Alex, Luke, and Eric. My two friends are Lucy and Sam. To be clear, Alex was the manager. That night in particular, Things were a little strange. We didn't see anywhere near as many customers as we usually did, but I didn't mind. Maybe the workload would be a bit lighter that way. Although the shift would be longer because of it. At around 11 o'clock, Luke and Alex walked out and went home, leaving Eric, Sam, Lucy, and myself to hold down the fort during the last hour of the night shift. Then, to our surprise, there was an influx of customers. In the span of 10 minutes, we'd served 20 customers, and it got a bit rushed. During the rush, Eric accidentally hurt himself, burning his hand on the grill. Lucy had to take him to the hospital, leaving me and Eric to finish serving the others, clean up, and close up at 12, when we were due to close. Apart from the influx of customers, everything went normally, except we were spread thin and we had to stay behind an extra half hour to clean up after we had closed. Once we finished cleaning up, Eric left, and I closed things down for the night. I had been working there for two years, so I guess Sam thought he could trust me to do it. Anyway, I locked the door and proceeded to walk to my car. But before I could even get to my car, I felt something hit me in the back of the head. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in a lounge chair. I tried to get up, but I couldn't move at all. The only thing I could compare that to was sleep paralysis. At this point, I was beginning to panic. A thousand things ran through my head. Who did this? Why? Why can't I move? You know, the basics when you wake up in that kind of situation. I started to try and yell for help but all that came out was an unintelligible mumble, kind of like someone speaking when they just had a stroke. It was at that point I heard a voice. Good, you woke up. My eyes darted to where the voice had come from. They were just outside of my range of vision, considering I couldn't even move my head or any muscle for that matter. By then, I was absolutely terrified. A million questions... A million thoughts rushed through my mind. Then, the person who had been talking walked out into the open. They were big. It was Eric, 
standing there with a surgical face mask. His eyes looked sinister, and he had a scalpel in his hand. I started to freak out. He proceeded to say, been wanting to do this for months. Without a second thought, he took the scalpel to my arm and started to slice, and it looked as if he had done it before. The pain was unbearable, but I couldn't move, just whimper. Then, thank God, sirens and lights. It was the police. Eric stood up with the knife, unsure of what was going on, and in seconds the police had kicked the door down. In a flash, with Eric unwilling to drop his scalpel, the police shot him. Not long after, the paramedics arrived. The police had managed to stop the bleeding and had realized he had drugged me, a substance to prevent me from running and possibly bleeding out too. Perhaps he wanted me to watch him remove the flesh from my own body. I would later find out the only reason I was alive was because Lucy and Sam had returned to the store and noticed my car was still there. They proceeded to watch the security footage to find out where I went, and they saw that I'd been struck in the head by Eric. They called the cops right away. I also found out I was not his first victim. The person whose shift I had been covering was the first. He had missed his shifts because Eric had apparently killed him. Creep in my living room from Anonymous. About five years ago, I was living in a small rural town in an apartment building that really had no business being where it was. It was about three miles out of town, down a country road with not a lot of houses on it. That being said, it was always quiet, besides the occasional drunk neighbor. It was a normal day. I'd worked third shift, so I slept when I got off work unless I didn't have work the following night. On August 7th, a day I'll remember forever, I got off work, came home, and decided to just take a short nap because I had to run some errands that day. I woke up and got dressed and went to get in my car when I was stopped by my neighbor, Tyler. Tyler asked me what I was doing the night before. He explained he had seen me outside my apartment messing with one of my window screens. I assured him I was at work the night before, and it was probably just some drunk idiot. I went on about my day, did what I had to do, and got back home around 8pm. I went inside and put my groceries away, and I decided to watch some TV. Honestly, I can say I'd forgotten about the whole thing by then. Between 11 and midnight, I decided to go to bed. I turned my TV off and walked towards the stairs. I made it about halfway up when I heard a loud bang come from the living room where I just was. I stood still for about 30 seconds or so, and that's when I decided to keep going up the stairs. Not five seconds after that, I heard the sound of my living room window practically exploding. Now, I'm a big guy, 6 foot 4 and 280 pounds. That being said, I have zero tolerance for someone coming into my home. In my mind, they would take one look at me and run away. That wasn't the case. I ran down the stairs to see what was going on, and sure enough, there was a man about halfway through my window. I froze simply because I'd heard stories a hundred times like this, but now it was happening to me. He hit the floor, stood up, and we locked eyes. The only thing that came out of my mouth was, get the hell out of my house. He had other plans. We stood there for what felt like hours just staring at each other. He had this paralyzing smile on his face. That's when I noticed the knife in his hand. I said out loud, you take one step towards me, I'll kill you. He stayed still and said back, if you were at work tonight, this wouldn't have happened. Right then I knew this man was going to kill me, or at least try. I turned, ran up the stairs, made it to my bedroom, and slammed the door. My door doesn't lock, unfortunately, but I decided I'd be safe in here with my Smith & Wesson 45 that stays on my nightstand beside me. I dialed 911, telling the dispatcher what was going on. 
I can still hear her response to this day. If your bedroom door opens before officers get to your house, you're within your legal rights to protect yourself. So now in my mind, it's game time. I thought to myself, open that door. I dare you. You're done. I couldn't hear anything downstairs, so I sat there in silence. About five minutes went by and I hear the police arrive. I opened my window and yelled out. I didn't know if he was still downstairs or not. They told me to stay put until they got to me. I threw my keys out the window so they could enter. Then I heard my front door open and the police yelled, Drop the knife! Get on the ground! I would say another two minutes went by and an officer shouted that I was good to come out. I went downstairs as they were taking him to the car. The female officer told me that when they came in my front door, he was sitting in the living room on my couch, just not doing anything. That really freaked me out. What was he doing? Why was he in my house? I now live about 40 miles away and haven't had any problems since, but this event still gives me chills. I guess all I can say is to arm yourself. You never know what might happen. In the case of this guy, it seemed he knew when I worked and thought I was gone that day. But why he just waited downstairs with a knife, I guess I don't know. Maybe he wasn't coming to rob me. Maybe he wanted to break into my house, wait for me to get off work, and stab me. Mom's Ghost Story from Anonymous. This is a story my mom told me and my siblings. My mom used to work in an office building as a janitor, along with several other employees. On this night, she agreed to work the late shift and cover for a friend. She usually worked in the mornings and was almost always done by midday. She was assigned the job of cleaning the top floor, after which she would work her way down until about halfway. Before my mom had taken that job, some of her co-workers, who had been there way before she had, told her that the eighth floor of the building was haunted by a ghost that was said to cry horribly at around 12 a.m., startled but not too fazed by it. My mom just thought it was her new co-workers trying to scare her. After all, she was new and had only been there for a couple of weeks. She'd also told me that each floor had a dial that controlled the lights, and you had to set it to a certain time, after which it would reset, and all the lights would turn off one by one. She usually took about an hour on each floor, after which she would continue on to the next. Once she had finished up on the ninth floor, she made her way down to the eighth floor. There, she set the timer for an hour and began to clean. About 55 minutes in, she told me that, all of a sudden, she heard one of the most horrific, spine-chilling screams she had ever heard in her life coming from outside the hallways. It seemed to originate from one of the offices she was cleaning. Out of fear, she panicked, dropping all her things, and she ran for the elevator. From behind her, she could hear loud cries from a woman, something you would only imagine you'd hear in a horror film. As she desperately ran for the elevator, the lights she had set for an hour began to turn off one by one, leaving a trace of darkness behind. When she finally made it out, she made a phone call and quit the next day. I See Dead People From Anonymous I live in a small town in Kentucky where nothing really happens. I'm a 22-year-old volunteer 911 operator and I also have a sort of gift for seeing and hearing spirits. This happened around four years ago, and it's still going on today. I was working a late shift and decided to clock out a little early. I packed up my stuff and told my supervisor I was heading home. But then, one of the other volunteers came running in, telling us that a woman's car had been found abandoned and the lady was nowhere in sight. The police went from place to place looking for this woman. Let's call her Krista. Krista had apparently been driving home on the BG, and the police say that her car must have broken down. 
Now, fast forward a year later. No one had seen or heard from Krista since that night she went missing. People in our town began to talk about how she must be dead, or maybe she ran away. The police did a full investigation and came up with nothing. Everyone suspected that her boyfriend, Bo, had something to do with her disappearance. But the police couldn't prove it. Now, all that happened about four or five years ago, and you're probably wondering what that has to do with me. Well, a few months back, I started to have these nightmares of a woman whose car broke down. She went to go look for help, but was abducted. Sound familiar? Well, it should. Because at the time, I had no idea that Krista's car was broken down and that they believed she went to find help. I only knew that a woman's car was found on the side of the road. As time went on, the nightmares grew worse and worse. I kept having them, and each one had more and more details. The last one I had was of two men burying a body in the woods. I believe that Krista was murdered, and she's showing me where her killers buried her body. The Clown in the Elevator From Alexis D. I now live in a big city after moving from a small town a few months ago. I attend college, and I'm working to get my bachelor's degree in criminal justice. I live with my mother and two-year-old son in an old apartment building we just moved into. I thought the apartment building looked safe, but what happened to me about a week ago has changed my mind. I work the graveyard shift, going to work at 5.30 p.m. and usually getting off at 4 a.m. It was a couple of nights after Halloween, and my mom was at the apartment watching my son. A friend from work sometimes gives me a ride home, and he had just dropped me off. Being a young female and it being dark out in a big city is why he usually walks me to the door. I tell him thanks, then I reach for my key because the entrance doors of my apartment building are usually locked after 10 p.m., and tenants are only allowed to get in after hours. As I unlocked the door, I noticed that the knob turned, and the door was already unlocked. Funny, I thought to myself. The entrance doors to this place are never open like that. As I walked in, I decided to take the elevator. I got inside and put my key into my purse. With my head down, putting my key back, I suddenly heard someone step into the elevator with me. I lifted my head, and I got startled big time. There stood a man in a full clown outfit. The outfit was blue with white stripes going up and down. He wore huge blue clown shoes, a blue curly clown wig, along with a red nose and blue and red makeup, forming a smile. However, he did not have an actual smile on his face. His expression was nothing but a deep blank stare. The elevator doors closed and I say good evening to him, being the nice person I was. Suddenly, his deep blank stare turns into a sinister look. At me. As the elevator starts going up, I think to myself, what in the world is he doing in this building at this hour? Was someone having a party? But birthday parties usually don't go until 5 a.m., especially if it's a kid's birthday party, where clowns would often be present. I also noticed he was carrying a bag, which I didn't notice when he first stepped into the elevator. As he looked at me with that sinister look, he bent down to get something from that bag right when the elevator stopped at the sixth floor, the floor where my apartment was. The elevator doors open up, and I start stepping out, saying, have a nice morning, to him. As I say this, he looks up and the sinister look turns into an even more sinister smile. He grabs something out of his bag and stands up. What he grabbed turned out to be a huge kitchen knife. I scream then, running from the elevator down the hallway, and I kid you not, this clown man chases me with that knife. I ran as fast as I could, being chased, the man laughing like a lunatic. Finally, I make it to my room and quickly grabbed my keys, opening the door, just as he reached me with the knife. 
I slam the door in his face and go straight to the phone to call 911. After I call the cops, I look out the peephole in my door and I don't see anyone out there. My mom wakes up and I tell her what happened and why I called the cops. When they arrive, the sinister clown is nowhere to be found in the building. The cops don't think I'm lying though, because in the building right next to ours, a man had been spotted with the same kind of clown suit. He fit my description. A few nights ago in the same neighborhood I live in, there was a murder in one of the houses. A woman was strangled to death, and a witness even said a clown was spotted in the area. Luckily, the police promised to patrol the area, and they continued to check the apartment building. So, creepy clown, please don't come near me again. Lady in the White Shorts From M. Kintz I live in Northwest Florida, and I work at the airport. I've been there for 20 years, primarily working the graveyard shift as a toll booth cashier. During the night, I use a handheld computer to enter letters and numbers from license plates for lost ticket purposes. Sometimes my manager assigns me to go to the garage for inventory, and I always feel uneasy about the fourth level. One night, as I was inputting information into my handheld, I looked up and noticed a woman standing near the edge of the garage. She was wearing a short-sleeved baby blue shirt and white shorts. She didn't move or look back, and her shoulder-length black hair framed her face. I couldn't help but wonder why she was wearing shorts when it was around 42 degrees outside. Nevertheless, I shrugged it off, continuing to enter in more license plates. A few seconds later, when I glanced up again, she was gone. I didn't hear any footsteps, and the sliding door that led into the lobby by the elevator didn't make its usual squeaking sound. I immediately informed my managers and co-workers about what I'd seen, but they looked at me as if I was crazy. Since then, whenever I go to the fourth level, I make sure to check my surroundings more attentively. The Dreams From Safeside Baldman This happened to me eight years ago, back when I was working in the rural towns of Arkansas. I worked the night shift at a local factory, so I slept during the day until evening. One particular day, while I was asleep, I dreamt that I was involved in a two-car accident. Fortunately, no one was harmed. However, the passenger in the other car complained about injuring her neck from the crash. In the dream, I opened my wallet and handed the driver and passenger a few hundred dollars before they drove away. When I woke up that evening, Something told me to call in sick and stay home. However, being 19 years old and foolish, I ignored my instincts and went to work as usual. On my way home, I encountered a car that refused to let me pass. And unfortunately, we ended up in an accident and almost everything I saw in my dream came true from the beginning to the woman complaining about her neck. However, the part with the wallet full of hundreds never happened. Most people I've told this story to ignore or completely disregard my dreams, just as I did. That is until I met my now wife, and the dreams came back with a vengeance. While staying with my in-laws, my vehicle at the time broke down. I was brought home, went to bed early that morning, and that's when the second dream occurred. This time it was a trivial matter. I dreamt I had returned to my vehicle and it started on the first try despite the obvious damage it had sustained the night before. The following night, before going to work, I decided to test my theory, to see if the dream was just that or something else. On my way to work with my sister-in-law, I stopped at my vehicle, hopped out, and sure enough, the vehicle started. It struggled a bit, but it started nonetheless. I was in tears when I returned to my waiting sister-in-law, the third dream deeply disturbed me. I saw myself visiting someone close to me while they were imprisoned. Not a day later, I kid you not, a family member I was close to was imprisoned, sentenced to a year and a half. 
Another dream served as a warning about my sister. I clearly saw someone talking to me and someone else warning us to stay away. The entire encounter in my dream felt extremely dangerous and tense. A couple of days later, my mother called me to talk. She mentioned an upcoming trip. Right away, I tensed up remembering that dream. I told her about it, asking her to warn my sister about the possible danger. Luckily, my sister took my advice and did not go off-roading with my stepdad. The events played out exactly as I'd seen them in my dream. Lately, the dreams have slowed down and almost completely stopped, but I still fear that when I sleep tonight, I'll have another dream. I'm terrified because I don't know if this next dream will be the one that tells me someone dear to my heart will disappear. Kroger Store from All Smoky I've been working at a JC store in Indiana, and I'm pretty sure if you ask anyone who has worked the night shift at a grocery store, they've seen or experienced something strange. I've come across my own weird experiences, but one night always sticks with me. I was working from 4 to 9 due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Ten minutes before 9, it was just my manager, Sean, and me. Sean always felt better having me there with him since I'm a big dude, weighing around 250 pounds, and being built thanks to my life as a farm boy. So I went to do my rounds to count how many people were in the store before locking up. I didn't count anyone, so at the time it was just shown in me. I went to the lobby to lock the door, and there I found this smelly, dirty, clothed man with messy hair. He said my name, then proceeded to tell me he had a special order for me. I told him I'd check in the back. The guy followed me into the back of the store where only employees are allowed, and he started to get mad, asking where his stuff was. I asked him what stuff he was referring to. He said drinks. I searched all over but could not find these drinks, so I got on the intercom and said, Shown to the back, please. Shown to the back. A couple of minutes later, Shown came in. I asked him if a special order had arrived and where it might be. He found it. It was on a stocking cart with 50 different kinds of drinks. We proceeded to go up front, and Sean told me if the guy tried anything stupid, tackle him while he calls the cops. When we scanned his items, he must have spent 500 bucks on drinks. I asked him what all this stuff was for. He said he runs a store in town. It's all for his vending machines. I found that odd because he had also bought beer, and selling beer in a vending machine would be illegal. He then asked if I could help him load it into his car. We walked outside, and there sat a big black F-350 flatbed truck, waiting. The guy jumped into the back, and I began to load the drinks into the bed of the truck. Then, two other men came out of the truck, one with a pistol, the other holding something I could not clearly see. Throughout all of this, they asked me strange questions, like my age whether I was married or had a girlfriend. I finished loading up. That's when I noticed one of the guys, the one with a pistol, getting back into the truck, followed by the other guy holding a double-barreled shotgun. I went inside and told Shone. He called the cops and explained what had happened. I clocked out. My girlfriend pulled up in my truck. On our way home in the dark, I noticed a truck with its headlights turned off following us in the rearview mirror. I stepped on the gas, but the guy kept riding my tail, so I floored it, driving as fast as our truck could go. Suddenly, I saw red and blue lights behind us and I pulled over. The cop approached us and asked if there was a reason why we were speeding. As he asked, I saw the truck with those three guys from the store pass by. I told the officer, and he ran back to his car to go after that truck. We just went home. To all the night shift workers out there, be careful. You never know who might be crazy or not. Familiar Spirits From Anonymous 
My freshman year of college, I worked as a night shift nursing assistant for a rural hospital. The floor I worked on was the cardiac unit, which often received overflow patients from the ER and other areas. It was a fast-paced and intense work environment, where we dealt with very sick individuals and experienced deaths. The hospital was severely understaffed, and I often found myself as the only nursing assistant for 22 to 25 patients. I worked 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and this particular incident happened around 3 a.m. At the time, it felt as if the boundary between our reality and the spiritual world within the hospital grew thin. The unit was fully occupied, and I began my last rounds. As I entered one of my patient's rooms to take vitals, she started talking to me about a little boy in her bathroom. This patient had been in the unit for a while, and she didn't show any signs of confusion or altered mental state. Despite my initial disbelief, she insisted a little boy had walked into her bathroom when I entered the room. So I checked the bathroom, but there was no child. However, she was insistent and asked me to tell him to come back as she enjoyed his company. I reported the incident to my charge nurse, who spoke with the patient. I brushed it off and continued with my rounds, as again I had many patients to attend to. As I made my way through my rounds, I reached one of my last patients. She began to tell me about a man dressed in all white, whom she saw at the end of her bed. I assured her there was no man there. Similar to the previous patient, she didn't exhibit signs of dementia nor altered mental state. She continued insisting that the man wanted her to go with him. I reassured her there was no one there and promised to speak to her nurse. This patient became increasingly anxious. The nurse went in to talk with her and the patient began describing people surrounding her room. In great detail, she described a large woman standing at the foot of her bed. The nurse informed me that the description matched that of a woman who had passed away in the same room a few weeks earlier. The patient was visibly anxious and upset. The nurse called the doctor, who ordered sleep medication for the patient. Throughout the rest of the night, the patient continued to press the call button, pleading not to be taken away. My shift ended and I had a class at 8am that morning. As a religious and spiritual person identifying as a Christian, I'll never forget that night in the cardiac unit and the patients reporting sightings of things that were not physically there. Hospitals are filled with people from all walks of life, and sometimes working there serves as a reminder of how real the spiritual realm can be. Creepy, disgusting drunk that got me fired. From Anonymous. I used to love my previous job. I used to work at a cafe inside of an airport. It was fun. I met so many different people, and the smell of freshly ground coffee was like Christmas to me. But that all changed one night shift. Despite the airport being filled with passengers, the situation I'm about to share is the only time I was truly scared. I'm generally a calm person, always finding a way to handle unruly customers without complaints. As I was minding my own business, a very rude person entered the coffee shop. Nothing wrong with that, right? The problem was, there were only young girls behind the bar, some of whom were very young and not good at handling difficult situations. One of them came to me and said, You have to come here right now. Well, the man must have been over two meters tall, unusually hefty in my standards. He was screaming about drink prices. My first thought was, well, of course, what do you expect? So I stood there with a smile, trying to calm the customer, explaining to him that we are just workers who have no control over the prices. I even sympathized with him, acknowledging that the prices were indeed high. At first, it seemed like the fire was extinguished. The gentleman spoke in a normal tone, politely asking how to get to the bathroom. Kindly, I pointed it out, and he left. After about five minutes, the same gentleman returned with the same question. 
Since I realized I could handle it myself by showing him the bathroom, I offered to accompany him there. He thanked me, and as we reached the bathroom, I opened the door and cheerfully said, Here we are. With a slight nod, he took a few steps, then suddenly muttered something, which I couldn't understand. He stared at me, and what happened next caught me completely off guard. He grabbed my head and pulled me into the bathroom with him. Before I could even comprehend what was happening, I found myself pressed against the wall, cornered with his elbow on my neck. Everything happened so fast, I struggled to grasp the reality of the situation. The man had pulled out a knife and pressed it against my cheek. I could feel the cold steel piercing my flesh inch by inch, fear rendering me speechless. Was this really happening? Was I really going to die due to the high price of coffee? Countless thoughts raced through my head. I remember hoping for someone else to enter the bathroom, thinking how unlikely it was there wasn't someone in here already, what with it being in a busy airport. I recall the man's laughter, the way he seemed to relish having me cornered. Time seemed to slow down, and the pain intensified, unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. A surge of energy rushed through me, my blood pulsating with each beat. For a brief moment, I closed my eyes. Then I heard an angry and agonized groan, accompanied by the sound of metal. Evidently, this life-threatening situation awakened something primal within me, a fight for survival. When I regained awareness, I swiftly headed towards the door without looking back. My heart pounded so hard, it felt as if I were running a marathon. Thankfully, I never encountered that deranged man again, after apparently knocking him out in the bathroom. For the remainder of my shift, I was in shock, unable to concentrate on anything. The next morning, the manager informed me that my colleagues at the airport had witnessed me voluntarily entering the bathroom during the night shift. They considered it unprofessional. They decided to let me go. Although I do feel sad about the outcome, I'm also relieved that I no longer work there. The moral of this experience is to not make the same mistake I did. Just because you're a good person doesn't mean everyone else will be like you. Outside the Bar From Anonymous I work the night shift at the local 24-hour store down the street from my home. It had been a long night, and I had about an hour left until my shift was over. I was busy sweeping the floors when I heard the sound of the bell. I looked up then, and I saw a middle-aged woman dressed in a torn skirt and top. She appeared to be in a rush, as she practically ran to the back of the store. Though strange, I wondered if I should offer her help. However, I decided to keep an eye on her and continued with my cleaning. The woman then hurried to the front desk, carrying a water bottle and a bag of chips. I quickly walked over to the counter and started scanning the items. As I did, the woman began making odd noises, like grunts or even small screams. I would glance up at her every few seconds, just to make sure she wasn't going to do something, well, dangerous. I knew it wasn't right to assume the worst, but I couldn't help myself. Finally, I finished checking out the woman, and she abruptly threw about 100 bucks on the counter before running away. I stood there in shock, watching as she sprinted down the road as fast as she could. I picked up the cash and started to follow after her, but I was stopped by a man dressed in all black entering the store. I couldn't believe my luck. Hurriedly, I ran back to the store realizing I'd fallen into a trap. The woman and the man were working together. She'd been pretending, tearing her skirt and making those odd noises deliberately. She left that money on the counter, luring me to follow after her while the man robbed the store. I tried the doors, but everything was locked. Helpless, I watched as the man took as much as he could. I immediately called the police but when they arrived and searched the area, there was no sign of the man. 
To this day, I still don't know what happened to him or if they ever caught him. All I know is that I'll never work the night shift again. Ghost Resident from Morton C. I work at a home for blind people with other handicaps. There are three shifts, morning, evening, and night. When I started, I primarily worked nights. It was easy, and I didn't have a lot of work to do. Most of my night involved washing clothing and cleaning the kitchenware. During the night shifts, there are only two people working, one on each end of the collection of houses, one for the majority of the house where the residents require almost no help during the night, and one in the house at the outskirts where the most handicapped people live. And it's in that house that my story takes place. As for the house, when you enter, there's a long hallway to your right with small apartments on the right side, and the kitchen and bathroom are on the left. At the end of the hallway, there is a small living room. To the left of the entrance, there is a small room with a washing machine and a dryer. The door in and out of the building is a large glass door. Now on to the story. When I first started, I heard rumors of weird sounds, like shuffling feet, wheels, and creaking doors. There's only one person here who can walk on her own, and she rarely, if ever, does so during the night. I didn't think much about it when I started. Having more than a few years of military service behind me, I'm not that easily scared. After a year or so, I grew used to the odd sounds here and there. It no longer seemed weird to me. So one night, when I left the washing room, I made a quick glance out of the entrance door. In the middle of the door, there was a black silhouette of a person with their arms above their head. I couldn't see any facial features, just blackness. Although it was nighttime and it was dark outside, the road between the houses was lit up by powerful streetlights, and inside the building, I turned on the lights so I should have been able to see the person standing in that doorway. After the initial shock, I ran towards the door, and as I ran, the black shape disappeared. I threw the door open and looked around. The area around the door was open, and in the few seconds it took me to run those few feet, a person would not have been able to run away and out of sight. I walked around the building, looking for someone but I couldn't find anyone. I called the other night shift worker, asking if they'd been over to the house, which they denied. When the morning shift arrived, I told them about the episode. They told me that most people only hear the sounds, but the description of the dark shape and the way I'd seen it act matched pretty well with a former resident who lived there just a year before I was hired. He had died of cancer in the house, and was dearly missed by the day shift workers, so many of them could still recall him. I was assured that he was friendly and didn't do anything harmful. After that night shift, I never saw him again, but I never did feel alone either. Haunted Hotel in Eastern Sierra, California From Bean Bean Magical Fruit I've grown up listening to ghost stories and watching paranormal TV shows as a child. For a while there, it all creeped me out, with thoughts of a spirit lurking in the shadows of my childhood bedroom. Fortunately, as I grew older, I outgrew my fear, but not my pleasure of hearing such stories. I've never actually had what I would consider a true paranormal encounter. Most of the time, I was able to shrug it off or find a reasonable explanation. But what happened to me recently was truly unexplainable and brought me right back to where I was as a little kid, hiding under the covers because of a strange noise. My work sends me out into the field frequently for sampling, some of which requires overnight stays in more or less remote areas. This particular experience took place in a small town in the Eastern Sierra, this was by no means a deserted, derelict ghost town, but it was in the middle of eastern Sierra nonetheless. After a long day of sampling in the field, I checked into my hotel room and I was ready for a relaxing evening. 
I ate a big dinner as well. One large burrito, three tacos, and a side of beans and rice. Needless to say, I was ready for an overnight food coma. I showered and brushed my teeth, then I spoke with my girlfriend on the phone for about an hour. After hanging up, it was about 9.30pm, and it was getting harder for me to keep my eyes open. I turned off the lights and settled into bed for the night. Quick background. The town itself was busy, given it was the beginning of summer. School was out, lots of families and tourists were out and about. The hotel I was staying in was fairly busy too. Muffled voices of nearby neighbors and footsteps came through the thin walls. It made for an oddly peaceful way to fall asleep, almost like white noise. However, things eventually quietened down, and all I could hear were the soft croaks of toads outside and the occasional big rig truck that would barrel down the main road. In between my bouts of wakefulness and sleep, I couldn't help but hear a strange tapping sound from my bathroom. At first, I chalked it up to water dripping from the shower and hitting the bottom of the pan, but it sounded too intentional, almost like a knock or a finger tapping. I told myself it was just water dripping to keep my mind from running away with imagination. But things got a little stranger when I heard an odd creaking sound coming from the TV stand in front of my bed. At this point, I opened my eyes and lifted my head slightly off the pillow to scan the room. Darkness enveloped the room, and nothing out of the ordinary caught my eye. After a few more seconds of scanning with the occasional tap and creak, I told myself it was just an old building with creaks, moans, and groans. This did calm me down a bit, as I've spent much time in lots of different hotels and haven't had anything out of the ordinary happen just yet. But this all changed very quickly. It was still dark out, but I was beginning to wake up. I tend to be an early riser due to my work, and I'll often beat my alarm clock by an hour. However, this time it wasn't my internal circadian rhythm that woke me up. It was a low, monotonous buzz. At first, I thought someone was running their shower in the room next door. As my mind slowly awakened, I soon realized it wasn't a shower but rather the alarm clock radio next to my bed. I looked over at it and saw the time. 4.14 a.m. I put my head back on the pillow as the static continued to come through the radio. Now, this was very interesting to me, as I just listened to a story from Unexplained Encounters, where a truck driver experienced strange occurrences with his truck radio, turning on by itself through the night, with just static and a voice coming through. With this in mind, instead of freaking out, I was strangely calm, waiting for a voice to come through the static. If this were ten-year-old me, I'd be busting down the door and sprinting to my parents' room. However, at that moment, I was almost curious and excited. In my mind, I kept telling myself my first paranormal encounter. It was like a milestone event for me, someone who had grown up just hearing about these stories. After a minute or so of static, I leaned over and turned off the alarm clock radio. The static quickly stopped. I lay my head back down on the pillow, and I waited for my phone alarm to go off at 5.30am. Needless to say, I did not get back to sleep. I've told this story several times to several people. While most react with fear and fright, I can't help but feel proud knowing I now have a paranormal story to share. Now, I know this probably isn't the most exciting story compared to others, but I'll always remember this one. It was truly unexplainable. Now, I know I said I'm less fearful of the paranormal given I'm now older, but if I have to go back to that same hotel for work, I'm staying away from room 215. Trucker Serial Killer From Anonymous Two of my older sisters used to work as in-home caregivers to an elderly lady. My oldest sister, we'll call her A, worked the evening shift until around 8 p.m. At this time, my other sister, C, would arrive and work the overnight shift until the next morning. One night, A sat around chatting with C after her shift until it was very late, 
At around 10.30 p.m., she said her goodbyes and headed home. As she was leaving, she asked C to call her husband and let him know she just left because her car was acting up and she was concerned it might break down on her way home. On that night, her husband and their children were camping out in the backyard. They'd set up a tent and planned to sleep outside. So nobody was inside to answer the phone, and by the time A had headed home, they were all in fact already asleep. As A had feared, her car did indeed break down on the interstate between the town where she worked and the next town over, which is where she lived. She sat in her vehicle trying not to feel panicked. She had no cell phone at the time. She was sure that C had gotten a hold of her husband and that he would soon realize she must have broke down and would come looking for her. So she waited. After an hour or more had passed, she became worried. She only lived about half an hour away. If her husband was coming, he should have arrived by now. It was then that she noticed an 18-wheeler pulling up in front of her car. The driver got out and walked over to her vehicle, tapping at her driver's side window. She cracked the window just enough to speak, and he asked if she was okay. She replied that she was, and that her husband would soon be here to get her. He smiled at her and told her he knew she'd been sitting here for a while because he had passed by earlier on his way to make a delivery in the town where she worked. He said he'd told himself he was going to stop and check on the stranded vehicle if it was still there on his way back through. This put her at ease with him, so she rolled the window down farther to thank him and to reassure him that her husband would in fact be there soon. He argued that he couldn't just leave her there though. To do so would make him feel terrible and he'd worry about her safety. He told her he didn't have a phone but pleaded with her to allow him to drop her off at the 24-hour gas station at the next exit. At least that way she'd be in a safe place and she'd be able to use their phone to call someone. This was the exit she was heading to anyway and she didn't feel like he was a threat. She thought, why not? It's better than waiting out here alone. So she accepted his offer, gathering her purse and locking up her car before climbing into the passenger side of the big rig. The man pulled out and began driving down the highway. He made some small talk with A, asking her how many kids she had, etc., the usual stuff strangers chat about. While she was chatting, she noticed he was pulling the truck over to the shoulder. They'd only gone a little over a mile. She could still faintly see her own vehicle in the side mirror. Alarmed, she asked what was going on. The driver brought the truck to a stop and left the engine idling. He stared straight ahead at the windshield and began talking, but his voice and demeanor had changed drastically. A suddenly felt that she had made a terrible decision to trust this man and that she was going to pay for it. He then said, Your husband really isn't coming, is he? Before she could answer, he continued, He doesn't care about you. Nobody does. He would have already been here if he cared about you, or someone would have come by by now and notice you hadn't gotten home. Nobody's coming, are they? If your family cared about you, they'd make sure you had a good car that wouldn't break down and leave you stranded alone out here. A began to cry, telling him firmly that her husband was on the way and she was going to get out and walk back to her car. He warned her that wouldn't be wise, that she would get hit or otherwise injured in some way. She pleaded with him to let her get out of the truck. She promised him she wouldn't say anything about this to anyone if he'd just let her go. Still staring straight ahead, he asked another question of her. Who raised you? Confused and terrified, she answered that her mama had raised her. The man lifted his head and sighed, a heavy sigh. He then turned away and said, Good answer. I had a mama who raised me too, and that's the only thing saving your life tonight. At this, he produced a cell phone and handed it to her. Before letting go, he said, Call your husband. Tell him to come get you and do not call anyone else. 
She did as he instructed. The phone rang and rang multiple times. She was about to give up, terrified at what that might mean, when she heard her husband's sleepy voice answer the phone at last. She explained she had broken down on the road and he needed to come get her right away. He said it would be a bit because he'd need to collect his tools so he could check her car out when he got there. Her voice shaking, but trying not to upset the trucker, she managed to say, I'm in a big truck w with a man. I need you to come right now. Her husband began to question what she was talking about, as he was not understanding that she was in real danger. She reiterated to him that he needed to come now, that she could still see her car a ways back from where she was sitting in the semi-truck. The next several minutes passed by slowly and quietly, except for her own inner panic. The driver remained quiet, staring out the windshield. Suddenly, she could see a vehicle pulling up near her broke-down car in the distance. The driver saw it too and told her to get out and to go to her husband. She quickly opened the door, frantically trying to climb down from the truck, but falling down to the ground instead. She then began to run in the opposite direction toward her broke down car and the safety of her husband's pickup. When she made it to her husband, she climbed in and demanded that he drive. The big truck ahead wasn't yet attempting to pull out. As they passed it, she didn't even want to look over and get a better look at the man or the truck. After they passed, the trucker pulled out behind them. She was soon relieved when she saw the familiar exit in sight and he continued on past it as they took the exit instead. She tried telling her husband what had happened, but he was too concerned with scolding her for being foolish enough to enter a truck with a stranger. He half believed, or hoped, she was probably exaggerating and wasn't in any real danger. She began to feel like it was somehow her fault and that no one would truly believe her. She never did report this to law enforcement and only told a few trusted family members about it. To this day, I wonder if that man was a serial killer, and if he'd done this before, but others hadn't ended up as lucky as my sister. Encounter with a Demon From Conky Joe 89 I was 26 years old when this happened. This was not my first graveyard shift job, but it was the only one where I worked alone, and it will certainly be the last one I ever work. Now, I don't mind the location being shared, and honestly, I encourage the sharing of the locale, as I'm always interested in hearing stories from my home state of Texas, and I'm especially curious as to whether anyone else has experienced anything like this. Whether it be the particular thing I encountered, or whether just under similar circumstances. Let me just say up front, I was not under the influence of any drugs, nor had I been drinking. If I'm going to be 100% forthcoming, the reason I wound up living and working where I did was that I just completed a detox and subsequent residential stay in a drug treatment program. So funnily enough, you could say I was as sober as possible. Definitely not one of the better times in my life, but we live and learn, right? Anyway, enough of my background and babbling. On to what I saw, whatever it was. I worked the graveyard shift as the maintenance man at a huge retirement community located in the town of Temple, Texas, near the end of 2015. I clocked in at 7 p.m. and clocked out at 6 a.m. The old folks didn't have to be out of what I'll call the community building and back into their own individual apartments until 9 p.m., so there would be about a two hour window when I showed up where the community building would have a lot of friendly older people hanging around. They'd be playing cards, chatting, exercising, that type of stuff. Couldn't be a more warm and inviting vibe, honestly. And then like clockwork, there would be a change in energy. I'll never forget when I first became aware of it because every shift after that, as the clock crept closer to 9 p.m., an uneasy feeling of dread and anticipation would set in on me. It was so heavy and palpable. I knew that soon I'd be isolated in that huge and quiet building, all alone. Or at least it would appear that way. 
there was something going on in that building. There were windows lining the entirety of the building. They looked out onto the parking lot outside, and the building was set up in a sort of U-shape, or a horseshoe, so that from one hall, you could look across the parking lot and see the other hallway that made up the other half of this U. I would constantly see someone, or something, walking along the corridors on whatever side of the building I wasn't on. It was just strange at first. I kept thinking, nah, surely it's just the blinds parted in a certain way, or no, it's just because I'm moving over here that it appears something over there is moving too. I was never successful in actually physically spotting this figure, even though on the majority of time I would see it and attempt to rush over. There was quite literally nowhere for anyone to hide or anywhere for them to go except back down the hall and past me. But I would never find anyone, only serving to further my suspicions that there was something very off going on within this place. Not necessarily anything evil or threatening, just off. Seeing as how this wasn't really a business establishment, it was more a set of communal buildings as I said before, the employees, both daytime and nights, graveyard duties, didn't really have a proper break room, as it were. So we would all use the refrigerator and the coffee prep station that was really meant for the older folks to utilize when they were having breakfast or getting snacks over the course of the day. I cannot count the number of times I'd feel like having a quick pick-me-up coffee, or maybe a complimentary carrot cake slice or three, and when rounding the corner beside the coffee and the fridge area, a nurse from the hospice wing would either already be there or would also be rounding the corner from their side of the complex, scaring the absolute crap out of me. Just imagine it's been something like five or six hours into your shift and you haven't seen or heard a single person, voice, or anything except that sort of phantom-like figure, the one you can never seem to truly locate. And suddenly, boom, there's someone not even two feet away from you, totally unexpected. Those nurses probably thought I was a very odd dude, given that every time they saw me, it would be me rounding a corner into the break area and almost having a sheer heart attack at the sight of them. Now, I'm absolutely certain I came off as the more than capable, competent, and unshakable overnight maintenance man that the community of older folks needed to keep their homes up and running all night without fail or issues arising. But as things tend to do over the weeks and months that followed, I grew accustomed to just expecting someone to be in that break area, at least once or twice over my long, dragging shift. So it eased my tensions, if only slightly. Well, that newfound sense of being able to let my guard down, and not constantly being a walking bundle of nerves, all came to an end one night when I was in what I called the dead end. Ironic, really. It was the side of the U where the hallway ended in an office, a gym room, and a physical therapy room. The other side of the U had a door that led to still more rooms and areas, so over there it felt, I don't know, less claustrophobic and isolated. But the dead end... It had an energy about it. You would always feel like something was at your back, watching, brooding. The worst part was having to run a vacuum down there because you constantly felt the need to spin around and check your back because you couldn't rely on sounds to alert you. Well, one day I was cleaning up the dead end. Other than that creepy feeling, it was going fairly normal. But then something odd caught my eye. Through the window out towards the rear parking lot, there was a dimly lit sidewalk lining the building that led around to a separate employee-only parking lot in the back. And leaning around the corner of that wall, just barely illuminated by the lamppost, which it was gripping and almost trying to conceal itself with, was a very tall, slender, half-physical, half-apparition, and very demonic-looking figure. This figure stood about eight feet tall, well, I say stood, but as you looked toward the feet, it just sort of faded away. It didn't become whole or solid looking until about the upper thigh, the lower waist area, where it was cloaked in a garment that was tattered and thin, open in the front, revealing emaciated looking ribs. Its arms were extremely long and thin, and it didn't seem to have five fingers on its hands. Instead, there were maybe three or four but it didn't have normal human hands. They were oversized, and where the fingers should have started, the flesh of this thing's hands seemed to sort of erupt into massive bone-like claws. 
I use the word erupt because where the claws jutted out from the hands, it's as if that flesh was newly injured, like it had just intentionally unsheathed these claws from within its hands. Yeah, think Wolverine from the X-Men type vibes. It was disgusting, and I'm pretty sure I could definitely see trickling streams of blood cascading from these claws onto the cement below. Perched atop a skinny neck was a skull-like head, sort of like cattle, but on top of its head were massive horns like a buck's. The thing simply stood there, watching me. I could feel its gaze bore into me. I was overwhelmed with nausea and dread. It sounded kind of extreme, but the only way I could describe it was that it felt like happiness was suddenly rendered a foreign concept to me. I felt as if I could never be happy again, like I had never actually been happy before. Just sad that I was leading a wasted life, that I would one day have a death that no one would mourn or even notice. It was like while I had my eyes on this thing, there was only me and it. Almost like for those few seconds, it and I stood outside of normal time or something. When I finally snapped to my senses, I literally ran away. I'm not ashamed to admit it, I ran my rear off. My heart was leaping into my throat. As I said before, as far as I know, all that thing did was stay there, creepily observing me. I assume it was watching me, even as I fled. From that day on, I started cleaning the dead end while there were still residents hanging about, so that hopefully, I would never be put in that position again. I wouldn't last but probably a few more months at that place anyway. Then I was out of there. I'd had enough. I never did encounter that entity again, but that one time was more than enough for me. I was working in constant fear and anxiety that I would see it again, and I dreaded that the next time I saw it, it would be from a not so safe distance. What I saw there stuck with me. I definitely think that the fact that there was a hospice hallway on the opposite side of the same building, where we'd lose at least one person every couple of weeks or so, played a large part in attracting this entity to the location. Perhaps it was to feed on the negative energy associated with death or the dying, to feed off the feeling of hopelessness those poor people assuredly felt as they knew their life was slipping away from them. I often get unnerved even recanting this experience to anyone. This isn't the only paranormal experience I've had, far from it, but this was easily one of the most unsettling ones. The Pizza Restaurant From Anonymous I worked at a pizza restaurant for six years, my first ever job. The restaurant was practically in the middle of nowhere. I was the closing manager one night. I had to send all my coworkers home besides one. We'll call her Angie. At the time, it was about 20 minutes until closing, so I was in the dish pit and Angie was by the drive through window. A lady came in through the front door and went straight to the bathroom. Angie went over and waited at the front desk. She waited for about 10 minutes and then came to get me. I went over to knock on the bathroom door, asking if the lady inside needed help, and to tell her we had 10 minutes until closing. But the lady didn't come out, even after our closing time, so I called the manager over and she told us to call the police. I went to the bathroom door and told the lady that if she didn't come out of the bathroom, then I would be calling the police. She finally came out and asked if one of us could drive her home. We told her that was against our policy. She went on to explain, but you're the only ones here. No one would know. I pointed over to our surveillance system and told her that my manager was watching. I came up with the BS story and how the icon in the corner of the screen meant she was watching, but really it was just for recording purposes. She began to cry and told us she had no way home, that it was too cold outside to wait. We let her use the phone to call people to come get her, but no one was answering her calls. Mind you, it was 11 o'clock in the middle of nowhere, so most people were already in bed or wasted. 
This lady smelled as if she had just slept on the barroom floor and had done every drug under the sun. Finally, and politely, I asked her to leave the building because I had a family to get home to. She got extremely mad and began to threaten us. I'd finally had enough. I had Angie go to the back and call the cops. I told the woman what was going on, that the cops would be on their way. She was about to grab a chair when Angie came around the corner with one of our pizza knives and told her that if she touched the chair, she would throw it at her. That blade was an extremely sharp chunk of metal, and it was about two feet in length. The lady got scared and left. I hardly finished my closing shift and went home, scared and rattled. The following day, we found out she had crawled in the dumpster and stayed there for like three hours before trying to break into the storage shed. Sometimes you get the craziest customers. Close call in broad daylight. From Katie, D1230. I drive a newspaper round every night, 365 days a year, even Christmas. It's a pretty awesome gig, actually. I start at 1am and end around 5am daily. The only few times it really sucks is during snowstorms. My paper route is about half residential areas and half rural county roads. Sometimes there's a whole half mile between stops. It's dark and obviously I've seen some things that have creeped me out, but this time was different. A snowstorm had hit overnight. The country half of my route was going to have to wait until the plows came out. I returned to finish my work after the roads were plowed. Now, as a quick side note, I'm used to working in the dark. When I come across someone outside, nine out of ten times they're drunk or drunk and up to no good. For this reason, I carry a taser with me and a wooden dowel rod in my truck when I deliver newspapers. Shifting my weapon to under my arm when I have to deliver a paper on an elderly customer's porch. It makes me feel better. Anyway, it was 11.20 a.m. in broad daylight. The sun was blaring and blinding that day. Tons of folks were outside moving snow out of their driveways. I made my way out of town to the half of my route I needed to finish. I pulled up to a customer's house that I delivered to daily for about 2.5 years. Never one complaint. As I'm putting the newspaper in their mailbox, I look up to see an old man standing in the service door of his garage with the overhead door shut. I holler over to him. Morning. Want me to run your paper to you? I didn't want him to slip and fall. For context, I'm a 30-year-old female, 5'3", so in my mind I was trying to help this man out so he didn't have to walk all the way through the snow that had fallen on his unplowed driveway. He smiled and nodded. As I jogged down his driveway, I speak again. Some storm, huh? Here's your paper. And I smile warmly. This man then takes two steps backwards into his dark garage and says, Come in here. And he smiles. I laugh nervously. Oh, no thank you, I have your paper for you though. Still advancing my hand out holding his newspaper. Step in here, I have something to show you. He utters. It was at this moment I realized the fresh snow had swallowed up all sound around me. I was alone with this man, standing next to his dark garage with neither of my weapons. Why would I bring them? It was just an old man in the morning. My mind began racing. I'm sure he's about to lunge and pull me into his garage. I take a step back. He takes a step towards me. He asks, What is your name? Trying to remain polite, I responded, Katie. Katie, what? Pretty girl. As he smiles creepily. Uh, Katie, you're a paper girl. I said, as I looked around at my surroundings, keeping my guard up on the man and still holding the paper. There were trees and fields nearby. There was one neighbor about a football field away. He stated one last time, I need to show you something. Step in here. My body screamed for me to bolt away. I replied, No, I'm already late. Have a good day. I tossed the paper and run up the driveway. I made it to my truck. He was still standing at the door, just looking at me. I began breathing heavy and sort of freaked out at the thoughts of what he wanted to show me. The whole ordeal lasted about two minutes. 
and I deliver to this house nightly still. Now I always pull up very slowly, rubbernecking all around before opening my door to deliver the paper. Nothing since. I can't be sure, but I could have sworn that as I was running away, I heard him whisper, Damn. College Night Shift from Eva Fan 33 I used to work part-time at the college where I studied. I took courses in the IT field, and each semester they would hire some students to work entry-level tech positions, granting decent income and great experience. Being one of the lucky few to get a job, I didn't complain when I was rostered over to the night shift. My role was a lab proctor. Usually I was tending to computer labs, re-imaging workstations, and installing new ones. The reason there was a night shift at all was to service the instructors teaching part-time courses. There were only a few night classes, sometimes none at all, but even so, if something went wrong, we had to be there. Otherwise, a class might end up cancelled. I only had one partner in the evening hours, a girl named Kira. I was fresh out of high school and she was a few years older than me, but we got along well. Similar senses of humor and all that. Things were pretty seamless for the majority of the term, until we hit the first day of December. I'm going to recount it to the best of my ability. Hopefully you don't mind the details, but I want to go as in-depth as possible. So I met Kira in a laboratory on the third floor of one of the campus buildings. I'd come early, but she was already waiting for me. This was the default location for the proctors. Usually, we didn't spend much time there. We would just set our stuff down and then go follow up on tickets or jobs that were sent out. Our boss, Harry, wasn't there that night. Not like we really needed him anyway. He'd sent out an email beforehand informing us that he was not available, and he'd attached tickets we had to work on. There were five or six of them, and we had from 4pm to 12am to finish them up. The first one was to re-image a lab. This meant we would be installing an operating system on each computer in a certain room. The lab was in another building. It was a large campus, and the place we'd need to head over to was about a six-minute walk. Whenever we went out, we were supposed to take proctor phones with us. They were normal smartphones, the key difference being they had the instructor helpline forwarded to them. It was essential we carry them around to answer any call that might come up. That's why I found it weird Kira didn't take hers. She seemed to forget. So I gave her one and grabbed the other also taking my laptop with me to update the inventory of the lab. Odd things began to happen when we stopped in the elevator. I punched the button for the ground level, and the doors closed. But before the elevator started, the two of us heard this scratching noise. That's the best way I can describe it. It sounded like an animal, maybe a raccoon, dancing on the roof of the elevator with its nails grazing the metal. I knew for a fact the sound wasn't there when I'd gone up, so I was sure it wasn't the hardware of the elevator. I made a comment about it. Kira seemed indifferent, though. In fact, she was awfully quiet. Anyway, the elevator reached the ground level without issue, and we got out. The exit was right in front of us then, and we headed through. From there, we started our walk to the building that housed the lab. The sun had already began to set. It was the middle of winter, after all, and it was chilly. After another few minutes, we got to the building. The doors were automatically locked at 4pm each day, so we needed to swipe our access cards to get in. Despite the smart security on the door, this building was a lot older than the others. The air conditioning seemed defective. It was incredibly hot and muggy when we entered. The lab in question was on the bottom floor of the building, so we took the stairs to get down. Once we made it to the lower level, we were greeted with a hallway. It was dark and rather ominous. Even worse, the lights were buggy. Only the one directly above our heads came on. The rest in the hallway started to flicker. Almost all of them were spotty and inconsistent, except for the one at the very end, which didn't turn on at all. We didn't mind terribly, though. There was enough light to make out the room designations. The lab we were looking for was right in the middle of the hallway. We walked up to it, and Kira swiped her card to open it up. Only nothing happened. The card didn't seem to trigger the reader at all, 
It didn't spit an error, it just ignored it. So I swiped mine, and the door opened up. As we got into the room, we noticed something bizarre. One of the computer chairs, the one at the far corner of the room, was spinning. Quickly, too. It was like someone had just slammed it as hard as they could. No one else was there, though. Even weirder, inertia should have slowed down the chair, but it just kept spinning, like its velocity was continuously being refreshed. We both looked at each other, then I went over to it, freaked out but trying not to show it. I grabbed the chair to stop it from spinning. It froze, but as it did, this sensation of ice crept over me. It was like when you swim in a pool in the middle of winter, then get out and feel the exposure on your skin. Only it was just on my arm. I must have freaked out a little, cause Kira asked me if I was okay. I said I was fine, and then the sensation went away. Like there one second, gone the next. After I recovered, I was going to make a comment about the chair, but she had already gotten to work so I didn't bother, instead following her lead. It seemed to me she was having a rough night, because she fumbled with the keyboards, apparently forgetting how to open up the boot menu. So I took over her machines for her. It wasn't hard work after all. She sat down and watched me, looking very tired. It took about 15 minutes to begin the imaging process on all the computers. I read over the next ticket. It involved pulling up a workstation in a different lab back to the proctor room to diagnose it, because it had some hardware issues. I checked with Kira to make sure she was okay staying in the lab by herself. She didn't have a problem with it, so I left. I did feel uneasy about her being alone, though. I didn't really know why. Something bothered me about it, but I knew it would be redundant for both of us to wait there. So off I went. As soon as I stepped into the hallway and shut the lab door, the scratching sound returned. It was right over my head then, in the ceiling. The exact same sound from the elevator in the other building. I could hear it more clearly without the noise of the cables moving up and down. It sounded less like a raccoon and more like a dog. There was some weight to whatever creature was making the noise. It seemed to be digging, furiously, as if it was trying to get through the ceiling. I tried to ignore it and headed down the hallway, but the sound followed me. Every fluorescent light I passed turned off, like whatever was making that sound up there was cutting the wires. Paranoid, I sped up and eventually reached the end of the hallway. The noise followed, and quickly, it cut off the very last light. Freaked out and a little frustrated, I yelled something along the lines of, Enough! And just like that, the noise went away, as if it was never there. I was really anxious at that point. I think I tried to rationalize it as I passed living between levels of the building. Just as I was about to take the stairs up to the ground level, though, I remembered Kira. My stomach dropped as I thought of her. It was the same feeling of uneasiness. Not necessarily for her safety either, I just felt strange. It's hard to explain, but anyway, I ran back down the dark hall and opened the lab door to check on her. To my dismay, she was gone. The chair she had been sitting in just before was empty, but now it was spinning rapidly just like the one from the first time we entered the room. I didn't know what to do. I was beyond freaked out. I spun around, pale as a ghost, when I heard the door to the lab unlock. Lo and behold, it was Kira. She was fine, apparently, even smiling, unlike when I had saw her previously. Then she asked me a confusing question. Hey, why didn't you wait for me? I blinked, confused. She told me that she had arrived in the proctor room to find it empty, with me and the phones already gone. She had to look up the first ticket to find out where I was, and then she came and found me. I just sort of stared. I must have given her this look because she was like, what's wrong? Then I explained to her that I had met her earlier that shift, and we headed to the lab together. She looked at me like I was stupid. She iterated again that she had been late and had to look up the room to find out where to go. I think I snapped then. I said something along the lines of, if this is a joke, it's not funny. She asked me what I was talking about. That's when another realization set in. When you're in some freaky situation like this, you don't sweat the small stuff. You don't take in every detail. 
so I only realized then that Kira was wearing something totally different than what I'd seen her in before. There were two possibilities. Either this was some elaborate prank where she left, changed, and came back, all the while messing with the lights, or there was something really bad going on. That's when I decided to check. I told her that she had taken the proctor phone and she insisted she hadn't, saying both phones were gone by the time she'd gotten there. So I took out my own phone and called the number of the proctor phone she had, fully expecting it to ring from her pocket. But it didn't. The dial tones played, but the device itself must have been too far, because we didn't hear it anywhere. Kira looked at me, annoyed, and I was about to apologize for accusing her of lying before I was cut off. Someone answered on the other side of my call. I heard nothing at first, but the dial tones had stopped and it didn't reach voicemail, so I knew someone had picked up. Immediately, I put the phone into speaker, mouthing the word, listen, to her. We both stood there silently. As I turned the volume to max, we picked up on a noise. It sounded like breathing, faint but audible. Someone absolutely was there. Kira, who wasn't half as freaked out as I was, decided to say something. Hello? Immediately after she spoke, the breathing stopped, only to be replaced seconds later by this heaving, like laughing but dry, almost silent, the only noise coming from the diaphragm changing shape. It went on for 15 seconds. We both listened, wide-eyed, before the call dropped without warning. The other person had hung up. Kira took the phone from my hand and called back more than once, but whoever or whatever it was did not answer again. I wish I could say it ended there. I want to tell you we decided to pack it up, call it a night, and leave after that, but we didn't. Kira was headstrong, convinced it was some prankster messing with us, and I, scared as I was, wasn't going to leave her alone. So we kept working. Maybe two hours later, we finished up the first ticket in the lab, finalizing every install, then moved on to the second, hauling a computer back to the proctor room. Everything was good for a while. After we got the machine in the door, Kira said she was going to use the restroom. It was only a few doors down, so I didn't raise an issue. I nodded at her, moving the computer into the room to hook it up to a monitor and begin diagnosing what was wrong. When I got to the desk, though, I jumped. On the table was the missing proctor phone, the one that we had called. It was just sitting there in its usual basket. I know for a fact only me and Kira were on duty. No one else should have had access to that room and she hadn't left my sight until we got there. So how in the world was it here? Suddenly the door to the room slammed. I'd left it open so she wouldn't have to swipe to get in and it slammed hard. I knew someone had pushed it. Now focused less on fear and more on my coworker's safety, I got up, running over to the door and yanking it open. I was met with a dark hallway, like totally dark. The overhead lights that were up 24-7 were all offline. The only reason I could see at all was because of street lights seeping into the mini glass panels of the building. Focusing, I turned my phone's flashlight on. It was pitiful in the huge college hallways, but it made them walkable. I called Kira's name. There was no response, so I began walking to the restrooms. On my way, I passed by a classroom and the door creaked open as I walked. It was so eerie, slow and drawn out like a horror film. I found it impossible that a door like that could have been so terribly lubricated. Regardless, I continued on. The washroom was just up ahead. I used my phone to identify which of the doors were for women. It was held open by a door stopper, so I entered. I called Kira's name again. Still, no reply. I felt a little weird about going into a female bathroom, but given the circumstances, I really had no other choice. Shining my light around the room revealed no one. It was small. I could see almost every corner, and Kira was not there. The only thing amiss about the room was the stall door. It was swinging back and forth, making no noise at all. 
Just like the chairs from before, it showed no sign of slowing down. I remember being mesmerized by it, standing still to watch it glide. I was snapped back into reality from the sound of footsteps in the hallway. Immediately, I shot back out, calling for Kira again. By the time I'd exited the restroom, the footsteps were already down the corridor and behind a corner. It sounded like the other person, whoever it was, was running. So I ran after them. It was like something from a cartoon. No matter how fast I ran, they always stayed a little ahead of me. I could never quite reach the person, but I was always close enough to follow. I was led up and down stairs, down all sorts of different hallways until finally, it stopped. I was huffing and puffing as I turned past the last corner. There was only one door there, and it was ajar. I recognized it as one of the School of Health classrooms. I caught my breath, now irritated that I'd been led around the school. Then I walked up, shouldering the door open. The room was entirely dark. I reached over for the manual light control, flicking it up. It was able to override whatever had kept the hallway lights off, and it turned on illuminating the room. Oh man, I wish I didn't flick the light switch on. There were skeletons. I don't mean real skeletons. It's one of those models you've probably seen in science classrooms. About the same size as a human one, but made out of plastic or some composite material. Anyway, in every single chair sat a model skeleton. They were all turned to face me. It was horrifying. Who the heck had set up all these... And when? As I took a step backward from them, there was an ear-splitting noise. I blinked, and every jaw fell off the skeletons in unison, clacking to the floor, like they were all severed off. There I was being stared down by an army of jawless model skeletons. Right away, I noped out of there. As I ran, I could have sworn I heard plastic joints cracking as if they were pursuing me. I took the nearest exit, pushing out of the building into the cold night air. I remember taking a minute to catch my breath and process what the heck had just happened. I wanted to run, so badly I wanted to run, but Kira was still in there somewhere. She wasn't picking up her phone. I even called our boss Harry, but he didn't respond either. At that point, I was fed up. I think I was going to call the police, but was trying to work out how to get across my story without sounding insane. Then, something caught my attention. I could see a shape moving, but not very quickly. It was very timid. It was obviously a girl. Kira. Even in the low light, I knew it was her because of the short crop of her hair. She walked out of the shadow and onto the path. It was so weird. Ten feet away, she faced away from me, dead center in the middle of the walkway. I remember calling out to her. I wasn't thinking. If I was thinking, I would have known something wasn't quite right but I was too worried about her and too glad to see her again to be careful. I said her name, and then she started heaving. Facing away from me, she was doing this convulsive motion, like she was hysterically laughing. Only there was absolutely no sound coming from her, none. It went on for minutes, the same horrifying movement. I backed up, slowly to the door I'd exited from, automatically swiping my door and pushing on through. When I turned back only a few seconds later, she, if you can call it that, because it obviously wasn't Kira, had disappeared from the path. As soon as she was gone from my view, the lights turned back on. The entryway of the building was illuminated once more, as were all the hallways. I could move about again without my phone's flashlight. Very carefully, I headed upstairs as quiet as I could, then to the proctor room. My plan was to grab my stuff and book it out of the building, calling the police on my way. Quickly, I swiped the card and shouldered my way into where my backpack was. Kira was waiting for me. She had the computer we'd brought on up on a table with its side panel off. She was busy working on it. She didn't even turn her head to me, only saying something like, Oh, hey. I was so glad to see her, the real her, that I ran up and hugged her. She asked what the heck I was doing, and I told her I'd gone searching for her when the lights shut off. Before I could ramble about the person running through the halls, and the model skeletons, and the other version of her that was doing that heaving thing, she cut me off. She told me that when the lights shut off, she left the bathroom and came back to the proctor office to find me. 
Apparently, she began working on the computer, and I mumbled something about completing another ticket before I walked out of the room. And after that, despite her protests, I made us pack everything in. We grabbed our things and left, Kira complaining the entire time. I never gave her a real explanation. I couldn't. I just needed to get us both out of there. That's really it. I'm sorry for the length of this story. I wish I could give some detailed explanation or round off with some cliche about seeing a silhouette standing inside one of the buildings as we left, but I can't. It ended as quickly and strangely as it began. The only reason I remembered this story is because Kira hit me up recently. We hadn't seen each other since the beginning of the Rona thing, and she wanted to reconnect. We planned to meet up next weekend to get drinks. In her text, she joked about finding out why I made us leave that night. I thought drafting this up might help me find the words to explain it to her, if I decide to explain it at all. As for what entity or phenomenon was in motion that night, I haven't a clue. Maybe someone out there does know, though, and will heed my story as a warning. I do know that whatever it was sincerely enjoyed freaking me out, though. Take that how you will. Good luck on your night shifts, everyone, and stay safe. Haunted and Unwanted at Walmart From Chronic Adventure When I was about 20 to 21 years old, I used to work at Walmart as janitorial and maintenance overnight. The job included usual cleaning and overnight cart gathering. Now, a few bizarre things happened to us. Products falling off of shelves, disembodied voices, etc. But there were three very unusual occurrences. The first one happened on a New Year's night. We had a guy go running through our store while being chased by police officers. In the midst of this, me and two other co-workers were in the back room doing our usual work, when suddenly gunshots were fired towards us. Luckily, we were just fine. More terrifying was the man who was screaming threats at all of us. Another major experience was when we would go out to collect carts. We weren't allowed to be out there alone, we'd have to have two or more people at least. Well, I went out and was told that my buddy there would be outside soon. Within five minutes, a person pulled up in a jeep and he looked like he had been doing substances. He tried to lure me over to his car. Of course, I never went near him, and because I refused to go over there, he pulled a pistol on me and aimed it at me. I froze. Slowly, I reached for my walkie-talkie, but then luckily, my coworker came out. Then the guy in the car sped away. Lastly, on a Halloween night, my coworker and I were cleaning the bathrooms. Earlier that night, we were hearing a lot of different noises, nothing out of the normal. Now, in the past, there have been people who had killed themselves in our store. I don't have many details on this, but I always believed because of it, our store was extremely haunted. But while cleaning the bathrooms, the lights suddenly flipped off, which was weird, but then I heard my coworker laughing. Maybe it was a joke, I thought. My coworker turned the lights back on, and I looked in the mirror. There, staring back at me, was a black shadow with a yellow-toothed grin. We'd been closed for two hours by then, so it couldn't have been a customer. I screamed and ran out of the bathroom. But since that day, I would occasionally see shadows out of the corners of my eyes. Not too often, though. I'm happy to say that I never saw whatever that was ever again. A Sleepover with a Predator From Psy The memory of that stormy night still sends chills up my spine to this day. It goes to show that you can't trust anyone, no matter how much you think you know them. I was 21 years old at the time and I had just graduated from Bible college. I moved up to my first job as a youth pastor in rural Indiana. It was a very small town. There was a gas station, a small coffee shop, a school, a good-sized park, and the small church I just landed a job at. Things were tough at first, because I'm originally from the southeast, and now I lived hundreds of miles away in a place where I knew absolutely no one. That was until I met him. His name was Ray, and we hit it off quick. He was in charge of the elementary school kids at the church, and I primarily worked with the teenagers. 
since we were both considered to be in the youth department, we'd often find ourselves having lunch meetings, going on walks after work to talk about life, and would watch TV shows at each other's houses. There was one night Ray slept over at my house to watch a movie with me, and I was a bit grossed out to see him come out of my bathroom after changing into his PJs, which turned out to be nothing but tidy whities At first I was glad to have a friend, but after a while I felt more and more uncomfortable with Ray. The first thing that would make someone uneasy was Ray's appearance. He was very tall, he stood about six foot six, and he had very long slender arms and legs, but his torso was very heavy. He was kind of similar to those cartoon frogs in the old Looney Tunes cartoons. His face was a little chubby, nearly bald, and he had glasses. You'd think a guy that was this big would have a deep voice, but it couldn't be farther from the truth. Rather, he had a very high-pitched voice and spoke to me and others like a mother would speak to a small child. Ray also had a lot of tics, where he would randomly convulse his head and shoulders and he would stick out his seemingly seven-inch long tongue whenever he'd have those random muscle spasms. I ignored all this, because I've always tried to be one to judge people for their character, not their physical appearance. Plus, Ray helped me move in and assisted me in painting my new place, so I felt bad for judging a guy like that, but it was disturbing nonetheless. Even though his appearance and tics made me feel weird, it was his weird obsession with me that really made my heart sink. He would constantly ask me to hang out every waking moment. There would be times I would go to the bathroom and come out to find 11 or 12 missed calls from him. Most of the time he reached out, I felt obligated to go, but it was always weird. Whether it was sitting with him and talking for hours while he worked at his mom's cake shop, inviting me to watch lame TV shows instead of manly ones, or interrupting my video game sessions with a call to talk about how much he wanted babies one day, all of these interactions were pushing me away. There was even one time he asked me to go shopping with him, and I told him that I only had time for the one store he suggested, because I had a teen church service that evening. He said, okay, that's fine. After we shopped and got back into his car, he locked the doors and drove me around, laughing and saying, you're not going anywhere, you're staying with me, everyone loves Ray. After an hour of this maniac driving me around aimlessly and blasting music, I yelled, take me back to church. Ray was enraged that I yelled, and he punched me square in the groin. It hurt so bad. I squeaked with whatever voice I had left, I can't stand you anymore. He was quiet for the rest of the drive back. Ray had driven me around so long that I ended up arriving late to church for my teen service. To make things worse, there were a bunch of angry parents who had been waiting to drop their kids off for nearly 45 minutes. At that moment, I knew I was done. I had had enough. The next time Ray asked me to do something, I told him I couldn't. I was done with Ray. But he apparently wasn't done with me. He called and texted almost every night with non-stop crying and begging. It was so unnatural sounding for a 27-year-old man. The best way I can describe it is like a middle school girl begging their boyfriend to stay after a breakup. And then the sadness turned to passive aggressiveness when we would see each other at church. There were even times on Sunday morning during the pastor's sermon that I would look over and Ray would be staring at me with this creepy expressionless face. He wasn't listening or paying attention to the message at all. He just sat there glaring at me with this glazed over look of pain and numbness. But I couldn't help but feel he was fantasizing about something else, something insidious. Eventually, Ray quit his job at the church, got a job as a school teacher, and seemed to make new friends. I thought, finally, Ray has new friends to pester. I was in the clear. It felt as if a huge dark cloud had lifted and the sun shined on me once again. A year passed by, I was now married and had my first child. I had almost completely forgotten about Ray, when out of the blue he called me up and asked to catch up. He seemed a lot cooler, like maybe his new teacher friends had really helped him become more normal. We grabbed lunch, and he asked if I wanted to come to his school's football game. I thought, Ray wants to watch football? Finally, something manly. My wife was going to be out of state with our baby visiting family, so I thought what the heck, and I agreed to go. While we were at the game with his teacher friends, it began to rain shortly into the second quarter. 
Before we knew it, there was a full-blown thunderstorm with high winds, so the school announced that the game was cancelled and sent everyone back to their cars. When Ray and I reached our vehicles, a tornado siren began to blare, and because I lived nearly an hour away, he suggested I come back to his house to seek shelter. Tornadoes in the Midwest are not something to mess around with, so naively, I agreed and followed him home. This turned out to be one of the biggest mistakes in my life. Such a big mistake that I would rather have taken my chances with the tornadoes. I could barely see and what should have taken 5 minutes took 15 minutes. When we arrived, Ray showed me around his place. The house was a little creepy and ornate looking, with a lot of old dolls and thrift store looking knickknacks. Even though the decor was weird, the evening started off fine. We watched some home improvement shows, had some snacks and some drinks. It was actually a pretty relaxing way to weather the storm, and definitely be driving 20 miles an hour in heavy rain for several hours, or so I thought. At around 12.30am, the storm was still raging, so we decided to turn in for the night. I asked Ray if I could have a pillow and blanket to sleep on the couch in the living room. He said, no, no, let's sleep in my room. There's plenty of space in there. But I told him the couch would be more comfortable for me. He kept insisting over and over, so reluctantly, I agreed. The floor in his room was so hard, and all he gave me was this tiny Winnie the Pooh kid's blanket and a flat pillow. I was tossing and turning for what felt like hours. At 2am, Ray's voice spoke in the pitch black room. You know, you can hop up here in bed with me if you want. There's plenty of room. I said, no, firmly, and kept tossing and turning. About 30 minutes later, he asked again, Are you sure? It's really fine. I don't know what came over me, but I was so tired and my back hurt so bad that I hopped into bed. After lying there on my back, staring into the darkness, I noticed he kept trying to scoot close to me. I figured he was just asleep, so I inched away a little. This happened several times until I was basically hanging off the bed. He scooted one more time and I turned my back to him. I held really still to act like I was asleep. It got really quiet. Then, out of nowhere, I feel both of his long skinny arms wrap around me and he pulls me into his flabby chest. Ray began squeezing me like a python and rubbed his sandpapery cheek on my forehead. I shot out of the bed, somehow breaking free from the grasp of this freak. I grabbed my pillow and blanket, and I lay on the couch after flushing the toilet to play it off like I had to go to the restroom. I was counting down the seconds until the storm ended, so I could make a mad dash to my car and get the heck out of there. My mind was racing as I thought about what the crap just happened in there. I was so repulsed by what Ray did to me, and I felt filthy for even being in the same vicinity of his bed. I lay there on the sofa beside sliding glass doors in the pitch black living room. There's absolutely zero light, except the occasional flash of lightning, and the sound of the downpour and thunder was deafening. This is the moment that still gives me nightmares to this day. As I lay there staring into the pitch blackness, my back facing the window so I could watch towards Ray's room, the lightning flashed, and I about soiled myself, I kid you not. I saw the black silhouette of Ray standing in the doorway. A few minutes passed by. I was frozen like a statue. My heart felt as if it was going to beat out of my chest. I had to act like I was asleep. I couldn't move a muscle. Then the lightning flashed a second time, and I almost passed out to the sight, which I can only describe as a fat, slender man that all of a sudden appeared right above me. My blood ran cold as I held my breath. He bent down with his weird lullaby he was humming. He sniffed my hair and smiled with a little chuckle, then went back to his room, whispering to himself, I'll see you again. That was the biggest nope in my entire life. As soon as I heard his door shut, I sprang up in an instant, ran down the stairs into the basement, out the back door, and sprinted to my car through the pouring rain. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I felt like he was right behind me, as if his long arms could wrap around me at any moment. As I tried to crank the car, I couldn't get it to start, I fiddled with the keys and locked up steering wheel until I heard the sweet sound of the engine fire up. As I looked up to drive, there he was again, standing in the back doorway like Slender Man. I've never driven so fast in the rain in my life. My wife and I have moved away to work at a larger church in the city, 
and things have been a lot less eventful, thank goodness. Ray tried to call several times before we moved away, but I never answered. Eventually, the calls and the texts stopped, and I've never spoken to Ray again. I don't know why I was so naive. I guess I just always tried to see the best in people. But I can't help but wonder what Ray would have done to me if I really did fall asleep in his bed. Was that what he was thinking about as he stared at me in church those days before he left? It just goes to show that you can never trust someone, even if you think you understand them fully. Be careful out there and watch out for predators, because they come from places you'd least expect. It came with the fog from Double D. Thirteen years ago, I was going through the worst period of my life. All possible misfortunes just followed one after the other. It all started when my husband left me for another woman and kicked me out of our home. Then I was one of the first to get fired when my company, where I spent over ten years, ran into financial problems. When I thought that was the end of it, one night I fell asleep behind the wheel, ran off the road, and destroyed my already miserable car, the repairs of which I paid literally the last money I had. I ended up alone in a small, ugly apartment that I was renting, crying and feeling sorry for myself. Most of the people I considered friends turned their backs on me and left me alone at the mercy of my depression that had me tightly in its claws. My wake-up call was when I realized I would soon be homeless if I continued like this much longer. That's when I decided it was enough. I didn't need anyone, and I would get back on my feet. Since I'm a prisoner of a small, dying but once very lively mining town, I was in no position to choose the job I liked. I had to accept what was offered at the time. So I agreed to a new job at a nearby dairy farm. The job description was this, preparing and taking cows for milking and other related tasks. It's not something you fantasize about as a little girl, but when you're desperate and need money, unfulfilled childhood dreams are the least of your worries. Plus, the job wasn't bad at all. It just took a little bit of time to get used to the sounds, smells, and other charms a farm has to offer. One day, my boss gathered us all together, asking if any of us would be willing to work the night shift until he hired someone new for the job. Before he could even finish the question, I had my hand in the air. Changing tonight meant that I would get a better salary for way less work. Basically, all I would have to do is be physically present and make sure that everything was in order, that the cows were alive and undisturbed. If something really did happen, I could just call the boss, and if a pregnant cow went into labor, I could just call the vet. And that was that. Although the boss wasn't too thrilled with the idea since no one else came forward, he didn't have much choice. Honestly, the first few nights I wasn't comfortable being alone on that farm, but after I got over my fear, I started to really enjoy the place and the fresh night air. My boss planned my duties so that when I arrived, I would settle in a small, well, let's call it an office, and every once in a while, I would take a walk around the place to see if everything was okay. During one of those walks, a genius idea hit me, which I very quickly put into action. I made a small fortress out of hay bales, and instead of being in the office, I was chilling in my new spot. Most of the time, I would read books with a small headlamp, and the best part was that I didn't have to walk anymore, because in case something happened, I would hear everything from my little fortress. One night, just as I was starting a new book, footsteps began to echo in the dead silence of the farm. Loud, specific footsteps that I knew immediately where they were coming from. In front of one of the barns was a large patch of dirt, and at the moment, there was a bunch of mud there. The kind of mud that would torture you fairly well before letting you go through it. I could hear a splash, splash, there was no doubt someone was in front of the barn. I wasn't really scared. I expected to find someone from a nearby town 
trying to steal some oil from one of the mini machines, and I would just tell them to go away before calling the police. It was only when I peeked out from my fortress when I noticed a thick fog had begun to cover every corner of the farm. I bravely started making my way towards the unknown intruder, but to my surprise, there was no one there. It wasn't possible for someone to run away that quickly. As I said, that thick mud does not let go easily. I should have either found someone there, or at least heard them desperately attempting to get out of the mud. Confused and slightly doubting my own ears, I went back to my position and listened carefully. All I heard was silence. I decided to call my brother, because at the time he was in the phase of hardcore gaming and I knew he'd be awake still. I needed to hear a familiar voice. I needed a logical explanation to calm me down a bit. Of course, he told me it was probably nothing, that I was just tired and that my brain was playing tricks on me. He said if someone was really there by now, I would have heard something else. Fully relieved by my brother's words, I went back to my book. I don't know exactly how much time passed, but judging by the pages I read, I would say at least an hour or two, when the silence was disturbed once more. This time, not by footsteps echoing through the farm, but rather a totally unknown, eerie, and somewhat irritating sound that I would best describe as gargling and slurping, Somehow at the same time, I didn't dare to move as the sound was coming closer and closer, then stopped right in front of my little fortress. I stayed there like a statue, my heart in my throat, and a disgusting bitter taste filling my mouth. I had absolutely no idea what to do. Yeah, yeah I, guess I guess you're right. You're right. Maybe, Maybe we can hang out tomorrow. Hang out tomorrow. Well, well, then, well, then give me a call, call when you wake up. I love, I love you. Those were the words that woke me up from my trance. Those were my words. That was my voice. Because that's exactly what I'd said to my brother on the phone earlier. When it finally hit me that the footsteps I heard were in fact real, that they belonged to this whatever the thing was, that all this time I'd been convincing myself I was alone on the farm, this thing was hidden somewhere nearby, and that it was now speaking to me in my voice, and the only thing standing between us was a single bell of hay. I jumped out of my fortress like a bullet and ran into the night, praying to God that I didn't get lost while trying to find my car in the thickest fog I've ever seen. It didn't take me too long to find the car. When I made it, I just sat down, locked myself in, and desperately tried to put the key in the ignition with trembling hands. I then felt and heard something brush against the car. I managed to start the car, and more than anything I wanted to press in the gas, but because of the darned fog, I was forced to move at a crawling pace, and the entire time I could feel light pushes and hear tapping on the back window of the car. I'm not sure when it all stopped, because I was crying and sobbing so loud it was all I could hear at that point. When I felt I'd driven far enough, I called my boss and I tried to explain what happened, but I don't think I managed to say a single word that made sense, and he had no idea what happened or what I was even talking about. But by then I didn't care, I just wanted to go home and hide under a blanket. In the morning when I heard my phone ring, I immediately knew it was my boss calling, that he would want to see me, and that I would likely get fired. But first I would be forced to listen to his speech about how I shouldn't have pushed myself for a job that I wasn't ready to do. But I was wrong. He wasn't mad at all, and I soon found out that the horror story didn't end with me running away from the farm. After my crazy call, my boss came to the farm and tried to find out what had happened. However, due to the thick fog, the only thing he could do was go around the barns. And one of them, he found a dead cow. At first glance, nothing strange. It happens, unfortunately. Except, this was one of the pregnant cows, and her belly had been ripped open, 
the abdominal cavity completely empty. No calf, not a single organ, not a drop of blood, a stain, a print, no sign of a struggle. Nothing. Just a dead animal, surrounded by dozens of other cows that were now calmly munching on hay and didn't seem the least bit upset. How is it possible to walk among so many animals, tear open one's belly, take out so much content in total silence, then walk away without leaving any trace? Although I was returned back to my milking job, my financial situation was still bad, so I didn't last long there. I've never believed in the paranormal before. I've never been a person that gets easily scared. But that night changed everything for me. I didn't feel comfortable working when I knew that maybe I was being watched by something that was just waiting for the right moment to grab me. Then, instead of a cow, I would be left dead, found with a torn open belly, completely empty on the cold, dirty floor. Haunted Vault from Franbo. My hometown in England is very old. There are stories I could tell you about it that are very unsettling. Underneath most buildings in the town center, there are large stone vaults. I don't know what they used to be used for, but most of them have been repurposed for storage. It's especially useful for the bars, pubs, and clubs because it keeps alcohol chilled without the need for extra refrigeration. When I was 19, I got a job in a local club that had four bars attached to the premises. The staff took great pleasure in telling me stories of the vault under the club, which held the alcohol supply and extra glassware. Just from the tone they took, I was expecting to be sent down there and for something to happen. You know, haze in the newbie kind of jokes. Halfway through my first night, sure enough, I was asked to go into the vault to grab a specific bottle of champagne and two champagne glasses. To enter down into the vault, I had to take a back route out the club into a slabbed area and down an old style hatch. The stairs were stone, but they'd been reworked to comply with the graded listing of the building and the health and safety of the business. The vault was extremely cold, even though we were in the middle of summer and I understood why they used it to store the excess alcohol. I had goosebumps on my skin, and I was shivering before I even reached the area where the champagne was capped. The vaults are very dark. Due to the graded listing of the building, there's only certain types of lighting allowed to be built in and used. Many of the vaults had been upgraded, but the owner of this business did not want to spend the extra cash on something that wasn't absolutely necessary. As such, we used head-mounted torches to be able to see where we were going. I was just picking up the two glasses. I had turned to walk up the stairs when I heard shelves rattling behind me. I stopped briefly, and I shook my head with a laugh, or half a laugh, rather. Very funny, I said out loud, and continued out the vault, back up to the bar I was serving at that night. I put down the bottle and glasses with a smile. Good one. Very good joke. You almost had me. I said to one of my co-workers who looked at me confused. You know, the shaking shelves? I laughed. Not very scary, though, to be honest. They continued to look at me and then shrugged while another employee asked what I was talking about. I explained what had happened, and I smirked. I mean, it was a good joke. The second co-worker went a little pale. Nobody else is down there. Well, it must not like you. I laughed that off and kept on with my night. It wasn't until my fourth shift I realized they weren't playing jokes on me. I was helping to restock shelves with a delivery. I was in the vault alone. My boss was signing paperwork up on street level. I was still learning where everything went, so there was a lot of to and fro while I figured out the shelving. As I was standing looking through a list, a small pebble was thrown at me, hitting me on my arm. I exclaimed something out of pain and looked around. The head torch I wore lit up areas directly in front of me. I couldn't see anything, 
but when I looked away, another small pebble hit my leg. This was followed by a low growl, which sounded from my left ear. I made double time to get out of there, nearly running right into my boss, who was more understanding than I expected when I told her what happened. She told me to head up to the bar and she would finish up. That night, I made every excuse to not go down there again. After a couple of months, my boss moved to a new location, and my new boss wasn't as understanding. So far, I'd managed to never be on my own in the vault. There was still activity, but no throwing pebbles or growling. The lights would flicker, the shelves would rattle, and there would be heavy breathing on occasion. But nothing serious, I guess. Under my new boss, this was a no-go. He did not care about whatever stories we'd been telling him, and he didn't believe any of the ghost talk. My job included the vault, and as such, I had no choice. So I endured more growls, thrown objects, glasses breaking in my hands, and even scratches down my back and legs before what turned out to be my final shift the winter before I turned 20. All my enjoyment of that job had been leached out of me by the experiences in that vault. I no longer looked forward to my night shift serving happy drunk people while listening to pounding music. I always dreaded the fact I would have to go to the vault at least twice a week, and I only did four shifts a week. This particular night was quite cold. We'd had the first ice of that winter. It was already bad enough. But just after midnight, I had to go to the vault. I was pre-warned the stairs were slippery this time of year, and I was told to salt my shoes before I took my first step. I took heed of this warning and followed the instructions, managing to safely make it down into the vault. I was midway through the area when my head torch went out. It wouldn't come back on. I could barely see a thing in the dim lighting and still had to get the bottles I was sent for. I had just figured out the layout by this time, so I found the bottles, but I froze when the shelving they were on began to rattle right in front of me. Then, I felt heavy breathing on my neck, followed by a low growl by my ear. I didn't want to turn around, but that was the only way out from where I was. I carefully stepped backwards until I could see the light from outside shining down the stairs. It seemed miles away from me, but realistically, it would only take me 30 seconds to reach. Slowly, steadily, I walked towards the stairs while still feeling whatever it was that was literally breathing down my neck. Just before I got to the stairs, I felt a strong, hard push on the center of my back forcing me to fall and hit the ground, smashing the bottles in the process. I screamed as I fell down, more in shock than fear, but as I got to my feet and went to climb the stairs, I felt something grab onto my jeans leg and tug, making me lose my balance and fall again. Luckily, one of my coworkers had come looking for me, as apparently I had been gone for a while. He found me on the floor with a cut on my head and ripped jeans surrounded by broken glass and alcohol. I explained what happened through sobs, telling him I was quitting there and then. He couldn't blame me. He told me to head up and get seen by the first aider. I stepped out into the paved area and my head torch came back on instantly, as if it never stopped working. I found out later that seven people quit that place in the course of three months because of this heightened activity. The owner got wind, and though he said he didn't believe in ghosts, he wanted to keep his staff, so they stopped using the vault to store the alcohol, and while renovating the club, he had space made for the excess alcohol to be refrigerated in-house. I don't know what those vaults were used for, but in daylight you can still see the chain links in some of them. I never went back to that club, not even for a night out. Paranormal Hospital from Thick Mick Chick I've had several paranormal experiences in my lifetime, 
personally and professionally. I'll discuss the professional paranormal experiences in this story. I worked as a surgical technologist in labor and delivery for about 10 years. It was for a not-for-profit Catholic hospital for almost four years out of that 10. When I first started in the department, two techs that had already worked there for a very long time, M and J, told me stories about Sister Margaret, who was a surgery tech, back when the hospital was still run by nuns. Needless to say, Sister Mary Margaret was very much by the book and left little room for her co-workers' errors. Jay knew about Sister Mary Margaret, but M had worked there so long she'd actually worked with the nun. M began to tell tales about instances when she'd heard Sister Mary Margaret in the OR suite long after she'd passed away and up to the current time frame. Being a born skeptic, I thought M and Jay were just hazing the new girl. I wasn't buying a bit of their nonsense. Well, fast forward to when I'm off of orientation, working my 12-hour night shifts. I'd be in the back, setting up the OR suite, or stocking supplies, and I could hear the shuffle of shoe covers. Just as high heels make the click-clack sound, there's a very distinct sound shoe covers make when they shuffle along the hospital floor. I just sleuthed it out, and I figured M or J put one of the night shift nurses up to pranking me, just to see if I'd fall for it. Well, I just had to hop out of there, catch them in the act, and let them know they weren't fooling anyone. So, I popped out into the hallway, ready to scare the scrub pants off of whoever was pranking me. But when I jumped out there, no one was around. There was no movement at all in the hallway, no swinging of doors, no chatter on the intercoms, nothing. I was really perplexed. This first incident got a shrug from me, and I went on with my work. As time passed, these incidents became more and more frequent. We had more new employees, and M and J were training them. M and her new orientee had an incident where sterile supplies were on the OR bed, and a bulb syringe floated from the top of the supply pile at a 90-degree angle for about a minute, then just dropped onto the floor. I really started to believe them when they relayed that story to me during report. I could tell they were both honestly shaken up by the ordeal, and I actually felt pretty bad for them. They were scared. Trust me, these two were not actresses. There was no way they could have given such an Oscar-worthy performance. I continued having my own encounters with shuffling shoe covers, unintelligible whispering, all the hallmarks of a typical haunting. Some of my tech co-workers continued reporting the same kinds of activity. None of the activity was as egregious as what M and her orientee experienced, what with the floating bulb syringe in midair. This would eventually stop being amusing to me. One early morning, I went to the OR suite at about 2.30 to 3 a.m. to stock linens and sterile water and saline into the warmer. For those of you not familiar with hospital warmers, they're the equivalent to leaving the hospital and going straight to Narnia. These miraculous inventions are what makes your hospital blanket so nice and toasty. We also put sterile water and saline in the top portion of the warmer, two heat up liquids used externally, so the patient doesn't get hypothermic. To give you a visual, it literally looks like an industrial sized stainless steel refrigerator. It performs in the same way, except instead of making everything cold, it warms everything up, thus being the hospital warmer. Anyway, I had taken the linen cart and some water and saline bottles with me to stock up everything. I left the cart in the hallway outside of our two surgical suites. The warmer was in between both OR suites and a little cubby beside our crash cart. As you very well know, hospitals are known for migraine-inducing bright light. This was one of a few things I disliked about working in a hospital. Whenever I was able, I'd spare the blinking fluorescent lights as much as possible. I proceeded to stock the warmer without turning lights on to spare myself the glare whenever I could. The OR suites were darkened and shadowy, but I could easily make my way around. 
I'm sure everyone is familiar with refrigerators and freezers. The fridge is cold, and the freezer part is, obviously, frozen cold. The warmers at a hospital basically work on the same premise. The fridge part warms the blankets, and the freezer part makes the external water and saline bottles toasty. That's exactly what we want. So I opened the fridge part, and expected to be hit in the face with some pretty arid heat. However, it was cold. Wait, I thought, is it broken? I mean, it's gotta be. There's no way this warmer would be running cold. Something wasn't right. I then also checked the freezer portion, which should have been much hotter than the fridge portion. It was somehow colder. Nope, this wasn't right. It wasn't normal for the warmer to be this cold. The fans were blowing warm air, but it just wasn't warming anything up. It was then I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I had never felt that way at the job previously. I turned around, looking up to see a black mist smoke towards the top of the ceiling. At first, I thought that maybe some part of the warmer's electric components had fizzled out, and this was the beginning of a fire. The problem was, the black mist smoke was on the ceiling and in the opposite corner of the warmer. I checked the warmer's connections. Everything appeared to be where it was supposed to be. There was nothing wrong with the warmer at all. There was something in that OR sweet cubby that was not friendly and rather malevolent. I knew it wasn't Sister Mary Margaret. She would never do anything menacing. I can't explain how, but I knew not only that it wasn't her, but I also knew she wasn't there to help protect me from whatever this was. It was slowly seeping down from the corner of the ceiling towards me and the warmer. I did what seemed to be the most sensible thing, and I began to recite the Lord's Prayer. That's when the mist smoke stopped completely. As I continued, it literally looked like a film being played in reverse. It slinked back into the corner it came from, as soon as it was just about gone, I turned to hustle out of that little cubby area and back into the hallway. I happened to notice then, when I turned around to face the warmer, it was back to its normally toasty temperature. I didn't ruminate on this long. I just booked it out of the OR suite to the hallway, back to the nurse's station. Until this very story here, I never said a thing to anyone. I didn't mention my experience to co-workers, friends, nor family. I honestly didn't want to be ridiculed. I just feel this is a story I'm no longer compelled to keep to myself. No harm in sharing it now. I hope you enjoyed it. Two shelters, two different haunts, one annoyed advocate. From Anonymous since I was a little kid, my mom has been working at a domestic violence program. So while growing up, I helped out in the different shelters, cleaning the playroom, aka making a bigger mess than when I found it. There are two shelters I particularly remember growing up around. A huge, beautiful old building that was built back in the 1890s, and an old school slash nunnery that has since been repurposed into our shelter. Even when I was younger, I heard whispers of ghost stories and strange encounters that the staff and clients would tell. I even remember playing with a little boy who talked about seeing a tall black shadow which walked down the hall and into one of the rooms in the nunnery. So that's where I began the tale of the old nunnery. When I grew up, I swore up and down that I would not get into the domestic violence field. I even went to college to be a microbiologist. But life has a different plan sometimes. After several sharp turns, I ended up getting a social work degree, and I worked at the shelters. I was an overnight advocate for about four years, which is when these stories started, and my own experiences came to light. During the first few months that I started working there, I had a client come down. They were visibly shaken and I asked what happened. 
thinking at this point I might have to call 911 if an abuser showed up. I quickly glanced at the cameras and saw that there was nothing outside but a cold winter night. The client cleared their throat and spoke, and what came next chilled me to my bones. I, I think I saw something, but I'm not sure what to do. The client spoke in a shaky voice. I patted the seat next to the office desk I was working at. She sat down while I asked, What do you mean you saw something? Do you mean like a bug or someone outside? They sat in quiet for what seemed like hours. Their face scrunched up like they were trying to put what they saw into words, but could not come up with the right combination. Finally, they said something. I... I thought I saw someone walk into my kid's room, but when I went into the room to confront them, there was no one there. What do you mean? Someone went into their room? I racked my brain on who all might be in the shelter at this time, but at the time all the other clients had night jobs, so it was just me and their family in the shelter. It was someone tall in a black robe. I had just come out of the kitchen and I saw them walking. Well, I guess not really walking, but gliding down the hall. I saw the door open and close. I know I must sound crazy, but I swear to you, I saw a white hand reach out and open the door, then close the door behind them. Okay, grab your kids and go back into your room. The alarm is on, and the only way in and out of this shelter is through the door by our office. So if anyone is here, we will see them, or they'll trip the alarm. I grabbed the hotline and dialed 911 so that the police could come clear the house. Once the officers left, though, investigating the property, they stated that there were no signs of a break-in. I even rewound our surveillance footage, and I found nothing, minus the clients coming and leaving from shelter and a stray dog which had wandered through our front yard. With a sigh of relief, I settled in for the rest of my shift. The next couple of months were quiet. New clients came and went, so there was a new crop of people in the program. During this time, I talked to my fellow co-workers. They told me about how they heard things move around upstairs while no one was in the shelter, but nothing like what the client had talked about. So I did what any good Catholic was taught. Ignore the crap out of the spirits until they go away. However, although I did ignore them, they did not ignore me. After the start of the new year, my co-worker and I were doing shift change. At our shelter, evenings and overnights, only one person works at a time. How our office is set up is that there is the advocate's office which connects to a conference room, which then leads to the laundry area, where there is a door to exit the shelter. We were talking about client matters and didn't feel like getting up and shutting the conference room door so we had the advocate's door cracked open to see if anyone was coming. While we were both deeply involved in the conversation, the advocate's door slammed shut. For those out there that might say, well, maybe some vibrations closed the door, here's why that's not possible here. The offices are in the basement of the shelter, and no matter how much you jump up and down or dance, that door doesn't move. Trust me, I tried after this instance, we tried our best to recreate what happened, but we could never make it work. As I've worked in the program throughout the years, other creepy things would happen, like someone grabbing my chair, an invisible force sitting at the edge of the advocate bed. It was a part-time sleeping position. And the smell of rotten eggs around room three, where the client saw the ghost walk in. I started referring to the ghost as Sister Margaret, I ran into one of my old teachers who used to work at the school, which the nunnery was involved with, and asked her if she heard about anyone dying in the nunnery. She asked more about our experiences, and after much discussion, I was originally thinking she was going to laugh at the stories, since she was always a scientific thinker, and always had to have proof before she believed anything. However, after I finished relaying pretty much exactly what I just told you all, her face had a serious look to it. 
She talked about how no nun had died on the property, and what we were experiencing wasn't a ghost. You have to make a copper omega symbol, blessed with holy oil, and place it facing north in the room. That will close the portal that must be in the shelter. A portal, huh? So that's exactly what I did. And ever since then, no client has talked about seeing ghosts. At least, not in that specific shelter. At our sister location, the house built back in the 1890s, there isn't an evil ghost, just someone who isn't ready to let go of their home yet. I'd picked up a shift at that location to help during the summer lull. Most of the advocates who worked there were college students at the nearby college and would go home for the summer. This is also a part-time sleeping position, which means once you lock up at midnight, you could sleep until 6 a.m., unless the hotline rang, which meant you have to get up and answer it. The sister location's office was located in what we called the day room. It was on the main level of the building and towards the front of the house. There were two main entrances to the room, which were two eight-foot-tall sliding original doors. One of the doors leads into the children's playroom, which is by the kitchen. The other leads to the foyer. So, to lock up, the advocates would padlock themselves in the room so no one could walk in while they were sleeping. As I was laying on the couch, listening to another episode of Bob's Burgers with my eyes closed, I heard the faint sounds of footsteps from the upstairs level, where the clients slept. Someone was making their way downstairs. It was soft and faint, like the sounds of a child's footsteps when they didn't want to get caught. I thought, it's probably just a kid getting a glass of water. However, instead of going towards the kitchen, these footsteps turned and walked into the playroom. They stopped outside the doors to the advocate's office. I lay there, wondering if they heard the show and thought I was on a hotline and suddenly thought they were being too noisy. Which happens. Wake up, wake up, wake up. I heard an old man's voice in my ear. I shot straight up with goosebumps forming all over my arms. Then a loud bang came from the door where the footsteps had stopped. It was like someone took both of their hands and hit the other side. With that, the shelter became quiet again. I got up and looked around the shelter. However, all the clients were in bed sleeping, and the alarm was set, which meant no one could come or leave without us knowing. The next day, I stopped the shelter lead on my way out the door, and I asked, Hey, is this place haunted? She looked at me and laughed. Oh, did Walt visit you? Dumbfounded, I asked what she meant. Apparently, Walt lived in the house back when it was first built and just never left. He had never hurt anyone, but he did love messing around with new advocates, especially overnight staff, by walking around, moving things, knocking on doors, or waking the advocates up. That's it for my shelter stories. If you or anyone you know needs help fleeing from a DV relationship, there is help out there. There is something on Saddle Road. From Aloha Potato. I grew up in southeast Idaho, in a small farming town. I worked around there until I got a job offer to work for a company in Hawaii as a mechanic. To me, that was the deal of a lifetime. I mean, not many people where I'm from can say that they moved to and worked in Hawaii. So I took the job, and I found out that a couple of friends would be joining me. So off we went to the Aloha State, where the temperature is always warm, and the beaches are beautiful. Now, as time went on, my friends began to leave one by one, until I was the last one there. I was about to leave with a fat wad of cash in my pocket when I got another offer from the same company. This time, they would want me to be a driver and deliver products on the big island. It sounded simple enough, but the only downside was that the plant I was to be stationed at is in Hilo, and I would need to do a route over on the Kona side, 
which is on the other side of the island. In reality, it isn't too bad, but it is the longest route that the company has. I would have to wake up at 12 a.m. just to get to the distribution center and do my pre-trip, make sure I have all my products for all the stops, and start heading over before 2 a.m. On average, I would not get back until around 3 p.m. Sometimes the days would be shorter, sometimes longer. It just depended. But to me, it didn't really matter, because the money was great, and I was greedy. If I only knew what would happen to me, I would have just packed up my tools and left. The reason why so many weird things happened on the big island to me, compared to any other island I went to, is that it was there where I learned a lot of superstitions of the native Hawaiians. Some are similar to the superstitions we have back at home, like not whistling while the sun is down. Where I'm from, it's supposed to attract skinwalkers and windigos and the like. For them, as it was told to me, it was disrespectful to the spirits that roamed the islands. I have a lot of paranormal stories from over there in Hawaii, and if this story is interesting to some of you, and you want to hear more, I'd be willing to share. In this particular story, it's one of my scarier encounters while I was over there. It started like any other day. I made my way over to the distribution center, checked my loads, checked my truck for a pre-trip, and headed off over Kona from Hilo. The only downside I had was that the gas station where I usually had my coffee in the morning was closed for remodeling. So as I went up Saddle Road, I was a little groggy, but it wasn't too bad. I mean, it wasn't to the point I was about to fall asleep. I climbed up the mountain up on Saddle Road in my rig. I believe I was listening to a podcast about conspiracy theories at the time. I soon made it to the top of Saddle Road. Once there, I decided to pull over and relieve myself. I'll give you a bit of layout. As you're heading towards Kona on top of the mountain, there is a park. Just a little ways down from the park, there is this military installation where I stopped. I decided to pull over and do my business, and I would readjust so I could go down Saddle Road. I went to the park to do my business, and as I was coming out, I heard what sounded like a coyote yipping just behind me. Now, that may not be a little odd to me, seeing how I grew up in an area where there are tons of coyotes. But the problem was, I don't believe there were any coyotes in Hawaii, let alone any predators of the sort. I've heard rumors that there were wolves up in the northern side of the island, but that was just it. Rumors. I never saw any wolves up there, and I've done quite a few routes up in the northern part of the island. The only predators I've ever seen were the wild pigs that roamed all over the island. But what I just heard was definitely a coyote yipping. So I turned around to see if I could spot any nearby coyotes. But I didn't see any. As I turned around and began walking back to my rig, I heard the coyote yip again. Immediately I spun around, and what I saw shocked me. I saw a silhouette of what I could assume to be a man passing the outhouses where there was little light. He hid behind a tree and peeked out at me. This obviously freaked me out so I started double-timing back to my truck. By the time I got back in, he was still out there, peeking around from behind the tree. I started up the rig and took off. The whole time as I passed the military base, I was wondering to myself, who in the world, or what in the world, was that? My first guess was it was probably a homeless man who wanted to jump me. Then I thought maybe a skinwalker, because it came out after the coyote yipping I heard. In an attempt to calm myself down, I ended up listening to some country music, singing and whistling along as I went down Saddle Road, doing my best not to think about it. Halfway down Saddle Road, as I whistled, I saw something out of the corner of my eye running towards the road. 
as I looked around to see what it was. What I saw horrified me. I saw this dark humanoid figure running towards the road to the point where he was in front of my truck. I immediately tried to swerve out of the way, but from what seemed to have happened to my perspective, I hit them. But the crazy part was I did not feel or hear a thing. No thuds, no bumps, no screams or yells. Nothing happened. When I was finally able to stop, I got out of my truck to see if I did indeed hit someone. A little ways up the road, I saw the dark silhouette of a man, and it felt as if he was staring at me with so much hatred that I felt it in my soul, even though I couldn't even see if he was looking at me. Then he turned and walked off to the other side of the road and began to cross the lava rocks until I could no longer see him. This event had spooked me enough that I got back in my truck and slowly made my way down Saddle Road until I got to Kona. I pulled into a gas station, bought a pack of cigarettes. That day was the first and only day I ever smoked while on the job. Not two weeks after that, I put in my two weeks notice to the company I worked for, ultimately deciding to move back to southeastern Idaho. Writing out this story now still freaks me out. To this very day, I don't know what I saw. Maybe it was one of the night marchers, a native Hawaiian spirit. Or maybe it was a skinwalker. Either way, I hope I never have an experience like that again. But still, it's really good to get it off my chest. My new job, from Matt. I previously worked in finance, but due to the fact I loathed my job, and due to my talents being entirely unrelated to finance, I decided to branch out for other jobs. The bank I worked at opened up an executive security position. I was friends with some guys on the security team, and I was always secretly envious of their jobs being able to walk around all day, chat with the pretty girls at their desks, a stress-free job most of the time. I decided to apply. After all, I had experience working a similar position at a different bank. I got an interview. In the meeting, they informed me that weapons qualification was mandatory, and physical fitness was also mandatory. This came as a surprise to me as half their team already was pretty out of shape. They asked if I had law enforcement or military experience. I said I didn't, but I grew up a wrestler and could hold my own. I also grew up shooting and would have no issues handling a weapon. And most importantly, working in finance gave me a silver tongue. I could talk my way out of problems and negotiate like no one's business. They seemed good with my responses. Before they would give me the job, they wanted me to shadow one of the team members to see if I was well received with the staff. It was great walking around and checking doors and things like that, instead of sitting at my desk, contemplating jumping out the window. I was fortunate enough to be offered the job, but at a pay decrease. This wasn't ideal, but I was happy to oblige for the sake of my sanity. They did promise a lot of promotional opportunities and qualification testing, which would pay more down the road. I accepted the job. First thing, they got me fitted for a suit. They wore snazzy suits every day, to look professional, and also because suits make it easy to conceal a firearm. I got two tailor-fitted suits and another $400 to use towards more clothes, to wear on duty, or a duty weapon if I needed one. I already had a gun much nicer than what their $400 would buy me so I spent it on ammunition and additional clothes to wear with my suit. They trained me to monitor the cameras and motion alarms in their high security room, which we called the office. I could monitor activity in every room in the 14-story building, excluding the bathrooms and locker rooms, of course. I also had access to all the banking branches in seven different states. In case of robbery, or worse, we could have eyes on the situation to report to the police. 
I was also trained to operate a garage door remotely, to let vendors and deliverers make deliveries to a warehouse in the basement. It was pretty chill. Not only did we work in the corporate offices located in various cities, but we were also to provide executive security for the CEO when he traveled. He didn't need it, he just liked feeling important. We were also required to work traveling security at various branches in rougher parts of towns that had frequent violent guests or robberies. As it was cheaper for them to place actual bank employees as security than it was to have a local police officer be there. It was an awesome job, stress-free compared to my last job. I was able to prioritize physical fitness and training and spend downtime schmoozing with all the guests and being friendly. We were required to have one person work a week of evening shifts every month and a half. That's where the excitement of my story really begins. My first evening shift was actually a special assignment. Usually, they only have night shifts at the main corporate office, but due to some weird scheduling conflicts, they wanted me to spend the evening at one of these smaller offices in a rough part of town. They leased the second floor out to the city, which hosted Alcoholics Anonymous meetings weekly, which is why I was there. It was nothing against the guests, it was that they couldn't let potential guests have unmonitored access downstairs where all the sensitive banking information was, or say, where the vault was located. I didn't mind at all and had a good time greeting everyone there for their meeting and seeing everyone leave when it was finished. Eventually, the group host, a young woman, told me she was too scared to walk to her car alone at night and was hoping I could walk with her to her car to make sure nothing spooky happened. I was happy to oblige. She was kind, and we made small talk. She told me her name was Alexandra, but she went by Alex. She parked behind the building, away from where her group members parked. It was relatively unlit. She fumbled for her keys in her bag and ended up dropping them on the ground. She bent over to pick them up and I noticed bruises on her arm. I asked if she was okay and she seemed anxious that I asked at all. Quickly, she pulled her sleeves back down to hide them. She gave me some excuse about bruising easily and just being clumsy. She then opened her car door and drove away. I went back inside. For some reason, they wanted me to stay and guard the building even though the group had left. I didn't mind. I got paid extra for night shifts, and I liked being up at night anyway. I did some rounds, made sure there were no stragglers squatting in the building, and I made sure all the doors and windows were locked. I found a little office perpendicular to the main lobby, and I sat in a chair to watch something on my phone. Probably a UFC fight, maybe even that 70s show or something. After a moment, I heard loud banging at the front door, which I had just come in from. I looked out the window of the office I was in, and I noticed my car was still the only car in the parking lot. My first thought was maybe this was some hobo tweaking out. I looked out the office door, and I saw a large man who was pretty well dressed, but he looked angry and disheveled. He kept pulling his hair periodically while yelling. He was yelling my name. There was no reason anyone around here should be angry with me, let alone know my name. I spoke to him through the doorbell intercom system we had. I could barely understand what he was saying. But eventually, I made it out. Alex, she cheated on me with you. Followed by various expletives. I tried explaining calmly that I'd just met this Alex that day, and I barely even knew her name. He was confused. He was truly a psycho. I remembered the bruises on Alex's arms and realized why she'd been so scared to walk to her car alone. He pushed his way into the lobby through the broken glass. He had steel toe working boots on and a thick construction worker type of jacket or coat. He was much bigger than me, probably a strong six foot three. He was holding a large rock and he muttered in rage, you know what happened to the last guy she cheated on me with. He threw the rock right at my face. I only narrowly dodged it. 
I closed the distance quickly and grabbed him in a clinch. The goal was to move his legs so I could trip him and potentially gain an advantageous position on the ground to restrain him. But he was as strong as an ox, likely an experienced wrestler as well. He effectively countered my double underhooks and threw a punch that made me hear bells ring. I knew I had no choice anymore. I drew my pistol and demanded he get on the ground. Right then, to my relief, a spotlight shined on him from the front door, and I noticed red and blue lights in the parking lot. The police quickly were able to subdue him and get him in cuffs, although he resisted them as well. The police took my statement and also took the security footage from the camera system. I told them he must be nuts and abusive. He was trying to kill me over a woman I had just met. They told me I was lucky they were already close by when they got the call. I called my manager and went home. They gave me a couple of days off to relax. I was okay, mostly glad it ended with everyone alive and that the cops prioritized my call. I was asked to go back to that building for night security again a couple weeks later. I was happy to see that the door was fixed. Same sort of meeting, it was a positive shift despite my trauma. I saw Alex again, and she thanked me for walking her to her car that night. She told me she heard what happened, and that he was her crazy abusive ex who had been stalking her everywhere she went. She told me she had a restraining order, which he ignored and was now in jail. We later discovered that he was hiding in the parking lot waiting for Alex. He listened to our conversation, and that's how he learned my name. For whatever reason, he decided to target me instead. Alex and I became friends. I started then submitting job applications to do literally anything else. I can't do the same thing for too long. Hopefully I don't have any more crazy work stories to submit after this. There's a disappearing woman at my university from Cleaning Crew. During the time the story takes place, I was and still am a member of the facility services for a university that will remain nameless. That's a polite and encompassing term for cleaner, even though it also includes the frequent migration of classroom and laboratory hardware that isn't leased, mostly desks and chairs. The nature of my position effectively guaranteed exclusive night shifts, and that is something I very much appreciated at the time I was hired for a few reasons. I have an ocular condition called pars planitis. It's something I was born with, aside from my right eye being no better in visual acuity than the camera lens of an early 2000s flip phone. It guarantees a whole other fun host of features. Cascading eye floaters, visual snow, blue and tropic field, and extreme sensitivity to light are among the most prevalent. This effectively guarantees I'm always wearing sunglasses rain, shine, early morning, or late afternoon. The only exception is, of course, at night. That fact led me to appreciating my evening shifts so much more. While I do have horrendous streaking astigmatism in both lenses, it's the most bearable of all symptoms. So being out at night is my jam. Not to say I can perfectly see in the evening. It's still hard in some environments. That's why when I first saw it, I assumed it was nothing more than a visual distortion. The sight was so hard to explain. I was cleaning in a lab, one far larger than most as it sat below the library, and had one open access computers for all students. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement, brief and adjusting, like a person watching me. I thought it was a person anyway. It was near the end of the semester, and it's 10 o'clock at night. It's very atypical to see a student at that time, but nevertheless, I looked over. As I did, my eyes trailed after the sight, bizarrely finding nothing awaiting them. Of course, I didn't think much of it. Just another visual distortion. Nothing new under the fluorescent lights mounted to the high ceilings of the lab. Off I went, sanitizing workstations. This was back when the pandemic had struck, so it had to be done daily. And we even had a checklist with each computer station's ID to mark off as we went. So that's what I was focused on, not paying much mind at all. Maybe 10 minutes later though, I saw it again. Roughly the same shape, the same height, 
and just out of the corner of my eye. Someone was watching me, only this time from the opposite side of the room. I followed it, even quicker than before, only to see it disappear. That's when I began to suspect my eyesight was finding another way to mess with my perception. And so I gave my face a quick rub, debating on an early drop of my anti-inflammatory prescription. Just as I took my hands away from my face though, I saw something. Up in front of me, where I thought the person had been, was a cigarette on the floor. At this distance, my vision could barely resolve it. But as I approached, it turned out to be exactly what I had thought. I can't tell you much about it, other than the fact that it had been dragged on. It sat, halfway burned, idly against the ground. I was positive that it had been there when I'd come in. I knew it for a fact, regardless. I took a gloved hand and trashed the item. As I did so, I picked up on a very light scent of smoke, as if it had been burning 10 or 20 minutes prior, combined with another lighter floral aroma like that of a perfume. When I came home early that morning following that evening shift, I was anxious. Really, I thought my condition had gotten worse, and I was emotionally preparing myself to have to deal with these new distortions. It's never fun when you gain a new, consistent problem with your vision. I was practicing to see if they'd occur again, emulating the same light levels and flicks of my head to see if my eyes would produce the look of someone watching me just out of the corner of my eye. To my appreciation, they didn't. I wondered if it was the fluorescent lights unique to the university, or even the lab, that were triggering it. I seemed to find out otherwise, as I started my shift the following evening. After collecting and running trash from the bins out to the dumpster outside of one of the campus buildings, I noticed it again. This time, it was under the cover of night. Only a high-set parking lot light illuminated the general darkness. Instead of snapping my eyes over to it only for it to disappear, I handled the garbage slowly, instead choosing to observe it in the periphery of my vision like one would a floater in your own vision. As I focused, it became clear that I was looking at a very legitimate person, at least it so appeared. They were dressed in white primarily, though I couldn't tell much of their skin tone or features from the corner of my vision, and no less, they were smoking. The plumes of subtle fog that were blowing into my field of vision made it clear. Confident that someone was absolutely positively there, I snapped my head over, only to see no one. Nothing. Not so much as a whisper of anything ever even being there. Awestruck, I moved over to where they precisely were, against an adjacent building, just outside an exit that was maybe 30 feet from my original position. I could barely make out the hot vapor of a cigarette moving against the night air, and as I looked down, there was another cigarette on the ground. The same brand as the lab from the previous evening. I picked it up, with glove on, mind you, and examined it under the light of the faraway street lamp. It appeared to be the same brand as the one I'd thrown away the night prior, having only a few drags taken off the end. Most notably, though, there was a visible shade of lipstick planted at the end of the filter. It was comical, really. The deep red mark was incredibly tangible, as if the woman who was smoking it had been wearing a very thick layer of gloss. Now, like anyone would, I assumed the cigarette had been there from before. That's what I would have thought too, were it not for the faint trace of heat that I could detect even through my gloved fingers, as if hot smoke had just been dragging through it. I continued my shift distracted, put on music as I worked my way about campus, my playlist doing little to ease my wandering mind. I knew now, that these were no ocular distortions. I was seeing someone, even if it was just out of the corner of my eye. Someone was there, a woman I guessed, given the lipstick and they had an affinity for cigarettes. And yet somehow, whenever I turned my periphery and looked directly toward them, they'd vanish, leaving only their addictive vice behind. As the night bore on, it happened on two more occasions. The first, I actively studied them, just seeing how far I could get to them in the center of my vision before they would decide to vanish. I tilted my head slowly, and on the tiny medium that divided an abstract humanoid made up of colors to a feature-rich individual, they disappear. It was simply frustrating. So, the second time I saw them, which was inside a near-vacant hallway, I tried something different. 
I approached them, slowly. I kept my blurry corner vision on them, but moved forward. Slowly I neared, feeling ridiculous all the while I guessed it was someone messing with me. And when I was no more than 10 feet away, I stopped, deciding to speak and say hello. I listened quietly for a response, focusing on my hearing tightly. I picked up on a quiet idle sound, paper, tobacco, and any other accessory additives being burned. There was absolutely, positively someone right there, smoking. I could smell it too. I stepped forward, being sure not to change where they were in my field of view, and I said hello again. I was right next to them now, and I could feel the oxygen I breathed being afflicted by their smoke, and the acidic burn becoming quite uncomfortable. Evidently, the person was ignoring me, still grossly fixated on their indoor cigarette. I felt incredibly ridiculous, especially because I wasn't so much as facing them, only observing them through my periphery. Confident now that there was no way that they could slip out of my vision, I turned my head, both eager and anxious to see who was waiting for me. But as I did, I was met with the blank wall. The space the person had been leaning against was vacant. However, close as I was, I did catch the sight of a still-lit cigarette falling to the floor of the hallway. Dumbfounded and upset, I stomped on it, putting it out as I considered what had just happened. As the smoke faded away, there was still the tinge of a somehow outdated smelling perfume on the air. The rest of the night after that was terrible. Now confident that it wasn't my vision playing tricks on me, I shuddered to think of the other remaining possibilities. Was I delusional? It seemed the most logical. My hours were tame, but still long, and my sleep schedule was at an all-time low in terms of health. But even so, I had seen these cigarettes. Those were tangible. I remember looking down on one occasion, propping my foot up to see the bottom of the shoe's sole was stained and ashy. For the rest of the evening, I wrestled with my thoughts, consciously avoiding focus of anything in my periphery, so as not to repeat the bizarre occurrence of someone disappearing right in front of me. This new way of how I looked at things continued as my shifts went on. I found myself adopting my all too familiar sunglasses at night, using them as guides and ensuring I paid no mind to anything outside of my field of view that the lenses offered. It did work well enough to relax me, at least for a while. Whether it was that state or the simple passage of time that caused the next progression to occur, I'm still unsure. One evening, as I was actively minding my own business and sweeping under the tables, back in that same computer lab below the library, I looked up to see one perfectly observable in the dead set of my vision. And they were smoking. It was a woman. She was Asian, with mid-length black hair and glasses even thicker than my own. The most atypical thing about her was the lab coat she wore, bizarrely bright white that caused my pupils to dilate just observing it even from under the sunglasses. She was leaned against the far wall of the lab, looking at me and drawing on her cigarette. At the time, I didn't immediately draw a line between her and the strange experience I'd had a few nights prior, so I wasn't quite on edge. With a rather aggressive tone, I asked her what she thought she was doing smoking indoors. She made no indication that she heard me, instead dragging on her smoke once more and so I stepped forward, opting to walk over to her so that she'd be forced to acknowledge me. Somehow, though, in the brief split second it took my eyes to close and reopening following a blink, she had vanished. Just like before, only this time, it was even more surreal. She was dead center in my vision, not at the corner, and yet, she dematerialized completely and utterly. My eyes opened quick enough to spot the still-lit cigarette dropping to the floor, just like I'd seen already. That was the last straw for me. I was done for that evening. I left early, stepping on the cigarette and crushing it into the floor without bothering to clean the residue. The frustration I felt combined with the eerie sense of uncertainty in my own senses was far too crippling to work with, and so home I went, informing my coworkers in the group chat that I wasn't feeling well while avoiding anything too specific. During my walk, I logged onto my medical clinic's website, making an appointment with my GP about hallucinations, as I had no confidence left in myself. Once I was finished, I remember putting the phone back into my pocket 
only to take it out a second later as I felt it vibrate. I checked the notification. It was a message in my team Slack. That very same chat I used to inform them that I was leaving early for the night. It was sent by a coworker I barely knew. And even so, the content chilled me. It read the following. Who was the girl in utility? Being the first to see it, I immediately asked for clarification as to what they meant. My coworker then went on to indicate that they had walked into one of our larger utility rooms where we keep carts and cleaning supplies. As they did so, a woman who looked exactly like the one I'd seen was exiting the room from the other side. Keep in mind, our rooms were all key carded. Granted, there were a few people that had access aside from our little team, security mostly. But even so, it was extremely rare to see someone there, especially so late at night. Hesitantly, I asked if they were smoking, only for them to confirm that the rancid air of cigarettes was very present in that small room. The next day as my shift began, I conferred with my coworker and we both went to the central utility where they saw her. Once they finished telling their story once more, they began to mention that they thought they'd seen her before too, but not in the same capacity that I had. She'd only ever been exiting room that belonged to facilities or turning corners and actively heading away from my coworkers. I felt a new sense of security knowing that I wasn't the only one seeing this apparition as I came to start coining her as. Even despite our sightings being different, that classification was a unique stretch for me to make. I'm generally a pretty rational person, and yet, there weren't many conclusions I could draw beyond that. Whoever this bizarre woman was that seemed incessant on chain smoking and following around the nighttime facility's crew, she'd exhibited a vanishing act superior to that of Houdini, and I wasn't the only one who'd seen it in action. In all honesty, I found myself excited as my shift began. My coworker and I both opted to share with each other if we saw the strange woman again, and so my insecurity had more or less erased itself. I was curious to see if I could find out more about the strange character. My work had taken on a new energy, one where I was much more attentive to detail and aware of ambient noises. Each stray floater in my vision I investigated. Curious to see if it was the strange woman hanging out of the corner of my vision. Surprisingly though, for most of the majority of that night, no such event occurred. I was surprised, fully expecting I'd see them even if ever so briefly at some point. As I was running multiple bags of trash out to the dumpster, I felt my phone buzz, and I checked it as my hands became free. It was my coworker, leaving me a message to come to the basement floor of one of the campus buildings. Basement floors were generally rare and only present on two of our old installations. Before I could even ask why, another message appeared on my screen saying that they were pretty sure she's here. So off I went, intrigued. I felt a pressure in my chest build as I became anxious but ignored it. It was far less than my excitement in seeing the mysterious girl. I entered the building, moving down a large hallway before reaching the stairs and following the left flight down, arriving at the bottom. I was met with a large double door and my coworker waiting on the outside of it. The area was a tight hallway, the only opening behind the door in question. Inside was illuminated with a white yellow glow, the type synonymous with industrial lighting systems from decades past. Admittedly, I didn't know what the door led to. I'd never needed to come down here before, and by the look on my coworker's face, I'm guessing they hadn't either. Quickly, I asked them about the text they had sent me, and they informed me that while running trash outside of the building, they narrowly caught the strange woman heading down the stairs that I had just come down. Apparently, they followed her right away, repeatedly asking for her attention, even despite her refusing to stop. Then they'd arrive at the door we both were at now, where they'd messaged me from. When I asked them if they knew whether our key rings worked or not, they advised me to listen first. Confused, I did, hearing nothing for a few seconds. But then, a voice became audible, that of a mature woman, a crisp voice with a heavy accent who sounded visibly angry as if she was arguing with someone. It was coming from the other side of the door, somewhere in the stone-walled, hazily lit room. I asked them if they thought that that was a strange woman, and they nodded, seemingly positive that it was. Intently, we both listened, and though most of the words were hard to hear through the door, 
The way her voice moved up and down octaves indicated her conversation was personal and emotional. It grew more and more heated, up until she screamed a loud curse and followed up with a smash, as if she'd broken the phone she was talking on. I was actually a little concerned about intruding on whoever might be in there, even if it was that bizarre woman. But my coworker had other ideas. Quickly, they whipped out their key ring, using the key default for the building on the deadbolt. It worked seamlessly, and the door swung open with a creak. They entered, and I followed behind them. Quickly, it became clear that the tight's room hazy appearance wasn't due to the lighting, but in actuality, the cigarette smoke. In a space no bigger than a washroom, there were makeshift ashtrays everywhere. Legitimate glass and porcelain ones numbered in the tens. And beyond that, there were scraps of documents, magazines, and even paper plates imbued with cigarette butts and ash. Though it was clear as day there were no exits in the room, the woman who was in there, passionately arguing on the phone, had vanished. The only trace of anyone in there, in recent being the smoldering remains of a cigarette in an ashtray on the far corner of the room, atop a desk, its trail of smoke filtering against the ceiling. We were both incredibly confused, though I, at least internally, seemed to process a good bit better as a similar disappearance had occurred right in front of my eyes earlier on. As weird as it sounded, I had started coming to terms with the notion of tangibility being thrown out the window. And so as my coworker fumbled around with the words struggling to define exactly what had just happened, I had already begun looking around. Like I said, the office was gross. Every once white document had been stained yellow in cigarette smoke. Many covered in ashes or stained as if the paper was used to put out cigarettes that weren't burning hot enough to set the page ablaze. From what I could tell, the majority of it was invoices regarding materials only identifiable by serial numbers that I couldn't read. What I could very well make out though were the dates. The age of the paper was obvious, with the newest stamp that I could find being from early 2010. Though most were much older, I sorted through them, becoming dissuaded quickly as a silverfish that had been presumably snacking on the pages scuttled out from between them. I inhaled sharply, realizing that aroma of perfume that I'd noticed a few times before had been stinking up the room under the mask of cigarettes. Though, admittedly, I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. After verbally searching for a logical explanation and finding nothing, my coworker uttered that this was way too freaky and that we should leave. I agreed, but just before I did, I noticed a device sitting on top of one of those stacks of documents, an old Blackberry. At the time, I didn't know what era it was from, what I did find interesting was the glass over the presumable LCD having a hefty crack in it, as if it had been smashed. I would have assumed it was the phone we heard the woman talking on moments prior, were it not for the thick layer of dust coating it and everything else in the room. As all my cognition pointed to, nobody had used it at any point in the last decade, and so I decided to pocket it. I wasn't really sure why, but I felt drawn to the outdated device. We both left then, with him turning off the lights that had been on for a very long time on our way out. My coworker locked the door, and we both mutually agreed to talk on our next shift about it, as we were much too tired that early morning to bother trying to rationalize what had just occurred. I finished off the trash run I'd been in the middle of before, then heading out for the day. Just as I walked off campus, I took the Blackberry I had taken out of my pocket, eagerly trying the power button. Of course, it didn't turn on. Something was really driving me to access the phone. Though, I couldn't explain it, but somehow I knew its contents had information that I needed to see. So as I got home, I looked through my cable stuffed shoeboxes to see if I could find something that matched the charging port. Eventually I did. I came to learn it was a micro USB connector, like the ones you'd use for older Androids. So I connected it to one of the USB ports on my PC. A conscious decision, because I didn't know if the voltage from the wall could harm the device and let it rest for a moment before I once again held the power button. Amazingly, he decided to boot, showing me first a branded image of its presumed carrier before it gave me a message that the SIM card wasn't detected. I skipped through that though. I knew if there was anything interesting on that device at all, 
it'd be in two places, the text messages or the camera roll. The former was entirely devoid of content, possibly due to the SIM being removed. But the latter had a singular photo for me to view. It was her, the woman we'd been seeing. She was dressed just as I seen her in an open white lab coat. A man who was a good bit taller than her had his arms wrapped around her, hugging her tightly. I didn't recognize him at all, though he was wearing a facility's uniform just like my own. Evidently, he'd worked in the department I was in at some point in the past. The photo was just outside one of the campus buildings that I recognized, though the entrance was still in construction, indicating to me that the photo was just as old as a phone. My next shift, when I returned to the campus, I decided that I was going to put the phone back. Something about that picture exuded a certain finality, like a museum piece, and I felt odd having it. But before I did so, I decided to show my coworker. At first, they were a little upset that I didn't tell them about the phone the day prior, but they did start to enjoy the novelty of the photo. Then, they pointed out something interesting that I hadn't quite picked up on the previous day. The man in the photo looked a good bit like me. After I returned the device and left the strange office, I never saw the woman again. Neither did my coworker, at least not up until they quit. I wish I could end this lengthy story with a conclusion that makes sense, but I really can't. I've stopped trying to figure out what she was and how she disappeared from right in front of me so many times. What I am curious about though, is what she wanted. Whether or not she intended for me to find that phone and the photograph, I'm unsure. Part of me wonders if she appeared to me because I looked like the man in it. Perhaps he was a friend or a lover. I guess I'll never know for sure. The sole person I've told this tale to, my partner, seemed positive that the woman was a restless spirit of sorts. Someone long past who decided to manifest once more because of my similarity to someone she cared about. Whether or not I choose to believe that, if it's true, then I do hope that woman has found her closure. Some days, I do wish I could know more, but that strange office and its surrounding floor had been condemned for months now. And as far as I know, the last traces of her and her work have been removed in the process of renovation. Night Shift Nutcase from Ali Cat. Disclaimer. This story is not mine. It's a story from a friend who has given me permission to send it to bring attention for all young women working night shift. When I was a freshman in college, I had a weekend job working for a local sandwich shop next to a liquor shop in the far corner of my town. I hated that job, but I was only working evenings there to make some extra money to help pay for my own food and necessities to get me through college. The customer seemed friendly enough, I guess, and my coworkers were all right as well. They were fun and interesting people, but my boss was a real jerk. I was lucky I didn't have to see him that often, because he was only around during the mornings. Yet he'd always seem to find a way to make my day more stressful when he was there. My boss would constantly remind us that our shop was losing money and not meeting the profit amount that a business should be making to survive. He would even use it as a threat to scare us, saying that he would have to start cutting hours, and he might even have to let some of us go. However, most of us were used to these kinds of empty threats. We knew not to take him too seriously. Heck, it was even unlikely that he would ever get his own hands dirty and actually help us on a closing shift. I usually had a coworker with me until about an hour before closing, something that I was always really grateful for. That changed after minimum wage went up. My boss figured he'd save the money he was losing by cutting everyone's hours. So instead of working with someone until 8 p.m., I would be alone from 6 p.m. until we closed at 10 p.m. This change worried both my mother and boyfriend at the time. They didn't really like the thought of me being left alone for that long. I was a young woman. I've always been sort of petite and short. I wasn't too thrilled about it either, but what could I do? I needed that job. 
I dreaded the following weekend when the new schedule would be in effect. On Friday, my boyfriend agreed to stay with me until we closed, but on Saturday he couldn't, and so I begrudgingly made my way to work at 3 p.m. that day. I had a coworker with me until 6 p.m., and they clocked out and left. I was left all alone then for the closing shift, hoping that I'd be lucky and it would be a slow night. For a while there, I thought I did have luck on my side. Not a lot of people were coming in, except for a few regulars at the end of what would usually be the dinner rush, which was nothing I couldn't handle. With the spare time I had, I began cleaning up things early, as I knew it would take a lot longer to get everything done without someone else there to help me. I would bring many empty containers to the back room to wash them, returning to the front whenever I'd hear the bell above the door go off, signaling that a customer had just walked in. This went on for a couple of hours, and I hated every moment of it. At one point, I was in the back, trying to finish washing some dishes, when I heard the bell above the door go off. I glanced at the clock. We would be closing in just half an hour, so this was the point in my shift when I truly despised getting any customers. I finished rinsing the bowl I was washing, then reached for a paper towel, walking to the front to greet the unwanted customer. Much to my surprise, there was no one there. I didn't see any cars out front either. I did a quick look around the shop before returning to the back. Whoever it was, maybe they just decided they didn't want anything. Not that I really minded. A couple of minutes passed, and I heard the bell above the door go off again. I briskly walked to the front, expecting a customer to be standing there looking at the menu. But when I got there, there was no one at the counter, no one reading the menu. But what I did see this time was a dirty, homeless-looking man. He sat at the far end of the shop at the back table, from what I could see of him, he had scraggly hair and mud all over his pants and shoes, which he had now tracked inside all over the floor, which I had just cleaned. I was a bit annoyed at this, now knowing that I would have to re-mop the floors. I approached him with caution. Despite my irritation, I greeted the man. Hello, sir. Are you waiting on someone or wanting a minute to look over the menu? He kept looking back and forth from wall to wall and occasionally out the window, ignoring me entirely. He almost appeared disoriented, but he would pull his phone out of his pocket to look at it every now and then. I repeated myself, but once more he didn't respond to my question. My irritation was steadily growing. I waited for a response and got none. He just kept looking everywhere and anywhere but towards me. With an exasperated sigh, I walked to the back room and began to prepare the mop bucket, filling it with water and cleaner. This probably only took about five minutes. Once it was ready, I wheeled it toward the front and quickly noticed that the man was no longer there. Now, he couldn't have left the store because I would have heard the bell on the door go off if the door had been opened. I grabbed my mop and looked toward the ground, where I then noticed the set of muddy footprints leading toward the bathroom door. Great, I thought. Now I'd have to mop the bathroom again, too. I sighed and began mopping the trail leading toward the table where the man had sat, then all the way toward the bathrooms. As I finished cleaning the floor directly in front of the door, I heard the faint, muffled cries of someone on the other side. It almost sounded like sobbing. I leaned in until my ear was almost against the door itself and listened closely. I could hear this man's quiet sobs and muffled mumbling, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. What on earth was going on in there? I knocked lightly on the door, then said, Uh, sir, is everything all right in there? I was surprised then by the sound of the door being unlocked. Immediately, I jumped away with my mop in hand. I was a good couple of feet away when he opened the door. The man emerged and stood there for a couple of moments, and he finally saw me standing there. 
he looked me straight in the eyes, and this sent a chill down my spine. I held on to that mop, nervously, almost defensively. His stare was blank, emotionless, and yet somehow sorrowful. He didn't say anything. Instead, he briskly walked out the front entrance, setting off the bell. I turned, and I saw him make his way down the road, not once looking back. Just my luck, I thought, that one of the frequent loafers from the liquor store next door would come in on a night I had to work alone. Even though it still didn't shake my anxiety, I took a deep breath, loosening my grip on the mop and looking back toward the bathroom door. I reached for the handle and slowly opened the door, quickly peering around inside before actually entering. Inside, I found a muddy mess all over the floor, as though the man had been pacing in circles in the bathroom. I quickly mopped it up and turned to leave, when I noticed the trash can lid was on the ground beside it. I reached for it, bending over the trash can itself in order to retrieve it, when I happened to notice something shining inside. I reached in and retrieved an opened switchblade. It felt as if my whole body had been drenched in cold water. The sudden realization of what this was and what that man could have done to me hit me faster than a bolt of lightning. All his strange behavior. There were no other things in that trash can and I knew that couldn't have been there from before because I had previously cleaned both bathrooms and gathered the trash a little over an hour ago. Shaking, I closed up early that night. I didn't finish washing the dishes, and I didn't bother sweeping or mopping the back room. I just locked the door, put the food away, counted my drawer, and left. I quit the next day. I told my mom about what happened, and she called the police. I gave them my description of the guy as well as the knife, but no identification was ever made. My mom still freaks out about it, although now I'm a grown woman with a family of my own. I don't go out alone as often as I did back then, and I still feel a bit nervous every day. I wonder about that man sometimes, but in all honesty, I don't think I want to know what his plans were before he apparently changed his mind. I'd rather label him in my mind as just plain crazy, and I hope he was given or found the help that he needed. One thing I do know is that when my daughter becomes of age, I'll never let her work a closing shift like I had to for her own protection. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission show. If you've had a terrifying encounter at work, send us your story at eeriecast.com slash submit so I can narrate it. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? I've only ever had to call the cops once while working at Dead and Roasted, and that was just because the rog mites were back and attacking guests who used the bathroom. Those buggers love to crawl up from the sewer and bite into a cheek or two. I mean, who doesn't? Anyway, today's stories feature a police encounter with something far more disturbing. As fans of true crime like to say, sometimes people are the scariest monsters of all. These are Tales from the Break Room. Something wanted my attention. From M. R. Akinosforo. I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm actually an annoyingly skeptical person. Generally, when paranormal things happen, my brain just jumps to the closest rational explanation. Usually, it's my paranoia of people, who, if you ask me, are way scarier usually than ghosts. So, I used to work at a Walmart overnight as a stalker. When the plague started, we closed at 8 p.m. and opened at 9 a.m., leaving a very small crew to stalk from 10 to 6. Now, at this point, I'd already had several weird experiences but nothing I couldn't just chalk up to a customer back when we were open 24 hours. Except for the ghost birds, I'll get to that in a second. 
This particular night, however, there's just no explanation for. It was already a really hectic night, with a skeleton crew of five to stock, zone, and overstock all the dry grocery, frozen, and dairy. Sometimes when you're on the ladders in this particular store, and on certain aisles, you'll see something small and white fly by at about eye level, which would put your eye level at about seven feet off the ground. This would only occur at about six feet, and it only seemed to happen in the wine, chips, and paper aisles, never anywhere else. We jokingly referred to them as the Walmart ghost birds because they were about the size of a pigeon and acted like they were dive bombing you. That night, I was putting extra peanut butter on top of the shelf, and I saw one of these ghost birds twice. By that point, though, I had just accepted it. They were never close enough to really bother me, but the whole atmosphere felt different from the time I pulled into the parking lot. It was just this awful, sinking feeling. Around 1.30 that morning, right before my break, I went off to the bathroom. This bathroom had three stalls with a heavy door, and at the time I was the only female in the building. So when the door opened and I saw white high heels and the bottom of a white pencil skirt walk to the accessible stall, my first thought was someone had come in through the front door. It was shut off but not locked, and we'd had issues for weeks of people just ignoring that we were closed, trying to get inside. Usually, there was someone on the water aisle to stop them, but because there were only five of us that night, including the manager, we were going to all tag team it when everything else was done. That meant no one would be in sight of the door for several more hours. I heard the footsteps, I saw the door open, and I heard the stall door close. I quickly went out to confront her, but I couldn't see feet anymore. First, I knocked on the stall door, informing anyone that we were closed. Then I bent down a little to see if I could see the heels, but there was nothing. At that point, I was kind of scared that she was trying to rob us. Maybe she was standing on the toilet to avoid detection. But when I went to try the door, it was unlocked. I felt a weird sense of relief that there wasn't another person I was going to have to confront but also freaked out that there was definitely not a living person in that bathroom besides myself, despite what I just encountered. There was only one way in and out, and the whole thing had lasted maybe 30 seconds. She had definitely not come back out. Now, I do occasionally listen to true crime, so I did a thorough search of the bathroom, short of climbing onto the toilet to check the vents, because they're standard American cubicle stalls, and I would have seen her do that. There was no one else in there. That really creeped me out, and the entire time I was washing my hands, I felt as if someone was angrily staring at me. So in a hurry, I left and went back to work. I know this sounds like a really nonchalant reaction, but I've had enough paranormal encounters that, for the most part, I just try to ignore them when I determine that there's no other explanation for them. Whoever or whatever this was was not having it, because as I was now stalking cereal, I had just opened a box and was standing perfectly still looking for the barcode, when suddenly I felt fingers grab the hair behind my ear brush my ear and yank so hard it pulled my head to the left. I really didn't know what to think at that point because the rational side of my brain said it was just my coworker screwing with me. But I had not seen nor heard anything. And as fast as I turned, there should have been someone there. They wouldn't have time to hide. Not to mention, while I had a good working relationship with most of the guys at the time, I just couldn't see them doing something so invasive as a prank. I decided to go ahead and go to lunch. It was already 1.52 a.m. So I went out to my car like I did every night. It was a well-ish lit parking lot, and I always parked as close to the door as I could. So I double-checked the back seat, 
I got in my car, locked the doors, leaned my seat back, and began scrolling through YouTube to find something to listen to. I was really trying to forget about that creepy and painful nonsense, so I was looking for something funny, lighthearted. But I still just had this overwhelming sensation of being watched. Usually, ignoring this feeling will eventually make it go away. I had mixed thoughts, like whoever this is just needs to go away, and what if there's a creep in the bushes and I just didn't see them on my way out? It was a closed Walmart at 2am after all, prime real estate for creeps, especially in a college area. Most of my break went by outright forcing myself to pay attention to anything other than the creepy feeling, while seeing what I thought was raccoons or something darting behind my car in the mirror every few minutes. Then, for a split second, I saw this tall shadow walk up to my car and disappear behind it. That's when I felt something blow in my ear. It was like someone had leaned up between the seats and blown in my ear like they were trying to get a bug off. I could even feel hot breath moving my hair. Rational me went into fight mode. I grabbed my box cutter and turned around, ready to cut someone. But my back seat was empty. It was probably stupid of me, but now I wasn't sure if it was a ghost or a person, so I got out of my car and opened every single door. No one. I even looked for spider webs. I checked the seat belts. There was nothing even on that side. So I closed up my car, locked it, and on the way back to the door, I saw a shadow walk into the middle of the street, about 10 feet away, and just disappear. This shadow figure was about 5 foot 9 and very thin. I stared at it for about 5 seconds before it had disappeared, trying to figure out if I was seeing a person with clothes similar enough to the pavement to make them look transparent, or if they were actually just a walking shadow. Then, like that, it was just gone, like it blinked right out of existence. But as it disappeared, so did my anxiety and that feeling of being watched. I didn't have a problem for the rest of the night. Now, here's the kicker. A few days later, I went back in for work, and there was a memorial on the break room table for a previous co-worker who had just recently died. I can't say for sure if it was that co-worker's ghost, and if it was, why would they do those things? But it was one of the weirdest coincidences of my life. It was also extremely uncomfortable, because it's the first and so far only time I've had something mess with my hair. It's creepy enough when actual dudes blow on your ear, but it's so much worse when there's no physical person there to slap. The Paint Contractor From Cherylay H In 2002 through 2004, I worked as a decorative product specialist at a paint store chain. My job was to work with clients in the store, at their home or job site, in an interior design capacity. Essentially, I helped with choosing paint colors, wall coverings, and the like. It was a brand new store and there were only three employees. The general manager Jimmy, the assistant manager Joel, and me. That being the case, plus me having to work around my college classes, meant that I worked a lot of evening and weekend shifts alone. The majority of paint business sales come from contractors. We worked hard to establish relationships with them. With it being a new store, we put up with more than we should have for the sake of getting and keeping more of those contractor sales. While my bosses dealt more with their low bids, I dealt with their lowbrow humor. It is a male-dominated environment to be sure, and quite a few found my presence a real novelty. Nowadays, the kind of things I endured would never be tolerated, thank God. There was one particular contractor who tested all of our patients. I'll call him Frank. Frank was around 50, 6 feet tall, 
and built like the farmer he'd been most of his life. He worked on his own, and it didn't take long to understand why. He was extremely sexist, demanding, and rude. After the first month or so of coming in, he began to make inappropriate comments to my coworkers about me. Then he began to do it directly to me. Over the course of a year, his unwanted attention increased in intensity. One day I was ringing up a customer when Frank came in. As I turned to fulfill the order, he nudged the guy and said, Look at that rear, best in town. The customer didn't know how to respond. He looked shocked. Come on, isn't it great? You know it is. Frank continued to goad him. I was annoyed and the customer looked mortified. This kind of thing became a regular occurrence. My boss has called him out on this multiple times. Then things turned up another notch. One day I was crouched down, refilling a wallpaper display. Jimmy was at the counter with a customer, Joel was mixing paint, and another customer or two were in the store browsing. There was a main front door and a small side door most of the contractors used. For whatever reason, Frank decided to come in through the front that day. Being crouched down behind the display like I was, I didn't think that he could see me. I decided to stay there a moment, hoping to avoid him. Now I wonder if he had been watching me from outside. Barely two feet in the door and forty feet from the counter, Frank loudly exclaimed, Jimmy, there's one reason I come to this store. Everybody turned. I saw Jimmy visibly tense up. Ever the diplomatic manager, he forced a smile through clenched teeth, bracing himself. And what is that, Frank? He replied. A little color raced into his face as he straightened his spine. Her. At this, Frank pointed straight at me. She's the hottest piece in this town. I felt all the color drain from my face. This was different than his prior rudeness. He was becoming bolder. It didn't matter that there were so many people around. In fact, he was either feeding off of the audience, or our discomfort, or maybe both. Frank, that's enough. We're happy to work with you, but that kind of behavior is not appropriate. Let's keep things professional here. Jimmy was struggling with how strong he needed to be for his words to be effective, while not giving the wrong impression to everyone else in the store. For the next bit, you need a little context concerning the layout of the store. The front two-thirds of the store was the main selling floor. Then there was the main counter with an office to the right. A four-foot-tall wall behind the counter separated it from the mixing area, and the mixing area was about 12 by 20 feet or more. Doors on either side of the back wall of the mixing area led to the warehouse. There was a good bit of space around the short wall and the main counter, so we could travel easily to and from the warehouse. Depending on the size of the order, we would stage contractor orders either in the mixing area near the office or inside the warehouse. Knowing this, most contractors came in the side door that was near the office, directly in line with the main counter. Anyway, a couple of days after the yelling and pointing incident, Frank began standing in the mixing area just past the office when he came in. He wasn't technically behind the counter, but he was past it, if you know what I mean. It was an intentional push against the boundaries. When Jimmy saw Frank's truck pull up outside the side door one day, he turned to me, quickly saying, Go to the warehouse. I understood immediately. This became the plan any time we saw Frank pull up. I'd run to the back and find something to do until he left. But Frank wasn't stupid. It went from, Where is she? To, I know she's here. And then to, I saw her car outside, I know she's in here. That last one he said one day as he walked straight past the guys and into the warehouse in search of me, like I was prey. There you are, what are you doing? Trying to hide from me or something? He tried to laugh it off as a joke. No one joined him in laughing. Jimmy, his wonderful linebacker-sized self, came to stand in front of me. He herded Frank out of the warehouse saying that it was off limits, and so was I, period. He said that he needed to leave me alone. 
I so wished that had been the end of it. Just days later, I was closing the store alone on a Friday night. Earlier in the day, Jimmy had mixed an order for Frank, leaving it in the mixing area. Frank had said he needed it first thing Saturday morning. Of course, he decided to pick it up five minutes before closing that night, when I was alone. My stomach clenched when I saw him come in. Before I could get to the counter, he followed me to the stack of cans, you know, so he could look over the order. I became very aware of the situation, our size difference, his intimidating body language, the fact I was alone, the fact that no other customers would be coming in since we were now supposed to be closed. Uh, this isn't what I ordered. I specifically told Jimmy that this isn't what I wanted. He was raising his voice and standing way too close to me. I tried calming him down as I backed away. Let me give him a call and see if we can sort it out. I couldn't dial the number fast enough, but it went to voicemail. Uh, Jimmy, it's me. Frank is here and says that this isn't what he ordered. He's very upset. Please call as soon as you get this. With every word, I tried to convey the situation. I dialed again. Voicemail. I hung up. Uh, let me check what we have in the computer. Maybe he made a mistake, I said, using the opportunity to get away from Frank. Yeah, it's a mistake. You'd better check it out. He was coming behind the main counter now. Fear washed over me. I dialed again and no response once more. Why had we abused calling Jimmy's cell with stupid questions in the past? Jimmy, pick up, I thought. I could just imagine Jimmy sitting at the dinner table rolling his eyes. He was intentionally not answering because he wanted me to figure out whatever it was on my own so he could eat in peace. I dialed again. No answer. Frank kept up his diatribe. I looked at the computer. Well, uh, Frank, this looks like it matches what he made up for you. You calling me a liar? He was literally yelling now. There was no reason for this. The man looked possessed, an expression of pure rage covering his face. Dial, no answer, hang up, dial again. At that point, Frank leaned over me, arms raised in protest, yelling in my face. I don't even remember what he was saying. Full on terror had me ready to dial 911. Then the phone rang in my hand. Thank God. Our standard greeting was barely out of my mouth when Jimmy cut in. Cherylee, are you okay? No, Frank is wanting his order for the morning, and it isn't what he was expecting. Jimmy, get the point. Oh, I understand you. I'm already heading to the car. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Jimmy knew that the situation must be serious. At that point, he would beat the police even if I called them. How could I speak in code to them while making Frank think I was talking to Jimmy anyway, or at least well enough to get them there quicker than he could now? Stay on the phone with me, he insisted. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking, I said. Tell him I want this fixed or I'm never coming back in here. What's he saying? I want to know how he's going to fix this. Frank jabbed a finger towards my shoulder, though he clearly had aimed for my chest. I turned away into the phone at the last second. I had expected him to back down purely by me having a witness on the phone. This was disconcerting. Cherylee, are you safe? Jimmy asked. He could tell that Frank was irate, or at least pretending to be. We both knew the situation did not call for this level of hostility. Frank had come in with the intention of messing with me, but I wasn't sure how far he planned to go. I don't know if he did either. But I had an idea. Oh, so you're on your way? I said out loud. I wanted Frank to know that the cavalry was on the way. Frank paused his rant. I continued. Yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Frank's very upset. He says he won't be coming back if this isn't fixed. I was only conveying Frank's message to buy a few more seconds. It was unnecessary since I knew that Jimmy could hear him. In my ear, Jimmy asked, Do you want me to call the police? I'm in the car, but not at the exit yet. Frank interjected, That's right, he better fix this. 
First he treats me like I'm some sort of criminal the other day, then you're calling me a liar. What kind of customer service is this? Frank had slightly calmed down. Slightly. Cherilet, tell him to take the order and I'll drive the other can out myself to him in the morning. Just get him out of the store. Okay, Frank, Jimmy says that you can take this order as it is and he'll personally bring the correct can to your job site in the morning. I said as conciliatorily as possible. I looked him straight in the eye and I said it like, this is your only option, get it and get out. Jimmy will be here in just a minute. You can wait for him to arrive or let him bring it to you tomorrow. He suddenly changed his tune. Ugh, I don't have time to wait around here all night. You tell him to make sure he's out there by 7.30 or I'm telling everyone what a joke this place is. He quickly backed towards the door. You tell him he could just bring all the rest of this out for my trouble. And he was pulling out of the parking lot seconds later. My heart still pounded, but I could breathe a little easier. I heard that. Let me know when he's gone. Jimmy said with the same obvious relief. He's gone. I saw him leave the parking lot. Okay, do you still want me to come out? If not, I'm coming up on a spot where I can loop back around. No, go on home. I think that he got scared off, particularly since he didn't even take the order he was ranting and raving about. Thanks, though, seriously. I was praying so hard that you would answer the phone. I said sincerely. I'm glad you knew you could call. When you kept blowing up my phone, it dawned on me there was only one reason you'd do that especially since I just told you and Joel to stop calling me so often when I'm off. I could hear the wry grin in his voice. Yeah, sorry about that. I figured you were intentionally not answering your phone for that reason. Thank God you understood. I'm fine now, but I was really scared, Jimmy. I've never seen him like that before. I know. I shouldn't have let it get this far, trust me. I'll be having a conversation with him in the morning. You won't be hearing from him again. Several months later, I was about to get married and move out of state. My last day there, I worked and closed alone. As I was sweeping the floor for the last time, I heard the side door chime. I stopped cold. It was Frank. He stood just inside the door, not moving. We just looked at one another for a moment. He seemed different contrite, a little softer, like the rigidity of that intimidating body language he'd used before, was gone. I waited. So I heard you're leaving. He started tentatively. I simply nodded. He nodded in return, shuffling his feet and nervously handling the keys in his pocket. After a couple of false starts, he found his words. My sister told me that the way I've been acting hasn't been very Christian-like. I don't know what I expected to hear, but that sure wasn't it. He went on. She said I shouldn't be saying things to you like I have, that people wouldn't know I'm a Christian by the way I acted. He looked at the floor, clearly humbled. Her saying that really bothered me. I don't want to give God a bad name. I wouldn't like it if someone thought poorly of him because I said I was a Christian but did bad things. I was stunned. So I wanted to come in and apologize to you for anything I've said or done that might have offended you. I don't expect you to forgive me, but I hope you will. At this he looked up. Can you forgive me? I'm really sorry. I was silent a few seconds, still reeling and trying to wrap my mind around what he'd said. I, yeah, I, I forgive you. And I did. He seemed obviously repentant. There was too much change for this not to be a genuine apology. I watched the tension leave his body as he sighed and his shoulders let down. He seemed to be as surprised as I was when tears of relief sprang in his eyes. I don't think that he actually expected me to forgive him, or maybe how much he needed to hear me say it. He nodded in gratitude, then quickly cleared his throat, saying, <clears throat> Well, that's all I wanted to say. Congrats on getting married. I hope things work out for you. I replied, Thank you. As he backed out of the door, that was the last time I saw him. For months, Frank had terrorized me. He'd annoyed, offended, harassed, and then scared me. He had made me feel helpless. 
I always thought if I'm not safe in a very public location with bright lights and the potential for customers at any moment, where am I safe? At times, he had tried to make me feel like the stupid woman only good for looking at, trying to work where only men should. I'll never go about life as oblivious to my surroundings as I did before working there. I've used this experience as a cautionary tale with my daughter and other women. That time period was scary and had left me feeling vulnerable and angry. Bitterness could have easily settled in. However, that afternoon, everything changed. I let it go. I forgave him. For real. I'll never forget, but I have forgiven. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence and harm against children. I have seen the face of evil. From Michigan Deputy. I work as a sheriff's office deputy in Michigan. At the time these stories took place, I was working for a department near central Michigan. To protect the families and victims of these stories, I will not disclose the exact area this occurred. I've been a deputy for five years. In that time, I've responded to every type of call possible, from noise complaints to triple homicides. I worked for an urban department that borders one of Michigan's largest cities. I use the past tense here because I recently moved to another sheriff's department in a different area of the state. Naturally, I've encountered all kinds of people. I expected this, as the basis of police work is talking to new people every day, gathering information on them, as well as the situation that caused them to call for police services. The changes day to day keep me on my toes and are one of the aspects of this job I enjoy the most. But I never thought I would encounter someone that truly struck me as evil. To make this story make sense and help you understand my perspective on it, I need to give some background info about myself. I was raised in a very religious household. My parents made my sisters and I attend church every Sunday, attend Bible school before or after the service, enrolled us in vacation Bible schools over the summer, paid for us to go to Christian summer camps, etc. The older I've gotten, I've struggled with organized religion and a lot of the shame and guilt doctrines that were drilled into me as a kid. I'm still generally spiritual. I believe God exists, as I do with angels, demons, the devil, and so forth. But I do not attend church currently, and I don't subscribe to any specific religion. I know evil exists in this world, but I always thought it existed in the acts people do, the poor choices people make occasionally, and that at heart, everyone has good in them. Two calls for service in 2019 and 2021 changed the way I see people permanently. The first call was in the late fall of 2019. My partners and I got dispatched to a shots fired call at a local dive motel. Dispatch had gotten reports of a shooting in the parking lot, with one victim lying face down in the middle of the lot. The shooter was running back towards their room. We arrived on scene, located the victim, secured a perimeter, and began to render aid to the victim. I always carry lots of medical gear in my car, and I was therefore tasked with basic patient care until EMS arrived. I rolled the victim over onto his back, and for the first time, I saw the life leave someone's body. I saw his chest decompress, heard what sounded like his final breath leave his body, and I watched as the light behind his eyes dimmed away as I attempted to locate where he was shot. Unfortunately, there was nothing I nor EMS could do to save this man's life. I learned later that the bullet had entered on the bottom right side of his ribcage and traveled upward at a 45 degree angle, piercing right through his heart. After EMS tended to the victim, my sergeant tasked me and one of my partners to go to the suspect's room, which we had ascertained from witnesses on the scene. We got to the room and opened the door that was already ajar. Standing in the middle of the room was the suspect with his wife and three children. The suspect had his hands up with a cold, calm, emotionless look on his face. His wife and children were crying hysterically. We ordered the suspect to point to where the gun was, 
and he pointed to it, lying right in the middle of the room, completely unsecured. He hadn't even tried to hide the gun, never made a move like he was going to try to escape being taken into custody. At this point in my career, at the time of the case, I never had someone accused of such a heinous crime be so cooperative. The suspect was taken into custody without issue and transported to our department headquarters for lodging at the jail and interviews with the detectives. After all the work for the case was completed a few days later, I watched the tape of the detectives interviewing the suspect. He admitted to everything, not hiding a single detail. And the whole time he talked in a calm, smooth, controlled voice, like he wasn't actually present in his own body as he explained what he did to kill this man. The entire time the detectives interacted with him, the suspect gave off a weird energy that spooked me a little bit. I could tell he had no remorse for what he'd done. It was like he didn't care about another human in the slightest. This second call for service happened in 2021. It started as a slow night. I was sitting at one of my normal traffic points, watching for any good stops. Suddenly, my radio crackled to life, and two of my partners got sent to a call of a completed suicide. The initial report was that the wife came home to find her husband dead in their bedroom. Seeing as it was a slow night, and these kinds of calls usually take a while, I decided to start heading that way to help my partners get done more quickly. As I began driving, dispatch gave out more information, which deeply disturbed me. They were changing the nature of the call to a murder-suicide. The caller had now reported that her two children, ages four and six, were dead along with her husband inside the home. Everyone available in my department began responding to the scene now. When I arrived, I was the second one there. As I put the cruiser in park, I could see my partner running across the front lawn into the home to get to the children. As I ran across the lawn as well, medical bag in hand, the same partner came running out of the house with the limp body of a six-year-old boy in his arms. We locked eyes and he shouted, he's still breathing. We began tending to the little boy as more officers and EMS arrived on scene. Seeing more people were going to come help, I left my partner on the lawn and retrieved the female caller who was identified as the stepmother to the children and wife to the deceased male inside. Initially, when I pulled her aside to make sure she didn't re-enter the house and crime scene, she was crying. But I didn't see any tears. She was trying to scream like she was in pain, but it seemed like she was acting. Her emotions didn't seem right. They looked rehearsed, scripted, embellished, like she wanted me to believe she was hurting when she really wasn't. I escorted her to a chair on the porch so we could keep an eye on her while tending to the victims and getting the scene secured. My sergeant tasked me with another job, so I went inside the house for a little bit. When I came back outside, I saw the female was not in the chair I'd set her in. I asked one of the other deputies where she was and no one seemed to know. After a couple of minutes, we found her sitting in her recliner inside the residence. The angle at which I entered the room she was in allowed me to see what she was doing on her phone. She was on Facebook, commenting on one of her friend's posts about a recent vacation. I stopped for a second and listened. This woman was calm. I did not hear any heavy breathing, any sniffling, like would normally occur after crying. She wasn't showing any kind of behavior, indicating she was grieving or worried about her family. She wasn't calling her parents. She wasn't calling loved ones to tell them what happened, to ask for support. She was completely unbothered. Through the course of the night, I had several more encounters with her, and every time she seemed to lack emotion. Her effect was the same as the man from the homicide I described in the first story completely emotionless. And as the case was further investigated, I was informed by the lead detective that she was most likely the killer. 
Evidence was found in the house indicating her marriage was troubled and journal entries detailing how she wanted out of her marriage so she could move to Texas and start a life with the woman she was having an affair with were found. As of writing this, the case is not officially closed, but all evidence currently points to the female killing her own family. To this day, I believe I encountered two people who were the closest things to real life demons I've ever seen. I've seen the worst of people's behavior in my career so far, but these two calls stand out as a league of their own. Even a man raging drunk with some sort of other substance in his system that just assaulted his family was nowhere near as terrifying as these two homicide suspects. These two people did not even seem human to me. They had human form, human appearance, and were in all likelihood human genetically. But what they did, how they acted, so cold and detached and unapologetic. That was all anything but human. I still believe everyone has good in them, but now I also believe everyone has some evil in them too. Some have more evil than others. Stay safe out there. In this theater, you're never alone. From Hunter D., about 15 years ago, I started working at a small auditorium slash theater outside Detroit. It was a newer space at the time, so when me and my two friends were offered the opportunity to work there, we jumped at it. I'll refer to my friends as Johnny and Rick. It was a smaller space requiring minimal staffing, so for a long time the three of us were the only operational staff most days, management would not be on site, so it was usually just the three of us, or some combination of a lower quantity. There were rumors that during construction, a worker had struck his head and fallen into the orchestra pit, where he passed away. Most people, myself included, laughed this off as ridiculous, but that rumor never died. One summer, we were scheduled to work a dance recital. We all showed up at 8 a.m. and quickly realized the client was not due to arrive until 10 a.m., not quite enough time to return home for a nap. We'd all worked the rehearsal the evening before, and the call time must have been lost in translation. Realizing we had time on our hands with nothing to do, my counterparts seized the opportunity for an impromptu breakfast, but I stayed back to perform some sound checks. So off they went, and here I was in the theater, with only myself, my thoughts, and music. As I was sitting at the soundboard, running through the day's playlist, something caught my eye. All the inputs from our orchestra pit were receiving some kind of input, or interference, as shown on the VU meters, which are small lights that indicate when a channel is receiving a signal. Now, one or two channels receiving a signal or interference would not be out of the ordinary, but for all 12 channels in this one room to be acting up was very strange. My immediate thought was that Johnny or Rick must have left microphones down there, and they must have been picking up my sound checks. For those who are not familiar, an orchestra pit is a room in a theater, typically located beneath or in front of the stage, where the musicians are located during a musical production. Our orchestra pit was a concrete room beneath the stage with acoustically reflective panels. It was about 15 feet deep, stretching the width of the stage and lay 10 feet below the stage floor. The ceiling of the pit, further referred to as the cover, was modular and could be removed as needed to allow the music to fill the hall but was kept installed at other times to increase the usable area of the stage, preventing people from accidentally falling in. At the time of these events, the cover was installed, meaning I was headed for a long, dark room. When I stepped into the pit, the lights would not turn on, which wasn't uncommon as we needed seemingly endless maintenance on our lighting system. So I pulled out my flashlight and I began examining every place a microphone could be plugged in. To my horror, 
I found that not only were there no microphones or equipment present of any kind, but the room was completely silent, despite my having left the soundcheck music playing to keep my nerves calm. I quickly made my way back upstairs to the soundboard, where the music was still playing and the VU meters for the pit channels had gone dark. I didn't move from there until my colleagues returned. Later that night after the event ended, I recounted what happened to my two colleagues, who did not seem surprised at all. They then told me of the events they'd experienced the night before. Every night while locking up, it had become something of a joke before turning off the lights to yell, is there anyone in here? Then pausing a moment for a response, which there never was, before yelling, I'm turning out the lights, don't get hurt, and then turning the lights off, locking the remaining doors and leaving for the day. So they tell me after the rehearsal the night before, I'd left, but they stayed on site for about another hour, completing odds and ends tasks in preparation for the performance the next day. When they were ready to leave, they went through their normal process, walking through all the backstage and auxiliary rooms, making sure no one was present, shutting off lights, locking doors, etc. They arrived on the stage for the final step, the call-out of, Is anybody in here? They did so and waited a moment, expecting the usual silence. That's when they heard a door close at the back. They called out, uh, custodial? To no response. Who's out there? They yelled, again to no response. Being the brave souls they are, they headed toward the area from which they believed the sound had come from. When they arrived, Rick noted that he'd checked this door on their walk through, and that the door was locked from both sides as it had been minutes earlier. Convinced it was just the sound of the building settling, or their minds playing tricks on them, they began heading back to the stage to finish their lockup, when there came the sound of another loud door slamming. This time, it came from a door only 30 feet away from them, at the top of a staircase which led down to the pit. They pulled out their flashlights, aiming them at the door, only to see the handle turning on its own. They immediately gave chase, expecting to find some kids from the show who might have hidden to have some fun after everyone left. The handle continued to move the entire time they ran towards that door. When they reached for the handle, the movement stopped. They threw the door open, preparing to confront whoever was on the other side, but to their shock, that stairwell was empty. Then there came the sound of yet another door slamming shut, this time at the bottom of that stairwell, which would be the door leading into the orchestra pit. Between the door that Johnny and Rick had just entered and the door that had just shut were five flights of stairs. Short flights, but five flights no less. It was certainly too far for someone to have traveled in what seemed like only a moment, I recall them explaining. They both bolted down the stairs with no more than their flashlights to guide them. The door they'd just entered was an emergency exit door, which didn't lock. But the pit was considered a secure area, and as such, could be locked from the outside. When they reached the door, Johnny reached for his keys, knowing he had locked the door minutes ago. But then Rick noticed the door was slightly ajar now. He reached for the handle instead, noting that he was able to pull the door open, but that the handle did not turn when he placed his hand on it, indicating that it was in fact locked. The two of them then heard what sounded like running towards the opposite end of the orchestra pit before they heard the sound of the door at the other end opening and slamming shut. Again, they gave chase. They threw open the door just in time to witness the door to a small mechanical room close. This is it, they thought, as they took a moment to pause and mentally prepare themselves, knowing this door was the only way in or out of that small room. Not knowing what to expect after their chase, Johnny pulled out his utility knife as a precaution. When they felt they'd mustered up as much courage as they could, they swung the door open and scanned the room with their flashlights. The room was empty, 
save for the equipment. Rick stood watch at the door while Johnny walked in, searching behind every piece of equipment, flashlight in one hand, utility knife in the other. Once Johnny was convinced, he had thoroughly searched that room. The two hastily and shakily retraced their steps, relocking the doors and shutting off the lights. The two of them were out of breath and at a loss for words, only later questioning if they'd really seen and heard what they thought they did. They told me they neglected the, is anybody in here, call out this time, opting to just shut off the lights, lock the final doors, and make their exit as quickly as possible. Apparently, they were still questioning what had happened and thinking I would laugh at them, so they decided not to share their story with me that morning before leaving for breakfast. But upon hearing my story, they felt obligated to share theirs from the night before. As I'm sure you can imagine, our walkthrough that night was performed as quickly as possible, and as a team. Another strange occurrence happened only a few weeks later in the middle of a show. There was a comical scene in the show where the main character was supposed to have been shot out of a cannon to land in a different scene, and to portray this, a dummy would be dropped from the catwalks into the pit only for the main character to emerge and lean over the edge to show that he'd made it and was alive. On the night in question, the scene played out exactly according to plan. However, during our briefing that evening, it was noted that the door to the catwalks was locked, and the crew member who was supposed to have thrown the dummy was never able to access the area. At the time, no one else was up there. No one could have accessed it. So, to this day... We don't know who or what threw the dummy for the performance. Following these events, we would have the occasional oddities, like misplaced items turning up in wholly unexpected locations, strange sounds and shadows, etc. But nothing as major as our first few experiences with the unknown. Burger King Encounter From Anonymous I worked at Burger King when I was in college. The assistant manager had just quit and I'd only been working for about a month when the general manager offered me the position. My shifts were weekend mornings and three closing shifts during the week. My friend Corey, who had gotten me hired, was the other assistant manager and was the one who trained me. It was towards the end of the third night of my job shadowing him we were done with our duties and setting the alarm when he said, Make sure when you leave the building at night, don't come back in. They don't like that. My friend and I always joked around, so I didn't take him seriously. Everything was normal for about three months after that. Many employees didn't like me too much because I'd gotten the position quickly, and in my attempt for them to accept me, I often helped them complete their closing duties, which often led to me being left alone counting the till. Until this point, the only thing that worried me was getting jumped on the way to my car, since we had to take the day's deposit to the bank drop box every night. There's a wooded area between the Burger King and the highway where many homeless people sleep, and getting robbed was one of my worst fears. One weekend, Corey asked if we could switch shifts for that Saturday. He wanted to go to a concert, so he offered to work the morning shift if I would go to the night shift. I normally would have said no, but that night we had a lot of staff scheduled, so I figured I wouldn't work much, so I agreed to switch shifts. The night was pretty slow. I even sent one of the cashiers home once most of the cleaning had been done. The way the manager's office is set up makes me stand with my back to the door of the office. I was there counting money when I felt a presence behind me. I assumed it was Sam, the cashier, that was seeing what I was doing. I saw on the security cameras a car approaching, and through the headset, I heard Sam greet them and start taking the order. I still felt as if someone was behind me, and I turned to tell Sam to go input in the computer so she wouldn't mess up the order. Except when I turned, there was nobody there. I then looked through the office window that has a view of the kitchen and drive through cashier. I saw that Sam was at the computer taking the order, and the two cooks were in the kitchen one cleaning and the other waiting for the order to pop up on the screen. I didn't think much of it, and I continued to work. 
There was a problem with the deposit, where I didn't have all the money the computer said I should have, so I started to recount everything to ensure I hadn't miscounted somewhere. I was about halfway down when everyone came to the office to say they were done and they were leaving. One of the cooks, named Mark, offered to stay with me until I was done since he knew I had to walk out with a good amount of money, but I declined and said I would be fine, so they left. I finished my work about 20 minutes later. It turns out the general manager had accidentally taken some money home in his pocket, so I would be depositing a smaller amount today. I turned the lights off in the office and walked out the back door. The back door locked by itself and was located right next to the drive through speaker. I got to my car and I remembered I'd forgotten to set the alarm. Dang it, I mumbled. I moved my car and parked it next to the drive through speaker. I grabbed the deposit bag and went back into the building. As soon as I entered, I felt a very different vibe from what I was used to. The air felt different. Everything was quiet. The alarm pin pad was located at the front, next to the cashiers, so I had to cross the back storage area and the kitchen to reach it. Once the pin was entered, you had about 15 seconds to get out of the building or the alarm would go off. I entered the code and began to run, and it was at that point I heard footsteps behind me, as if I was being chased. I bolted out the back door and closed it behind me. I had goosebumps, and I was a little shaken up. What the heck was that? I asked myself. I got into my car and I tried to convince myself that it was probably just the sound of my keys in my pocket that made me seem like there were footsteps behind me. I drove around the drive through lane, and when I got to the window, I looked inside. Instantly, I regretted it. As I passed the window, I saw a black human figure looking out of it. Against my better judgment, I circled around the front of the restaurant, and, from my car, tried to see if I saw anybody inside through the front windows of the restaurant. I saw nothing. But it was at this time that I remembered I hadn't checked the bathrooms after closing the lobby. This was part of my responsibilities, and sometimes the homeless would try to hide there to spend the night. I sat in my car, thinking about my options. I just wanted to go home, but I knew that if I just left and someone was in the restaurant, I would be fired. And I needed the job, as I had just bought a new car. Once again, I parked my car and went inside. I rushed to the front, where the cashiers were, and I turned off the alarm. Then I called out. Who's in here? Please, just come out. I promise I won't call the police. No response. I then made it to the bathrooms and checked the men's room, but I didn't find anybody. I then tried to check the women's room, but it was locked, but I did see that the light was on in there. It was a single occupant bathroom with motion lights so I was now convinced that that someone was in there. I knocked and I tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. All of a sudden, I felt a breeze and it sent a shiver down my spine. I'm a big guy and I'm not frightened easily, but at that moment, I got a horrible feeling, so I retreated back into my car. I tried calling the general manager, but he didn't answer. I then called Mark, hoping he wouldn't mind coming to help me get to the bottom of this. Mark answered, and to my surprise, it didn't take too much convincing for him to agree to come to help me. Mark arrived about 10 minutes later, still in his work clothes. It was close to 1am now, and he could see that he was not happy to be there. I had already explained what was happening to him over the phone, so when he showed up, we went straight in. On the way to the bathrooms, I grabbed a broom in case things got physical. I attempted to open the door with Mark behind me, ready in case anybody jumped out. I twisted the knob, and the door opened. We looked inside, but it was empty. I could see Mark was getting angry at me for wasting his time, but I convinced him to look at the camera footage. On the security camera system, I rewound it all the way back to the first time I entered to set the alarm. The cameras traced all my movements in the restaurant, even the part where I tried to open the bathroom door. Mark saw the confusion on my face as I saw the footage, and he softened up a little, saying, 
Hey kid, maybe the door was just stuck, and the shadow you saw was just some shadow that was cast by the nightlights. I thought maybe he was right, but I still asked him to come with me to set the alarm. We went out the back door again and made it to our cars. I thanked Mark for coming and said that I was sorry I made a big deal out of what appeared to be nothing. He told me not to worry and we both got in our cars when the restaurant's alarm system went off. The sirens were so loud and for a second, I just sat there hoping they would turn off by themselves. I did not want to go back in. I got out and Mark did the same. I asked him if we should go in and he said he wasn't sure, but maybe someone had been inside. The police station was right around the corner from the Burger King, so while Mark and I figured out what to do, a police car pulled into the parking lot, and an officer stepped out. He asked us what was going on, and I told him everything. I asked him to come inside with me and sweep the building just to be sure, and he agreed. We went inside. The three of us, Mark, the police officer, and I, turned the alarm off, the officer then checked the restaurant to make sure it was clear. He found nothing, but then suggested we look at the cameras to see if we could find out what set the alarm off. So we checked the cameras again, but saw nothing. I was half expecting to see someone running out the back door, as it's the only door you can open from the inside without a key. But again, there was nothing. I was so confused. What's going on? I asked myself. Regardless, the three of us headed out. On the way to my car, I asked the officer if he would mind escorting me to the bank to drop off the deposit bag at the drop-off chute. He agreed, and after that, I drove home. On my drive home, I was trying to come up with logical explanations for what had happened. I thought maybe someone wanted to get into the safe, or perhaps they were hoping that I would have left the deposit bag in the car while I went back inside to investigate what was going on. Maybe someone had been inside, and the cameras just glitched up and didn't capture them. I called in on Sunday saying I was sick and would not be able to go to work. Mark did the same. I talked with the general manager on Monday and told him what happened. He agreed that perhaps someone had tried to rob the place, and he said he would talk to the regional manager to change policies, so that the deposit drop-off would be the next morning and not at night. I then mentioned the events of the night to my friend Corey, who laughed, and he told me he warned me not to come back after I left for the night. Still, I wasn't convinced what had happened was paranormal. Fast forward about a month later, I was working a night shift on a Wednesday night. We were short-staffed, so Corey was working as the only cook for the shift. The only other person working with us was a cashier named Cynthia. I sent Cynthia to clean the bathrooms. It was extra slow that day, and thank goodness for that. I was in the front in case any customer walked in. All of a sudden, I heard Cynthia scream from the women's bathroom. I ran to her, and I found her crying. When she saw me, she hugged me and told me to close the door before it came back. I looked at her confused, but I did as she asked. I asked her what was wrong, and she said something had hit her. Like what? I asked. She said she didn't know. She lifted up her work shirt to show me her back. That's where I saw a red mark that looked like a handprint. My heart sank. I told her, let's go to the office right now. I locked the lobby doors and told Corey what was happening. We went into the office to check the security cameras. Cynthia had left the bathroom door open, and if left open the cameras could see the bathroom sink area where she was cleaning. What we saw next had us questioning everything we knew to be true. In the video, we saw a barely visible black shadow standing behind Cynthia. We then see Cynthia jump in pain from getting hit, and this shadow leaves the bathroom and turns into a little white orb on the screen. I recorded the camera footage, took a picture of Cynthia's back, and sent it to the general manager, telling him we were going home for the night. He didn't question us. He just responded with an okay, and we went home. Cynthia never came back to work. Corey quit about a month later. I wanted to quit, 
but I had car payments to make, so I stayed for about a year after that incident. However, I never stayed alone at that Burger King ever again. On my last day at work, I was training my replacement, and as we were finishing up our duties, I passed on the advice Corey had once given me. Make sure not to come back inside after you've left for the night. Burning from Robert S. I work as a generator mechanic in a rural part of California, deep in the Sierras at the edge of the Tahoe Forest. People tend to think of California as all beaches and Hollywood, but the reality is that's just two major cities which are surrounded by thousands of miles of rural countryside. With wildfires and severe snowstorms being a regular occurrence, generators are a big part of life around here, and my work revolves around keeping those machines running, which often requires being on call during emergencies. Last winter, a massive storm hammered the Sierras for days on end, and the calls were steadily coming in. It was a variety of typically expected equipment failures and the usual ridiculous questions, but this wasn't a typical snowstorm. Most locals describe the heavy snowfall and high winds as something they hadn't seen in these mountains in over 40 years. My company only employs a small crew of technicians and electricians, but our trucks are outfitted to respond under all kinds of conditions, as our services are often required when the weather is particularly nasty. Even with the proper gear and vehicles, we were all having to spend tremendous effort just to stay on the road, assuming we could even see them. Falling trees became background noise, punctuating the roaring wind with the occasional thunderclap of breaking wood, followed shortly by the heavy thud that could even be felt through our frozen work boots. The whole crew had met in the shop that morning to attend what had become daily emergency meetings. The usual topics were covered, while we refueled chainsaws, loaded portable generators, and prepared for another day battling the elements to get as many people's power back online as we could, or at least able to run their home generators until power could be restored. Large maps of the surrounding areas had been hastily hung up on the walls to keep track of which roads were completely blocked, where the power crews had been, and where they were going to be working next along with locations of emergency stations for fuel, medical aid, and warming shelters. I was studying these maps while changing out a worn chain on my saw, making notes on some of the new emergency frequencies we'd be using to communicate during the crisis. Cell phone coverage had gone from spotty to nearly non-existent during the storm, forcing us to rely on the radios mounted in the trucks. And remember, called out the boss man as we prepared to leave for the day. Always check all the way around a downed tree before moving anything from your path to reach a client's home. We don't need another incident like Tuesday. Good luck. Stay safe. Our community needs you all to be able to come back to work. He was referring to an incident a few days back when a tech had tried to move a large fallen tree from across the road and had apparently been electrocuted when he hooked his winch to a tree, which had been lying on top of a live power line. He survived, thanks to the fall alarm on our radios, sending out a distress signal whenever they're laid on their side for more than a few minutes. Rescue crews found him lying in the snow by his truck. Both he and the vehicle had sustained extensive burns. He was okay, but was still in the ICU. Due to the combination of his injuries, being frostbite and burns, he had been put under heavy sedation for the time being, but he was expected to pull through. Lucky me, today I was going to be working the calls in his area. I pulled on my snowcap with a built-in LED headlamp that my wife had bought me, pulled my heavy coat tight around my body, and climbed into the cab of my truck. Already warmed up, I dropped into four wheels and started what I thought would be just another day at the office. Eight hours flew past as I went about my calls. Pretty common issues, a tight valve here and a bad mixer there, some electrical troubleshooting. Most everyone I could get to was unbelievably grateful. Some offered tip money, bottles of wine, and even a steak from a cattle rancher that I happily accepted, despite our company policy of not accepting tips. But hey, these were extenuating circumstances, and some folks just won't take, sorry it's against policy, for an answer. 
Plus, I'm not one to shy away from a good steak, policy or not. I had just finished up my last call and had begun my staging part of the day. Staging is when all the scheduled calls are done, and we have a minute before the emergency calls can be routed to our devices. The interior of the truck is busy looking, crammed full of all the additional accessories we carry around while working emergencies. Cell phone chargers and battery banks plugged into charging ports, radios and docking stations across the dash. A pile of defective or broken parts filled the passenger seat, accompanying the daunting pile of service manuals, tools, bags, and field equipment. I cracked my window as I finished my lunch slash dinner, and I lit a cigarette, watching the loading bar on my laptop get to almost full. Then the latest set of emergency calls were brought in. As the pinwheel finally moved again, a new set was uploaded, just as the last of the dim light of day faded away. I looked at the clock on my phone. It was only 5 p.m. Three more calls. I take a deep breath and sigh heavily. A 12-hour day again. Well, at least I'm making good overtime, I thought. The next call was a no-start on a home generator, and from the notes, it sounded like an easy one, probably just a lack of maintenance. Mentally, I ran through the usual suspects. I'd be out of there in no time. I mentally slapped myself for even thinking that, because while I'm not a believer in much in the way of superstition, I am firm in my confidence that Murphy's Law is very, very real. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. In my experience, at the end of the day, a plan is just a list of things that didn't happen. I laugh out loud to myself, then stop to touch the pendant I wear around my neck. St. Jude, the patron saint of lost causes in desperate situations. I say to myself, Oh well, here we go. And I start to drive to the next job site. The location of this next site was pretty remote, even for these parts. As I made my way around the winding narrow road, I slowly passed the spot where our injured mechanic had his accident. I'm not a particularly religious or spiritual person, but Catholicism has a way of permeating, so I crossed myself and sent out a good thought to the poor guy and his family, hoping whatever powers that be are looking after him, or at least taking some mercy upon him. I mean, geez, this guy was only doing his job, no different than the rest of us. Soon I arrived at the house, which honestly I can't really make out. The level of snow was obscuring the common details I would use to prejudge the situation I was stepping into. Are they older folks and this is their vacation home? Or are they locals who have lived here for decades and finally had to call a repairman because they exhausted all their own attempts to fix the problem? Whatever the case, I threw on my hat with the company logo, donned my shining reflective safety vest, and trudged my way to the front door. The couple that answered the door were obviously in their later years, but they seemed homely and sweet. The husband explained he had tried everything he could think of to, to use his phrase, get her fired up, but it was to no avail. He was a short and stocky man, wider than I was, and comported himself as a man who had done hard work all his life. He had a thick, dark mustache and hard-set eyes, which told me he was a hard-working individual who wasn't at all happy about having to call an outsider in to fix his problem. At first, he attempted to follow me out into the dark, cold night to assist me, but after some coaxing from his wife, who shot me a worried glance, then seemed to check to see where the lights of my truck were pointed, she convinced her husband to stay inside and let the man do his work. He gave her a look that I can honestly only place as gratitude and grumbled his way back into the house to sit by the fire. I noted in that moment that the house itself was well lit with candles and battery-powered lights. Even the exterior was lit up. I was grateful for the wife telling him to leave me to my work. I can appreciate it when people want to learn how to fix things, but this wasn't the time. It's a lot easier to do my job without a watchdog lurking over my shoulder and offering unhelpful advice. Frankly, I've always worked better when left alone. After spending some time digging the generator out of its snow prison with only the headlights of my truck to guide me, I set to work on the diagnosis. I grabbed my impact driver from my tool bag and took the valve cover off. I was confident that this would be an easy fix and I would be on my way shortly. 
After one valve adjustment down, I was ready to start the motor. Just then, an error code popped up. Identification error. I stared at it for a moment, then looked to the sky to say, well, screw you then. Great, now I had to update the software. It's not hard to do, just time consuming, as it starts with an 800 second countdown before the update can take hold. When you're outside in the snow after dark, those are 800 very long seconds. I fumbled around in my pockets and after some false starts, I got my flash drive plugged into the machine and began the process. Because, well, you never get the USB right the first time. The timer began. I was standing in the cold, roaring wind, the display being the only source of light aside from my tiny flashlight. I make an executive decision to have a smoke while I wait. Normally, the company discourages any smoking on site, but I figured they aren't coming outside to yell at me anytime soon. So I lit up a smoke that I knew the wind was mostly going to smoke for me, but at this point, who cares? Only 758 seconds to go, I thought. I trudge over to the electrical panel to see what circuits will go on first. It's odd. Most people will put the well water or maybe the AC as the first system. But these people set the sodium perimeter lights as the first priority. Odd, but not all that odd, I suppose. After all, what use is anything else if you can't see what you're doing? And with all the wildlife roaming around in this part of the county, like bears, mountain lions, and the like, it makes sense if you have any kind of livestock or house cats. Or, you know, small children. I turned the headlights off in my truck as I no longer needed them for shoveling. And why risk a dead battery way out here at this time of night? Another 554 seconds to go. Rather abruptly, the wind died down. It just stopped. I was grateful. Thank God, I said out loud to myself. I might finally be coming to the part of the night when the snow just gently falls, instead of tiny ice missiles blasting my face all night. I unbuttoned the collar of my coat and shook my beard free. I kept working on my smoke as the countdown continued. I pushed my heavy hood, laden with snow, off my head for a break from the oppressive weight, and only then did I notice it. I noticed just how silent the area around me had become. The storm had been such a constant source of white noise that at first it felt welcome, a relief to have a break from the overbearing roar of sharp wind. That relief was short-lived, and a real feeling of dread began to set in. Silence in the woods is something mountain folk know better than to trust. There's no way to describe it unless you felt it. Any hiker or hunter can tell you when everything goes quiet, it means a large predator is close by, hiding in the shadows or perched in the trees above, and you would do well to be very aware of your surroundings, and if possible, carefully make your exit. I began scanning the tree line around me, and I almost immediately saw something moving just out of sight range. I squinted hard to try and make out the shape, the occasional brazen deer and other mostly harmless wildlife had been successful in scaring the daylights out of me in the past, when I was least expecting them, so I told myself this was probably just a buck, albeit a big one, moving through. But as I stared into the darkness of the forest, trying to make out the shape of the creature in the shadows, I began to realize something. This was not a single creature. There were multiple creatures, moving about behind the trees, just out of visibility. A herd of deer, maybe. Anxious, I glanced at the countdown, 345 seconds to go. Remember when I said 800 seconds could feel a lot longer? I had a sick feeling growing in my stomach, an instinct that something was horribly wrong, something dangerous. I stayed perfectly still as the shapes moved closer. I don't have the words to describe just how they moved from tree to tree, sticking to the dark patches, and as they moved closer, I was able to see them in better detail, which didn't make things any less terrifying. As they approached and their shapes became easier to make out, they seemed like human figures, for sure. Some tall, some short, almost like a whole group of people. But they couldn't be people not out here in the woods in this weather. They certainly weren't deer. 
Their movement was shyly aggressive. They began to remind me of coyotes stalking a potential prey. 115 seconds left. I couldn't make out any detail yet. They all seemed to be cloaked in darkness that remained wrapped around them like a shadow, but darker, unnatural. I told myself not to panic. I'd been working double shifts for days. I was exhausted, and the contrast of snow in the dark can play tricks on your eyes. I tried to tell myself I was just sleep-deprived, that I was just working myself up. But as the figures grew closer, that got difficult to convince myself of. I didn't want to take my eyes off of them, but I needed to plot out the best route back to my truck. Problem was, the truck was parked next to the barn, and where I was working on the generator, I was shrouded in shadow from the lights coming out of the windows of the house. Only 30 seconds now. The creatures seemed to fan out. It began to feel as if they were all around me, and they were swiftly closing the distance. I held my breath and took a few steps back, putting my back against the wall of the barn. I exhaled sharply as the fear I'd been holding back shot up from my gut like a shot of electricity. My back to the wall, my eyes darted from figure to figure, and that lizard part of my brain kicked in. I dropped my smoke to free both hands, and I distinctly remember hearing it hiss angrily as it made contact with the snow. I felt sweat beginning to bead on my temples, despite the freezing temperature. The muscles in my leg tightened, and I could feel the veins in my head pulsing, pushing blood past my ears in a steady thumping roar that mercifully blocked out the awful sound of the complete silence of the snow. Everything seemed to slow down and speed up all at once, and with all hope of reaching the truck in time gone, I lifted my arms to block my face and squeezed my eyes tightly shut, bracing for impact. Then, I heard it. I heard the click of the generator. It had finished its update and was now starting to sputter to life. The engine cranked so loudly I had to cover my ears, and in that moment, despite not putting much stock in prayer, I genuinely prayed that it would start, and maybe someone hurt me, because it did just that. With a cough and sputter, the engine came up to speed and began to purr, and with an audible snap, the transfer switch began to power on all the outside lights to the house. I sucked in air. I apparently had stopped breathing. The nervous tension in my chest broke as relief washed over me. I opened my eyes. I wish to this day that I never had. The lights came on slowly at first, a dim orange-pink glow bathing the scene around me a sickening hue. Eyes attempting to adjust to the new level of visibility, I leaned forward, squinting to see if the figures were, in fact, just figments of my imagination. A consequence of exhaustion. Too many days in crisis mode. I was wrong. As the lights began to chase away the darkness around me, the figures did not disappear with it. Once completely clad in darkness, they were now revealed, and they were very real. The light washed away the obfuscation around them, like wind blowing away ash. My mind tried to slog through the adrenaline dump and process just what it was seeing. They were just people. Men, women, and children. People, not creatures, not predators. My emotional brain breathed a sigh of relief because, hey, it's okay, they're just, they're just people. Meanwhile, my logical brain was grabbing the wheel and screaming at me. Something's wrong. Pay attention. My eyes finally caught up. I looked them over, trying to understand what I was seeing. They gazed back at me in silence. Then it dawned on me, and I felt the blood draining out of my face. The clothes. They hung oddly off their bodies, and they were not intended for winter weather, much less a record-breaking snowstorm. Their clothes were ill-fitting and had the look of something homemade. Dirty overalls, hand-sewn pants, prospector hats, and... Was that a bonnet? They just stood there staring at me, silent as the snowfall, and completely still. Zero seconds left, full power. The sodium perimeter lights kicked on, bathing the entire property in sharp, relentless light, blinding me. 
My eyes fought to make the transition from straining in the blackness to being bombarded with the sudden illumination. When the light hit the strange people in front of me, they changed. It was like the light itself ripped through them, and I gaped in horror, unable to believe what was happening. All the people standing before me, men, women, and children, began to scream. These were no human screams. The shrill sound pierced my ears and reverberated through my core. It sounded like true agony coming from deep underwater. I covered my ears to block out the chilling sound, but my eyes remained fixed on the nightmare unfolding. Their clothes simply ripped away from them, as if scorched off by a fire I could not see, and their flesh began to burn away as well, tearing away from them, ripping into fluttering ashes of red-hot agony. They stood in place, writhing and burning in agony for what should have been only a single second. Then they turned their contorted faces directly toward me. Their eyes. I'll never in all my days forget their eyes. Jaundiced and sick human but filled with pure hate and rage. The one that had been closest to me fell to its knees and began to crawl towards me, its movements convulsing in torment and anguish. I fell backwards, landing hard on a landscaping rock. With pain shooting through my body, I scrambled to scoot backwards on my butt. The ghoulish figure stretched a smoldering hand out and I gasped out loud as it grabbed a hold of my foot, its grip too strong to escape. Lifting its head with a tremendous effort, it stared into my eyes, filled with fury but almost pleading. Then it opened its gaping mouth to speak, and the words that shot from its mouth went right through me, haunting me for the rest of my life. With an expression of pure torture, it screamed, Get the children! I watched paralyzed as the light finally overtook the wretched creature, and it faded crumbling into ash, blowing away in the crisp night breeze. I was left there alone in the snow, my pounding heart beating right out of my chest. I looked down and noticed smoke wafting up from my boot. Suddenly I felt searing pain in my toes, like the steel toe of my boot was on fire. Pain is a funny thing, makes you forget absolute terror, at least for a moment. It jolted me out of my shocked stupor, and I reached down and unlaced my boot as fast as I could, tossing it into the gleaming snow. It sizzled for a second, like my cigarette had a lifetime ago, then began to sink into the widening hole around it in the snowbank. As I jammed my foot into the nearest drift to soothe the searing sensation, all the lights in the entire house popped back on, and I heard a sound coming up behind me to my left. Oh no, the family... They were no longer safely inside, and since I had butt-scooted far enough toward my truck, I could now see the entrance to the home. The husband, wife, and two children had emerged. A boy, maybe around 13, and a girl that looked around 5. They all stood on the porch, holding firearms, even the girl, peering out into the night. After what felt like an eternity, I stood, and feeling suddenly sheepish, I gathered my boot from where it had been thrown. I had no explanation for what just happened, but I tried my best to collect myself. I looked down at my discarded work boot and saw something that, again, I could not explain. A handprint seared into the leather, where whatever that was had placed its hand upon me. I slipped it back on and gathered my composure. I was still on the clock, and my professionalism overpowered my shock and disbelief at what had just happened. Climbing back into the cab of my truck, I located my clipboard and smoothed out the work order. I have no idea why I chose to do this. I think I just needed some sense of order. I clicked my pen and wrote a concise description of the work I performed. Having still not laced the offending boot, and with little stabs of pain causing a slight limp, I awkwardly made my way back onto the porch, the family having apparently retreated back into the house while I focused on my paperwork. I rang the now operational doorbell, and the husband quickly answered. Get it all worked out? He watched me closely, an inquisitive look on his face. I tried to steady the trembling in my voice, and I replied, Yes, sir, she's back up and running. 
He eyed me intently, searching my face for something, but I was all business. Hell of a thing you guys do. Not just anyone would come all the way up here to fix something in this kind of storm. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> we try our best, sir. I answered and finally sounded like myself, going through my standard lines. He continued to study me, which would normally make me uncomfortable, but I was too spent to care. Why don't you stay here tonight? We've got a nice couch to put you on, and the roads behind you are closed and well. He hesitated, contemplating for a second. Well, he just did us a real big favor, and we'd like to repay you. Come on in, we'll make you some coffee. You're probably frozen to the bone working out here. I faked a gracious smile, anxious to get as far away from here as possible. I appreciate that, sir, but I'll have to pass. I've got more calls tonight. The man snorted, gesturing out behind them at the snow which had begun to dump again, already covering my footprints from the truck to the porch. You ain't getting to them tonight, my friend. Don't be stupid, you're gonna freeze to death. Come on in, let's get you in some dry clothes. He opened the door behind him and reached for my arm to pull me inside, refusing to take no for an answer, but I stepped sideways and just barely skirted his grip. I appreciate the offer, I really do, but power's out all across town. I have more people out there shivering in the dark that need me. He finally gave up, nodding in defeat and holding out his hand. I take it, give him a nod, and quickly return to my truck to check the weather forecast and wind map on my laptop. The wind map gives those in the field a kind of reference point for where the storm is the worst. Right where the incident occurred on the south side of the property, there was a huge black spot of no wind. It was moving. Whatever it was that had reached out that night wasn't just a random occurrence. It was out there, moving like a living storm within a storm. I grabbed my phone out of my jacket pocket, and I looked at the next call. The next one was along this road and right in this path. Right then, a call came on my work phone. They had figured it out for themselves, thankfully. Call cancelled. Okay, I thought to myself, I've had enough of this for one night. Time to go home. I had them sign a work order and took off down the road. The delirium of adrenaline had worn off, leaving me in a bizarre state of almost finding the events humorous. I laughed to myself, saying out loud, what was that? I'm used to working under extreme circumstances, but this felt more urgent than anything I'd ever done. I wound my way back down the long, snow-covered road. Once back on the main road, I gathered myself, trying to make sense of what happened, but that proved fruitless. So I just radioed in to the home office, stating that I was taking the truck home and I'd be dispatching from home tomorrow. They confirmed and thanked me for all my hard work tonight, saying, Hey, take the day off tomorrow if you need some rest. I agreed to that offer, and immediately headed to the nearest liquor store that was still operational. Securing my liquid therapy for the night, I began to head home down much more familiar and comfortable roads. I pulled into my driveway. I immediately poured a drink from my bottle of whiskey, then another. I went inside and was suddenly overcome with gratitude. I was home safe. It didn't take too much effort to get the fire going again, too. I settled down with my bottle and a small dinner, plugging my laptop into the TV. I ate and drank in silence as I watched that black spot move through the storm until exhaustion and bourbon overcame me. By morning, it was gone. I never got a real explanation for the events of that night, but a few months later I was working around the same area, and I got into a conversation with a client around there. He was a retired land surveyor, and spent his retirement locating old mining towns that had been lost to history. He told me that a small mining town had once been somewhere in this area, and he'd been able to locate some piles of stones and a few outlines of the old structures of said town. According to his research, the town had a small schoolhouse, church, and a few houses. Records of the time were mostly gone except one. He showed it to me. It was an old weathered newspaper article that talked about a fire that had broken out in the church. Being there was no such thing as a fire department, the entire town was said to have been lost to that fire. 
as he showed me the topographical map of where he found the remnants, I recalled the last place I'd seen the black spot on the wind map. It was an identical match. I think now I know what happened to the people that lived there. The Gassing of Hospital Hill From Rural Savage The following is a true story of events that took place during my high school years in the mid-1980s. I grew up in rural New England in the mid-1960s through the mid-1980s in a quiet town of about 6,000 residents. For a relatively small town, we had a lot of places for high school kids to find after-school jobs. Three gas stations, two pharmacies, three ice cream parlors, a grocery store, three pizza places, half a dozen restaurants, a couple of craft and supply stores, a fairly large hardware store, surprisingly huge number of antique shops, and the hospital. The hospital was originally built as a private home in the early 1730s and was enlarged around 1900 to become a hotel on the local Boston and Maine Railroad branch line. Once the railroad discontinued the branch line through town and the hotel customers dried up, the property was sold again to a group of doctors and the building became a private psychiatric hospital in the late 1930s. Quick aside, the hospital still exists, although these days it is a private detox facility. You can find them up online if you know where to look. When I worked there, the main building of the hospital primarily housed long-term care patients not those who needed psychiatric care, really, more folks with dementia or severe cognitive disabilities that made it impossible for them to take care of themselves. A good number of the patients were non-ambulatory and needed wheelchairs or walkers or other assistance to move around. I can't recall exactly how many patients there were, but it was a small facility, definitely under 100 total patients and staff with the typical variance in staff size depending on day shift or night shift. After school, on weekends, and in the summer, the hospital made use of high school students in the food service kitchen area with an adult head cook who ran the operation. There were generally four uniformed teenage girls who handled waitressing and who actually interacted with the patients out in the dining room and who bussed the tables after the patients were done. There was also a cook's assistant and the dishwasher floor mopper cleanup person. At this point in time, the cleanup person was a job that me and my younger brother had, working after school and on weekends on alternating days, so not on the same days. I should also mention that at the time the head cook was a guy called Dave. Dave was a former music student of my dad's when he was a high school teacher in a neighboring town. So while my brother and I didn't really know Dave all too well, he did have a soft spot for us both. Every night before the evening meal, the entire kitchen staff would sit down together and have dinner ourselves. We'd then all scramble for final dinner prep, the dishwasher assisting where needed, and the waitresses would serve dinner to the patients. After evening meal, the waitresses would bust the tables and drop everything on the industrial dishwasher counter, wipe down the tables in the dining room, and go home. The cook and the cook's assistant would bring all the pots and pans over to the dishwasher counter, wipe down their stoves and cooking areas, then also go home. The poor dishwasher would then be there alone for as long as it took, which was usually about two hours, if I recall correctly. That included also wiping down the dishwasher counter and mopping the entire kitchen area, starting at the dining room door and walking backwards through the kitchen staff's break area, and so on. Before we get to the actual story, there's one more character to introduce, Iggy. Who exactly Iggy was, patient or staff, we could never get a straight answer. No one from the adult hospital staff would ever answer the question, not even Dave the cook, although it was clear there was more to the story and the adult staff just didn't feel they could share it with the kids. What we could say about Iggy is that we knew he lived at the hospital in the attic. He seemed to be some sort of general handyman. To us teenagers, he looked to be about a thousand years old. He had the unmistakable odor of someone who likely hadn't bathed in a decade, and he took great pains to be sure he was at kitchen staff dinner time every night, right on time, during which he would ogle the teenage waitresses and grumble incoherently while gumming his meal in his completely toothless mouth. So, anyway, the night of the event started like any other. 
We all had dinner with Iggy leering at the girls as always. The waitresses served the patients and bussed the tables, putting everything on the dishwasher counter. Dave and his assistant cleaned up their cook areas and brought over all the pots and pans, and they all went home. As the cleanup guy and dishwasher, I started in on the dishes, scrubbing the pots and pans, and I had everything done and put away in good time. Then, as always, I filled up the rolling mop bucket using the kitchen hose, adding a generous amount of the industrial floor cleaner we'd always used. Then I got to work on the mopping. Just as I finished mopping the kitchen staff break area, I was about to start on the actual kitchen floor. That's when Iggy walked in through the side door. This was unusual and something he'd never done before when I mopped, but he had the run of the place and always carried a huge set of keys on his belt, so I didn't really think anything of him unlocking the door and coming in. Iggy stared at me for a moment, but then he said, Good thing I caught you, boy. I've been getting all kinds of complaints about the crappy job you've been doing on the kitchen floor. Obviously, this was news to me, and I told him that. But he replied, It's that, Dave. He's too easy on you, and you're slacking off. Wait here. And with that, he stormed off back out the side door. He was back in under 30 seconds, handing me a second bottle of industrial cleaner. He said, Pour in a good amount of that, then finish the floor and make sure you get it good and wet and scrub it real good. So what was I supposed to do? He was an adult and apparently employed by the hospital, and I was just some high school kid doing a part-time job. So I did what I was told. I poured in some of the new cleaner until he said, that's enough. Then I mixed it around in the bucket with the mop. Once I'd done that, he took the bottle back, nodded once, and reminded me. Make sure you scrub it real good. Get it good and wet. He then exited again out the side door, back into the hospital corridor. So at that point, I did what I was trained to do. I mopped the kitchen floor as I'd done dozens of times before, always walking backwards towards the kitchen door, which was currently propped open to let some air in, as the kitchen didn't have air conditioning and could be stifling in warm weather. I noticed then that the mix I was putting on the floor was a slightly different color than normal, but I didn't notice anything else. I finished the job, dumped the mop water outside, put away the mop and bucket, locked up the kitchen door, and got on my bike, making my way home on the other side of town, at that point, it was 8pm and everything was wrapped up. Due to a number of appointments, both my brother and I would be off from the hospital for the next few days, and one of the adult daytime staff was assigned to provide dishwasher coverage while we were away. After about four days, I ended up being the first of us to work again. I rode my bike to the hospital that evening to clean up from the dinner mill shift. On arrival, I was immediately grabbed by the arm and hauled outside by Dave, who looked me in the face and yelled, What the hell did you do? Obviously, I had no idea what he was talking about, so I told him that. He asked me to describe my last work shift. I told him the same story I've described here. As understanding dawned, I saw his eyes shift and then go real sad. He then said to me very quietly, Never take anything from Iggy. Make sure your brother knows this too. He then told me what happened. Apparently, at 2 a.m. that night, a passing hospital staffer had smelled something unusual coming from the kitchen. They got security to unlock the side door. They were both then assaulted by a noxious cloud of chemicals that burned their eyes and noses. Fearing the worst, they pulled the fire alarm which caused an immediate evacuation of the building, forcing all patients and staff out into the night while the fire department swarmed all over the building trying to figure out what was wrong. After venting out the kitchen, not being able to find any cause for the fumes after four hours of looking, they could only conclude it was some sort of industrial spill. The fire department cleared them to bring the patients back in, the kitchen was shut down for several days to be thoroughly scrubbed by a commercial cleaning company while the patients were fed takeout food at enormous expense. Everyone assumed it was my fault somehow. 
This being the 80s and our town being the model of small town America, they left it to Dave to talk to me, rather than rushing to immediately have me arrested on the spot. Turns out whatever Iggy had given me had mixed with the cleaner in the bucket. It had literally created a toxic gas. I must have never noticed it because I was walking backwards away from it the entire time, and the kitchen door was open allowing clean air in. Once the door was locked and the kitchen was bottled up for the night, it became a toxic soup. Looking back at it over the years and making educated guesses about the different contents of the two bottles of cleaner, it's very likely that the mixture that was in the bucket would have been extremely deadly if someone had inhaled enough of it. Obviously, I was blameless. I kept washing dishes at that hospital for another year, until I moved on to my first computer industry job, then on to college. My brother kept working there another two years until he also left. Iggy still showed up for every meal, right on time, ogling those high school girls. Children in the Night from Volv I used to work in a very expensive assisted living facility that also had a memory care unit for Alzheimer's and dementia residents as well. This place has been home to many famous people before they passed on, so out of respect for some of the families, all names will be changed. I've probably a dozen or so stories from my almost four years working at this facility relating to creepy or somewhat unsettling experiences. I'll start with a short and simple story. We have a resident who I'll call Mrs. A. I was sitting in my office on the third level when I heard a faint knock on my door. I opened the door to find Mrs. A standing there. This is the conversation that followed. I'm sorry to bother you, Oliver, but do you have a moment? She said. Of course, Mrs. A. How may I be of assistance? Oh, I don't want to be a bother, but could you ask whoever is bringing children around to visit to please tell them to be quieter at night? I'm not sure what you mean. Can you explain what's going on? You see, for the last two nights around two in the morning, I've heard children running up and down the halls laughing. I don't mind children being here, but it's rather difficult for me to sleep with so much noise. Okay, I'll be sure to bring it up with the CNAs to remind residents that visitors are to be courteous to those who are sleeping. Thank you, Oliver. I don't think children should be up late playing either. It makes for bad sleeping habits in the future. You're right, Mrs. A. I'll get the CNAs shortly to let them know. Thank you again, Oliver. Sorry to bother you. Not a problem. Hopefully you'll be able to sleep well tonight. Now, I should also mention that my job was as a maintenance person, so I had access to the security cameras placed all around the facility. I decided to look at the cameras first before approaching the CNAs about this. I pulled up the previous nights between midnight to three in the morning, and what I found was shocking. Nothing. The only thing I saw was that between two and three in the morning, Mrs. A peeked out of her door and looked around the hallway. There was no one in the halls then. I looked over at six different angles to make sure that I didn't miss anything, but there was nothing. How strange, I thought to myself. I made my way down the elevator to the first level and into the CNA office to ask them about any late night visitors the past few nights. They assured me that no one had been staying past visiting hours, which ended at 8 p.m. I then headed to the front desk, where the visitor sign-in and sign-out log was, and sure enough, the last guest had left around 7 p.m. After some time thinking on it, I concluded that the noise was probably Reggie's TV. He always has his TV loud, because he's nearly deaf. It would be kind of odd for him to watch the same show back to back unless his memory is starting to fade. All in all, I brushed off the thought, which may have been a mistake. The very next day, Mrs. A was knocking on my door again, but she looked annoyed this time. 
Hello, Mrs. A. I talked to... She interrupted me. I thought you said you'd talk to the CNAs about late-night visitors. A little confused, I responded. I did, and I verified in the guest sign-in and sign-out book that no one had been here later than 7 p.m. the other night. Mrs. A looked at me in a tone that looked displeased and said in a semi-sarcastic voice, Well, it didn't work, because the children were running around again last night. They were so loud, I'm not sure how my husband slept through all that noise. If you're not going to take care of this, then I will. At this point, Mrs. A walked away with a huff. I just sat there a minute, somewhat confused, then pulled up the cameras again, still finding nothing but Mrs. A looking out her door between 2 and 3 a.m. I wondered how long this back and forth would go on. It honestly worried me, because knowing Mrs. A's family, they had some serious pull at this facility. I wasn't worried about my job, more so about the repercussions that may come about by her throwing a fit. The following day, I was bracing myself for another lashing from Mrs. A at some point, and sure enough, just before lunch, there was a knock on my door. I opened it to find Mrs. A standing there smiling. Well, hello, Mrs. A. You seem to be having a good day. Why, yes, I am. Thank you. Do you know why? I haven't a clue, honestly. I slept through the night with no disturbances from kids laughing or playing in the hallways. Not a peep was heard. That's fantastic, Mrs. A. I'm glad you were able to sleep. She smiled and slowly walked away. The level of relief from seeing her so chipper cannot be described sufficiently, but it was short-lived, so to speak. The day after that, I came into work and there was an ambulance parked out front of the facility. Not an unfamiliar sight, as residents fell sometimes and needed a little extra attention. I clocked in for work and started my usual rounds of the grounds, stopping at the CNA office to get an update of anything that I may have missed. The atmosphere in the office was glum. A few of the CNAs were crying, which naturally I asked, What happened? Amanda, one of the CNAs, looked at me and said, Mrs. A passed away this morning. I just kind of stood there for a minute, almost in disbelief. After gathering myself, I ventured up to my office. My boss was in my office already, looking at work orders for the day, Seeing me a little shaken up, he asked if I was okay. I told him about my experience with Mrs. A before she passed. Then he and I looked through the camera footage for anything, finding, as usual, nothing. Now, you may be thinking, oh, so what, someone thinks they heard children then died. I'd be right there with you, except this same thing happened five other times, and each time the person who heard the children laughing passed away within three days. Mrs. A was one of the first of over 200 residents who passed on while I worked at that facility. She was a kind lady and an honest hoot to talk to on occasion. I was blessed to have known her in my lifetime. This concludes the story. However, I do have many more where this came from. The following story is an update to a previous story, which I read on unexplained encounters in the past, so I'm going to add the original first part of the story here, so that it all makes sense. Then I'll read the update. Horrible Night Shift Sounds From Edgar Allen I'm a water treatment plant operator in West Texas. I've worked the night shift for about eight years, the building I spend most of the night shift in was built in 1955. It has had several upgrades over the years, but many of the same components are original. In the basement, there are pipes, pumps, wiring conduits, and other such things. The building is built like a fortress, solid concrete floors and a flat concrete roof. The walls are cinder blocks, in other words, a very sturdy building. I do lab work, 
Tests on the water, such as chlorine content, pH and temp, alkalinity, at scheduled intervals, usually every four hours. I work from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I have, over the years, heard strange sounds. Creaks, moans, bangs, pops, thuds, etc. I think it's just due to temperature changes during the day to night transition, so I usually don't pay too much attention to them. But one night was different. I was going over some paperwork about 2 a.m. one night a few years ago. Everything was dead quiet. I'd like to mention that the street in front of the plant is not a well-traveled street, but there is moderate traffic at times. Also, there is a dip at the intersection in front of the plant. I've seen several unaware motorists go over the dip way too fast, and I've literally seen sparks come out from the bottom of their cars when they bottom out on the other side of the dip. Seems like people forget that the speed limit on the street is 30 miles per hour. They get reminded in an abrupt way when this happens. Anyway, on that particular night, I heard one of the loudest noises I've ever heard while working nights. It sounded exactly like a vehicle crashing into the building. I heard glass breaking, tires screeching, metal breaking. I jumped up, grabbed my cell phone, and was headed towards the front doors ready to dial 911. I opened the doors expecting to see a horrible scene. To my amazement, there was nothing. I mean nothing. No crashed car, no people, no sounds. I was astounded. I ran around the side of the building thinking that the car had just glanced off the building and kept going. But there were no marks on the road or any indication that anything out of the ordinary had happened. I just stood there for a few minutes, thinking I must have been losing my mind. I don't know how I would have mistaken that sound for a car crashing into the building. I didn't know what else to do but put the matter behind me and continue to work. I haven't heard the noise again, and I hope I don't. An interesting thing I noticed a few days later is that there is a fairly large piece of concrete missing from the foundation of the building on the outside corner where I heard the noise. The only thing is, it's been painted over years ago. The damage isn't in any way fresh or new. But could I have heard a residual noise stuck in time from an accident that happened years ago? What would have made me the only one that heard it? There are houses across the street. Seems like someone else would have heard it too, but no one ever came out. It was very strange indeed. Part 2. More Strange Happenings at the Water Treatment Plant I was at work one night. It was very busy because of plant upgrades and booster station renovations. I had to check pump operations at our north booster station slash pump house, so I was back and forth between the main plant and the station several times that night. I entered the main plant building around 10.30 p.m. after making my rounds. During my night shifts, I always keep all the doors locked. I don't want any surprises. I've heard stories from other plant operators about people wandering in the building at night, so I try to avoid that situation. In actuality, we're not open to the public. Authorized personnel only is what it says on the front door. Anyway, I walked through our front lobby and into the main office. There's a small set of stairs up to the office. There's a utility closet right before you get to the office, and when I walked by it, the light inside turned on. I could see it under the door. I was a little confused at first, because the light inside the utility closet is motion activated. I thought for a moment I might have an unwanted visitor, and he ducked into the closet when he heard me come in. So I opened the closet door halfway, expecting to find someone inside. But no, there was nothing at all. There were two big electrical boxes in there and the communication server, but no people. Nothing that can move or cause the sensor to activate the light either. I thought that maybe it was a defective light sensor, maybe an electrical issue, or something like that. 
I didn't worry about it too much. I had a lot of things to do that night. Although it did seem very strange that the light came on just as I walked by that closet. I got back to work. We have a huge monitor mounted on the wall in the main office. It's connected to a PC that has a program in it that communicates with all the water towers, ground storage tanks, pumps, and motors for the town. As part of my nightly duties, I take readings off the monitor and write them down on a log sheet. I was doing just that when I heard a very loud noise coming from our shop and work area. Our shop is the room right next to the main office. I actually had the door open going from the main office to the shop. This noise I'd heard sounded like a bag of bolts or maybe even tools falling off a workbench. It was very loud. I thought, okay, there's definitely someone in here with me. Right away, I went into the shop area and looked for what could have fallen down. I didn't see anything out of order, though. There were many things in the shop, such as bins of supplies, pipes, valves, bolts, screws, fittings, etc. I thought someone knocked something over and then ran out, but I didn't see them come through the open doorway, and I never heard them open the door leading to the outside of the building. I checked everything and everywhere in the shop. I couldn't find anything that could have made that noise. The longer I work at this plant, the more I think there may be paranormal activity here. I was a little shaken up after this, so much so that I took holy water and sprinkled it around the shop, saying the Lord's Prayer. I plan on working here until retirement. As unnerving as these things are, I'm not going anywhere. I'll keep you all informed if anything else happens. College Night Shift From Eva Fan 33 I used to work part-time at the college where I studied. I took courses in the IT field, and each semester they would hire some students to work entry-level tech positions, granting decent income and great experience. Being one of the lucky few to get a job, I didn't complain when I was rostered over to the night shift. My role was a lab proctor. Usually I was tending to computer labs, re-imaging workstations, and installing new ones. The reason there was a night shift at all was to service the instructors teaching part-time courses. There were only a few night classes, sometimes none at all, but even so, if something went wrong, we had to be there. Otherwise, a class might end up cancelled. I only had one partner in the evening hours, a girl named Kira. I was fresh out of high school and she was a few years older than me, but we got along well. Similar senses of humor and all that. Things were pretty seamless for the majority of the term, until we hit the first day of December. I'm going to recount it to the best of my ability. Hopefully you don't mind the details, but I want to go as in-depth as possible. So I met Kira in a laboratory on the third floor of one of the campus buildings. I'd come early, but she was already waiting for me. This was the default location for the proctors. Usually, we didn't spend much time there. We would just set our stuff down and then go follow up on tickets or jobs that were sent out. Our boss, Harry, wasn't there that night. Not like we really needed him anyway. He'd sent out an email beforehand informing us that he was not available, and he'd attached tickets we had to work on. There were five or six of them, and we had from 4pm to 12am to finish them up. The first one was to re-image a lab. This meant we would be installing an operating system on each computer in a certain room. The lab was in another building. It was a large campus, and the place we'd need to head over to was about a six-minute walk. Whenever we went out, we were supposed to take proctor phones with us. They were normal smartphones, the key difference being they had the instructor helpline forwarded to them. It was essential we carry them around to answer any call that might come up. That's why I found it weird Kira didn't take hers. She seemed to forget, so I gave her one and grabbed the other also taking my laptop with me to update the inventory of the lab. Odd things began to happen when we stopped in the elevator. I punched the button for the ground level, and the doors closed. But before the elevator started, the two of us heard this scratching noise. That's the best way I can describe it. It sounded like an animal, maybe a raccoon, dancing on the roof of the elevator with its nails grazing the metal. I knew for a fact the sound wasn't there when I'd gone up, so I was sure it wasn't the hardware of the elevator. I made a comment about it. Kira seemed indifferent, though. 
In fact, she was awfully quiet. Anyway, the elevator reached the ground level without issue and we got out. The exit was right in front of us then, and we headed through. From there, we started our walk to the building that housed the lab. The sun had already began to set. It was the middle of winter, after all, and it was chilly. After another few minutes, we got to the building. The doors were automatically locked at 4pm each day, so we needed to swipe our access cards to get in. Despite the smart security on the door, this building was a lot older than the others. The air conditioning seemed defective. It was incredibly hot and muggy when we entered. The lab in question was on the bottom floor of the building, so we took the stairs to get down. Once we made it to the lower level, we were greeted with a hallway. It was dark and rather ominous. Even worse, the lights were buggy. Only the one directly above our heads came on. The rest in the hallway started to flicker. Almost all of them were spotty and inconsistent, except for the one at the very end, which didn't turn on at all. We didn't mind terribly though, there was enough light to make out the room designations. The lab we were looking for was right in the middle of the hallway. We walked up to it, and Kira swiped her card to open it up. Only nothing happened. The card didn't seem to trigger the reader at all. It didn't spit an error, it just ignored it. So I swiped mine, and the door opened up. As we got into the room, we noticed something bizarre. One of the computer chairs, the one at the far corner of the room, was spinning. Quickly, too. It was like someone had just slammed it as hard as they could. No one else was there, though. Even weirder, inertia should have slowed down the chair, but it just kept spinning, like its velocity was continuously being refreshed. We both looked at each other, then I went over to it, freaked out but trying not to show it. I grabbed the chair to stop it from spinning. It froze, but as it did, this sensation of ice crept over me. It was like when you swim in a pool in the middle of winter, then get out and feel the exposure on your skin. Only it was just on my arm. I must have freaked out a little, cause Kira asked me if I was okay. I said I was fine, and then the sensation went away. Like there one second, gone the next. After I recovered, I was going to make a comment about the chair but she had already gotten to work, so I didn't bother, instead following her lead. It seemed to me she was having a rough night, because she fumbled with the keyboards, apparently forgetting how to open up the boot menu. So I took over her machines for her. It wasn't hard work after all. She sat down and watched me, looking very tired. It took about 15 minutes to begin the imaging process on all the computers. I read over the next ticket, it involved pulling up a workstation in a different lab back to the proctor room to diagnose it, because it had some hardware issues. I checked with Kira to make sure she was okay staying in the lab by herself. She didn't have a problem with it, so I left. I did feel uneasy about her being alone, though. I didn't really know why. Something bothered me about it, but I knew it would be redundant for both of us to wait there. So off I went. As soon as I stepped into the hallway and shut the lab door, the scratching sound returned. It was right over my head then, in the ceiling. The exact same sound from the elevator in the other building. I could hear it more clearly without the noise of the cables moving up and down. It sounded less like a raccoon and more like a dog. There was some weight to whatever creature was making the noise. It seemed to be digging, furiously, as if it was trying to get through the ceiling. I tried to ignore it and headed down the hallway but the sound followed me. Every fluorescent light I passed turned off, like whatever was making that sound up there was cutting the wires. Paranoid, I sped up and eventually reached the end of the hallway. The noise followed and quickly it cut off the very last light. Freaked out and a little frustrated, I yelled something along the lines of, Enough! And just like that, the noise went away, as if it was never there. I was really anxious at that point. I think I tried to rationalize it as I passed living between levels of the building. Just as I was about to take the stairs up to the ground level, though, I remembered Kira. My stomach dropped as I thought of her. It was the same feeling of uneasiness. Not necessarily for her safety, either. I just felt strange. 
It's hard to explain, but anyway, I ran back down the dark hall and opened the lab door to check on her. To my dismay, she was gone. The chair she had been sitting in just before was empty, but now it was spinning rapidly just like the one from the first time we entered the room. I didn't know what to do. I was beyond freaked out. I spun around, pale as a ghost, when I heard the door to the lab unlock. Lo and behold, it was Kira. She was fine, apparently, even smiling, unlike when I had saw her previously. Then she asked me a confusing question. Hey, why didn't you wait for me? I blinked, confused. She told me that she had arrived in the proctor room to find it empty, with me and the phones already gone. She had to look up the first ticket to find out where I was, and then she came and found me. I just sort of stared. I must have given her this look because she was like, what's wrong? Then I explained to her that I had met her earlier that shift and we headed to the lab together. She looked at me like I was stupid. She iterated again that she had been late and had to look up the room to find out where to go. I think I snapped then. I said something along the lines of, if this is a joke, it's not funny. She asked me what I was talking about. That's when another realization set in. When you're in some freaky situation like this, you don't sweat the small stuff. You don't take in every detail. So I only realized then that Kira was wearing something totally different than what I'd seen her in before. There were two possibilities. Either this was some elaborate prank where she left, changed, and came back, all the while messing with the lights, or there was something really bad going on. That's when I decided to check. I told her that she had taken the proctor phone and she insisted she hadn't, saying both phones were gone by the time she'd gotten there. So I took out my own phone and called the number of the proctor phone she had, fully expecting it to ring from her pocket. But it didn't. The dial tones played, but the device itself must have been too far because we didn't hear it anywhere. Kira looked at me, annoyed, and I was about to apologize for accusing her of lying before I was cut off. Someone answered on the other side of my call. I heard nothing at first, but the dial tones had stopped and it didn't reach voicemail, so I knew someone had picked up. Immediately, I put the phone into speaker, mouthing the word, listen, to her. We both stood there silently. As I turned the volume to max, we picked up on a noise. It sounded like breathing, faint but audible. Someone absolutely was there. Kira, who wasn't half as freaked out as I was, decided to say something. Hello? Immediately after she spoke, the breathing stopped, only to be replaced seconds later by this heaving, like laughing but dry, almost silent, the only noise coming from the diaphragm changing shape. <laughs> It went on for 15 seconds. We both listened, wide-eyed, before the call dropped without warning. The other person had hung up. Kira took the phone from my hand and called back more than once, but whoever or whatever it was did not answer again. I wish I could say it ended there. I want to tell you we decided to pack it up, call it a night, and leave after that, but we didn't. Kira was headstrong convinced it was some prankster messing with us, and I, scared as I was, wasn't going to leave her alone. So, we kept working. Maybe two hours later, we finished up the first ticket in the lab, finalizing every install, then moved on to the second, hauling a computer back to the proctor room. Everything was good for a while. After we got the machine in the door, Kira said she was going to use the restroom, it was only a few doors down, so I didn't raise an issue. I nodded at her, moving the computer into the room to hook it up to a monitor and began diagnosing what was wrong. When I got to the desk, though, I jumped. On the table was the missing proctor phone, the one that we had called. It was just sitting there in its usual basket. I know for a fact only me and Kira were on duty. No one else should have had access to that room, and she hadn't left my sight until we got there. So how in the world was it here? Suddenly, the door to the room slammed. I'd left it open so she wouldn't have to swipe to get in, and it slammed hard. I knew someone had pushed it. 
Now focused less on fear and more on my coworker's safety, I got up, running over to the door and yanking it open. I was met with a dark hallway, like totally dark. The overhead lights that were up 24-7 were all offline. The only reason I could see at all was because of streetlights seeping into the mini glass panels of the building. Focusing, I turned my phone's flashlight on. It was pitiful in the huge college hallways, but it made them walkable. I called Kira's name. There was no response, so I began walking to the restrooms. On my way, I passed by a classroom and the door creaked open as I walked. It was so eerie slow and drawn out like a horror film. I found it impossible that a door like that could have been so terribly lubricated. Regardless, I continued on. The washroom was just up ahead. I used my phone to identify which of the doors were for women. It was held open by a door stopper, so I entered. I called Kira's name again. Still, no reply. I felt a little weird about going into a female bathroom but given the circumstances, I really had no other choice. Shining my light around the room revealed no one. It was small. I could see almost every corner, and Kira was not there. The only thing amiss about the room was the stall door. It was swinging back and forth, making no noise at all. Just like the chairs from before, it showed no sign of slowing down. I remember being mesmerized by it, standing still to watch it glide. I was snapped back into reality from the sound of footsteps in the hallway. Immediately, I shot back out, calling for Kira again. By the time I'd exited the restroom, the footsteps were already down the corridor and behind a corner. It sounded like the other person, whoever it was, was running. So I ran after them. It was like something from a cartoon. No matter how fast I ran, they always stayed a little ahead of me. I could never quite reach the person but I was always close enough to follow. I was led up and down stairs, down all sorts of different hallways until finally, it stopped. I was huffing and puffing as I turned past the last corner. There was only one door there, and it was ajar. I recognized it as one of the School of Health classrooms. I caught my breath, now irritated that I'd been led around the school. Then I walked up, shouldering the door open. The room was entirely dark. I reached over for the manual light control, flicking it up. It was able to override whatever had kept the hallway lights off, and it turned on, illuminating the room. Oh man, I wish I didn't flick the light switch on. There were skeletons. I don't mean real skeletons, it's one of those models you've probably seen in science classrooms. About the same size as a human one, but made out of plastic or some composite material. Anyway, in every single chair sat a model skeleton. They were all turned to face me. It was horrifying. Who the heck had set up all these, and when? As I took a step backward from them, there was an ear-splitting noise. I blinked, and every jaw fell off the skeletons in unison, clacking to the floor, like they were all severed off. There I was being stared down by an army of jawless model skeletons. Right away, I noped out of there. As I ran, I could have sworn I heard plastic joints cracking as if they were pursuing me. I took the nearest exit, pushing out of the building into the cold night air. I remember taking a minute to catch my breath and process what the heck had just happened. I wanted to run, so badly I wanted to run, but Kira was still in there somewhere. She wasn't picking up her phone. I even called our boss Harry, but he didn't respond either. At that point, I was fed up. I think I was going to call the police, but was trying to work out how to get across my story without sounding insane. Then, something caught my attention. I could see a shape moving, but not very quickly. It was very timid. It was obviously a girl. Kira. Even in the low light, I knew it was her because of the short crop of her hair. She walked out of the shadow and onto the path. It was so weird. Ten feet away, she faced away from me, dead center in the middle of the walkway. I remember calling out to her. I wasn't thinking. If I was thinking, I would have known something wasn't quite right. But I was too worried about her, and too glad to see her again to be careful. I said her name, and then she started heaving. Facing away from me, she was doing this convulsive motion, like she was hysterically laughing. 
only there was absolutely no sound coming from her, none. It went on for minutes, the same horrifying movement. I backed up, slowly to the door I'd exited from, automatically swiping my door and pushing on through. When I turned back only a few seconds later, she, if you can call it that, because it obviously wasn't Kira, had disappeared from the path. As soon as she was gone from my view, the lights turned back on. The entryway of the building was illuminated once more, as were all the hallways. I could move about again without my phone's flashlight. Very carefully, I headed upstairs as quiet as I could, then to the proctor room. My plan was to grab my stuff and book it out of the building, calling the police on my way. Quickly, I swiped the card and shouldered my way into where my backpack was. Kira was waiting for me. She had the computer we'd brought on up on a table with its side panel off. She was busy working on it. She didn't even turn her head to me, only saying something like, Oh, hey. I was so glad to see her, the real her, that I ran up and hugged her. She asked what the heck I was doing, and I told her I'd gone searching for her when the lights shut off. Before I could ramble about the person running through the halls and the model skeletons, and the other version of her that was doing that heaving thing, she cut me off. She told me that when the lights shut off, she left the bathroom and came back to the proctor office to find me. Apparently, she began working on the computer, and I mumbled something about completing another ticket before I walked out of the room. And after that, despite her protests, I made us pack everything in. We grabbed our things and left, Kira complaining the entire time. I never gave her a real explanation. I couldn't. I just needed to get us both out of there. That's really it. I'm sorry for the length of this story, I wish I could give some detailed explanation or round off with some cliché about seeing a silhouette standing inside one of the buildings as we left, but I can't. It ended as quickly and strangely as it began. The only reason I remembered this story is because Kira hit me up recently. We hadn't seen each other since the beginning of the Rona thing, and she wanted to reconnect. We planned to meet up next weekend to get drinks. In her text, she joked about finding out why I made us leave that night. I thought drafting this up might help me find the words to explain it to her, if I decide to explain it at all. As for what entity or phenomenon was in motion that night, I haven't a clue. Maybe someone out there does know, though, and will heed my story as a warning. I do know that whatever it was sincerely enjoyed freaking me out, though. Take that how you will. Good luck on your night shifts, everyone, and stay safe. Mima's Photograph From Andrew On the third floor of one of the largest buildings on my college campus, there's a computer lab that hides a strange photograph. If you head over to the very back, along the right wall, carefully step onto the desk situated against the corner and look up, you can just make out the bezel of a picture frame, aligned with a block only a few feet away from the ceiling. If you're feeling brave, you can climb up even further onto the ledge running along the wall, and if you stretch yourself out and stand on the tips of your toes, you can reach said picture frame. When you grab it, which I really don't recommend you do, and make your way down, you'll find the black and white image of a cute girl, no more than 20 years of age, smiling at you, captioned with a simple message, Rest in peace, Mima. Here's my story about that bizarre memorial. I was a student and employee there. They hired second-year IT students for entry-level positions. At the time, it was the end of the summer, one of the last days before our shift switched from full-time to part-time nights. My co-workers and I were relaxing in the aforementioned room. It was our favorite, one that was nicely air-conditioned and far enough away from IT services to be secure in the knowledge that we wouldn't run into our bosses. It even had a workable projector to boot. After lying back in the small office chair at one of the stations, our coworker pointed the photo out to us with a, hey, what's that? Even craning our necks, we couldn't make it out properly because of how high up it was. So after some deliberation, the tallest guy among us decided to make his way up. He collected the picture frame, bringing it down and placing it on the desk so we could all see. I don't think any of us read the tiny caption right away, 
instead opting to take in the image of the beautiful girl smiling in the photo. When someone finally spoke it out loud, it being, rest in peace Mima, tension filled the air. It was an odd image to find, especially hidden away up in the corner of the room, as if it was deliberately placed out of reach. It didn't take long for one of us to joke that the room was now haunted, which helped us to return to our casual atmosphere. Then we encouraged him to put the picture back, lest the imaginary ghost get angry. And he did, though he couldn't be bothered to climb up once more. So instead, he tossed it back up to where it had been before. We heard the sharp thud of wood as the frame landed and squarely fell over, presumably onto its face. I might have cringed a little then at the haphazard way the photo was tossed, but I never spoke up. Sure enough, we'd forgotten about the picture by the end of the day. It didn't cross my mind again, at least not until I arrived home. After a few drinks, I went to bed, not before googling a little to see if I could find anything about a girl named Mima, who might have died under some tragic circumstance at my campus. However, nothing came up with my first few queries, and so I give up. When I arrived back at campus that morning, the first thing I did was visit the room. Not to pay respects or anything, I just wanted to drop off my bag. When I got to the door, I pulled my keycard, swiping it on the reader. But nothing happened. I swiped again, and again. After the fifth time, I stopped trying, assuming the authentication mechanism might have been down across the campus. That theory proved wrong only a minute later as I headed into the office where we had our work items assigned. Both my card and other readers were functioning, and yet the one laboratory did not want to open up. This became all the more relevant a few hours later, when my coworkers and I made our way up to the room to take our lunch break. They swiped, and they too were rejected. Each of us ended up trying, only to determine the reader was simply broken. I remember us opting to go and find another room to eat in, though we lamented the fact that we couldn't use our preferred one. It was curious to me though. My mind kept trying to draw coincidental lines between our discovery of that photograph and the door locking. Obviously, there was nothing going on, but for some reason I couldn't shake the feeling that our interaction with that picture might have contributed. Over time, however, I forgot about her. My friends and I had moved on to a new room, one that was arguably superior because the lab featured Windows machines over IMAX, and we more or less stopped mentioning the old lab. I do remember one instance where I asked my coworkers if any of them had found anything online about Mima, but it seemed I was the only one with enough curiosity to even bother researching her. When my work transitioned to part-time shifts at the start of September, I was not looking forward to it whatsoever. I was now spending even more time on campus. My eight-hour course time of the new semester, followed by a two-hour break, then a four-hour night shift starting at 5 p.m. This led me to being there all day. During these shifts, one other person served with me. I got along with him very well, and so it really wasn't too bad. The first few weeks went by fine. Lots of asset replacement, pushing our tiny trolleys around campus and ripping out old computers and monitors at the end of their warranty periods, then bringing in their replacements. It was all pretty uneventful work, up until the evening right near the end of September, where we got assigned a ticket in our old favorite place, Mima's room. The ticket, which was a PDF, only contained the boring room number, but it was the lab. We both laughed when we saw it, obviously opting to do that ticket first. The work seemed trivial. A handful of computers showing offline needed to be assessed. We worked our way to the building and headed upstairs, first checking the nearby printer to make sure it was functional. Then I swiped my car on the door. Lo and behold, nothing. My coworker tried too. It was just as broken as it was before. It seemed facilities still hadn't fixed it. Of course, card readers weren't the only way to access the room. Though it was a hassle, we could go over to security and sign out the massive two-pound contractor keyring. And that's just what we did. We opted to finish up our other tickets first, 
And so when we arrived at the lab with the security keys, it was near dark outside. It took us a few minutes, but we eventually found the right family of keys to fit in the lock, then the specific one to open the door. It swung open with a creak, and what we were greeted with was bizarre. The motion-activated lights had failed almost completely. Only the fluorescent panel directly above our heads lit up. It quickly became obvious why lab computers were showing offline. Ethernet and power cords were strewn about the room. At first it seemed random, cables thrown about in disarray. But as I stared on, it looked to be more purposeful. Almost like a barrier. As we exchanged bewilderment, I focused. Two-thirds of the way into the room, cables were woven together to create some sort of guard, dividing the rest of the space no more than two feet high. Quickly, he suggested we call security. I nodded. It was bizarre, though. It wasn't like the lab had been robbed. Whoever had made a mess of the room did it in a particular, intricate manner. It must have taken hours. As he took out his phone, I tried using the panel on the wall to override the motion sensor. It didn't work. The lights refused to activate. As I pressed each switch, I became aware of someone else in the room. It was hard to notice with the noise we were making. I don't think he heard it at all. I ushered my partner to be quiet, and when he was, we both picked up on it. It was a girl, crying, very quietly. It was at the back of the lab, beyond the messy blockade of wires. The light from the strip above us couldn't reach that area though, and so we could not see her. Before I could say anything, he shouted hello, asking who was there. Then with the line to security waiting to be picked up, he turned on his phone flashlight, shining it in the direction the sobbing was coming from. We both were terrified. Her head was in her hands, and she wore a plain white dress. Even though every sense of realism I had screamed that it was impossible, she looked exactly like Mimo. My colleague recognized her too. Immediately, he knew something was wrong. We both stepped out together, keeping an eye on the hard-to-make-out sobbing girl as we did. When we were in the hallway, we shut the door, stepping back to the other side of the hallway and staring. We sat down outside the door when the security guard showed up. Our faces must have been white as snow, judging by the way he spoke to us. All I said was that there was someone in the room who shouldn't be there. He didn't prompt us for any more information, instead moving to unlock the door with his keycard. Unexpectedly, it worked. It opened into a perfectly normal computer lab. Everything was back where it should have been. Even the lights were functional. We heard the telltale sounds of computers POSTing around the room, or power on self-test, as if multiple just had their power sources restored. The guard walked into the room, asked if anyone was there, and inspected each and every space a person could hide. Given there were only two exits to the room, both being in our field of view, he suggested we were mistaken, because there was no one inside, and no way they could have gotten out. I remember having to fill out a short report. He called in something to the office after that. He stayed with us as we worked on our ticket, which helped us feel a little more secure. My partner and I were now in the laboratory, confused and creeped out as all heck. Mutually, we decided to finish up the work and exit as soon as possible. Bizarrely though, every computer which had been listed as downed on the work item we had was now perfectly up and running. After a quick check, it became clear there was no work to be done. Of course, we told all our co-workers about it, our night shift manager too. Neither believed us, though the latter was good-humored and assumed we were joking. Between my co-worker and I, we never came up with a logical explanation, and instead it became a staple of conversation that over time turned comedic. After that though, a series of bizarre events started to occur. It was just little stuff at first. IT services had a few of our own spaces secured with keycards, the office building and a neighboring one filled with workstations, monitors, and keyboards. Frequently, we went through both, not only to retrieve items, but also because they were pretty central in campus construction and served as great shortcuts. 
but here and there we would notice little oddities, things that should not be there. The drawings were the first of them. I remember being messaged a picture by someone who worked the night after me. It was of a cartoon cat, drawn seemingly with crayon on one of the walls of the storage room. It wasn't all too weird, although I could count on my fingers the number of people that had access to that space. Over time, more and more appeared. All sorts of animals, symbols, and stick figure people, drawn in a childish crayon over the walls. Our IT team eventually adopted a mock competition to see who could find the newest illustration first. Nobody ever came forward to admit it was them drawing. Not even when our bosses got all huffy and asked who was vandalizing the place, threatening to check the security cameras if no one came forward. At the same time, we began to notice another form of art. Origami. Crafted shapes of cranes and other animals began popping up in our secure spaces. They were always made out of the same blue paper. The creepiest thing about them was that if you found one and removed it, the next day, another would be back in the same spot, identically folded and poised. I must have collected 30 of these over the course of a few weeks, and they kept on being replaced. The next and more inexplicable series of events that occurred began on a Saturday. I remember specifically because the guy who was unlucky enough to have the full 8-hour Saturday shift blew up our Discord chat, talking about how he had heard a girl giggling and hasty footsteps down in the asset storage area. Everybody was quick to call him out, save me and my coworker, but given we live in the age of smartphones, he had attached a recording. It was as he described, him following the sound of a girl's laughter around the secured space, never able to catch up with her but always close enough to hear. I remember watching as he swore and opted to take the exit before he made his way down to security to fill out a report. I decided to take the initiative, being the first to call it the ghost of Meemaw. With two separate experiences to go off of, plus the bizarre artifacts we were finding, the ghost of Meemaw now became an all-too-believable urban legend among our IT team. Over the next few weeks, the timeline intensified. All of us experienced some out-of-the-ordinary event. Most of it was laughter and sounds that shouldn't have been there. Some were visual. I remember being outdoors one day. It was already dark out. I was pushing a trolley of computers when I heard the bizarre sound of someone skipping. I turned to my left and watched a slim girl dressed in white skipping by me and past the corner of the building, humming to herself. Naturally, I followed, prepping my phone to record her, but when I turned the corner into a wide-open stretch of campus with practically zero places to hide, she had completely vanished. The creepiest experience must have been one that four of us saw all together. This was the week leading up to Christmas, and while every student and the majority of staff were on break, we had the opportunity to return to full-time hours for the five days. Me and three others had signed up. At that point, Mima seemed more like a novelty than anything dangerous, and so it wasn't a deterrent to work, especially considering how much we needed money around the holidays. That interpretation quickly changed, though. We were in a building on the north side of campus. After spending the better part of the day wheeling trolleys full of brand new desktops and monitors up to the building, we had begun installing them. We'd finished one room and were on to the second, which was directly beside it in the hall. As we worked, we began to hear loud crashing sounds from the completed room. Obviously, I got up to see, since we were among the only people on campus. Just as I was about to duck into the room to see what was going on, a desktop came flying by the door, narrowly missing me. It crashed against the wall with an ear-shattering thud, its side panel coming off and a few of the internals spilling out onto the floor. At that point, the rest of my team came in and saw the PC in pieces. We entered the room, only to find the majority of the lab machines in similar states, damaged and strewn about. It seemed impossible. These were public classrooms, and so each station was secured to a cage built into a desk with a padlock. There was simply no way the amount of damage could have occurred, let alone in that short of a time. Nobody was in the room when we filed in, but as if to tease us, the other entrance swung away. We heard footsteps and the telltale giggling of the ghost of, you guessed it, Mimo. The fallout from that event was immense. Things were getting a little too corporeal for us. 
It was tense and uncomfortable. Beyond that, our bosses were furious. We had an emergency meeting arranged to discuss what had happened, but due to the lack of CCTV in the room, we were unable to prove our side of things. We almost all got terminated that day and were barred from any extra shifts. Following that incident, I had a very bizarre dream. I remember it vividly. I was standing on a subway platform. It was empty save me and Mima. In my hands, I held an old camera. She stood at the edge of the platform, looking at me and smiling. She'd do little things with her hands and make cute gestures as I photographed her. Then maybe a minute later, the light of a train became apparent. It was loud, barreling down the tunnel. I remember lowering the camera, watching as Meemaw waved at me once more. And just as the train neared, she stepped backwards, falling into the space of the tracks and getting hit by the train. As the vehicle passed, I looked down, finding in my hand a photograph, but not one I'd taken, the one from the room instead, where we'd first seen her, captioned, Rest in Peace, Meemaw, with a frown occupying her face instead of a smile. When I woke up, I was covered in sweat. I checked my phone and it read, 4 a.m. I tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. As I lay there thinking about the photograph, I had an epiphany. I really can't describe it properly, but something inside me knew what I had to do. I waited patiently for a few hours, up until the first bus that followed the road alongside my college would run. Then I made my way to the station and got on. I didn't have a shift, and following the events of the day previous, I really shouldn't have went to the campus. But I did. I had to. As soon as I stepped off the bus, this cold sensation came over me. Granted, the morning air was chilly, but this was different. It prickled my skin the farther I went, but I ignored it. I headed directly towards my old favorite lunch spot, Mima's room. I still had my ID card, and so I was able to unlock the access door of the building, then make my way up to the floor the room was on. I stood before it. The air around me, despite being conditioned, was horrendously tense and thick. Almost like I was moving through water. But I continued, I swiped my card. The door showed green and unlocked without issue. Then I stepped inside. It was normal. The lights came on fine and I moved to the back of the room. As gracefully as I could, I moved, though every fiber of my being told me that there was something inside the room, something I couldn't see, watching me. But I kept going. I climbed up the desk, then onto the thin ledge that ran against the wall and I reached up as far as I could, just barely managing to grab the edge of the frame. I pulled it down. The photo was different, just like my dream. Mima wore a soft frown, looking upset. The palpable sensation that someone was right behind me as I balanced on the ledge was nearly impossible to ignore, but I did manage to ignore it. As genuinely as I could, I blew the little bit of the dust off the photo before whispering a quiet, sorry, Mima. Then I strained myself as far as I could and carefully put the photograph back how it was before we'd ever touched it, face up, standing tall. As I let the frame go, the sensation of something behind me vanished. It was like a weight being lifted. Within seconds, everything about the room felt fine, natural, normal. I climbed down, looking once more back at where I put the photograph, before leaving and making my way out of the campus. When I arrived home, I vaguely remember collapsing into bed and sleeping well into the afternoon. Following that day, the ghost of Mima was never heard from again. The scribblings we had seen on the wall vanished, as did the cute origami figures. I never heard a giggle or footsteps or caught her in the corner of my eye on my night shifts. I never explained to my co-workers what I'd done either, and though we were all disappointed in the loss of the novelty, I think the relief we felt from knowing we'd never have to deal with her again was a fair trade. To this day, I don't know who Mima was or why her photograph sat there, but I did visit it a few times after hours up until I left the college, and believe it or not, her smile had returned. I suppose the photograph served as a memorial or an ode, one that should never have been disrespected as it was. 
but I guess I'll never know for sure. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>